Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none. Oh, Senator Faruqi, sorry I didn't see you. Yes, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Fair Work Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2020 as circulated in the Chamber. Leave is not granted. No, leave is not granted. Senator Faruqi, sorry, I'll ask you to start again to give you the call. Please, yep, please re recommence. Uh, Mr President, pursuant to contingent notice Standing in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the consideration of the Fair Work Amendment COVID-19 Bill 2020. Uh, Mr. President, all the Greens are seeking here is for the paid pandemic leave bill to have an hour and a half of debate this morning. This is an hour and a half of our time which can hopefully provide livelihoods to workers who are really suffering, and it can help save lives for us. We were here just yesterday, um, and we passed a bill to extend the JobKeeper. But even that extension was given with workers getting less money to survive during this pandemic. And so many people were still left out of the JobKeeper package, the casual workers, the university workers, the childcare workers, um, and the temporary visa holders. What we need to make sure is that every single person and worker in Australia at this point in time has at least 14 days of paid pandemic leave. So they are not forced to choose between their health, the health of their family, the health of their community, and their livelihoods. We don't have to wait for a disaster to happen to do that. We can do that right now. And we can have better public health in our country. And we can support our workers better as well. We know that the Premier of South Australia has asked the Prime Minister to make this happen. We know that the Premier of New South Wales has asked the Prime Minister to make this happen. We know that we are on a cliff. And it is our responsibility that no one falls off that cliff. We absolutely know that the virus is going to be here for a while. We're not sure yet when a vaccine will be developed. There is uncertainty around what's going to happen now. But it is in our power to provide at least some certainty to workers that we care for them, that we look after them. And that's why this bill that I am requesting that the Senate agree to be debated and passed through this House will provide 14 days of paid COVID-19 leave to all workers, to all workers, even those that have been left out of the JobKeeper package. Um, you know, it will make sure that permanent, part-time, casual gig economy workers will have that leave to look after themselves, look after the community, put food on the table, have a roof over their heads. And it is absolutely urgent that we do this now because people are suffering right at this point in time. We can't go away this week and then come back after a month and then start considering this. What this bill will do, and that's why it is so important that we 
um, debate it now. It will actually provide an employee with 14 days leave who is unable to attend work because the employee's workplace has been shut down. Uh, it will um, provide 14 days leave to an employee who is subject to self-isolation or quarantine measures accord in accordance with Commonwealth. And it will provide an employee with leave if that employee is caring for another person who's been diagnosed with COVID-19. This bill is a vital piece of legislation that we actually need to debate today. And I'm hoping that senators here will support that bill because it will protect workers, it will protect our community. Every worker, and there are 3.3 million workers around Australia at this point in time who cannot access paid sick leave. At the end of the day, this bill is about fairness. This bill is about making sure that every single worker, no matter they are casual, part-time, on a temporary visa, no matter where they work, that they are able to access 14 days of sick pandemic leave. Only an hour and a half of the Senate's time is all that we are requesting. An hour and a half to save livelihoods and save lives. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, I think all senators know uh, the um, framework for the program for the week. There's a time to deal uh, with private senators' uh, business, and, and indeed um, that is uh, Monday morning. And, and of course, uh, you know, if um, Senator Faruqi wanted to pursue this with urgency, she would have known about this uh, on Monday, and she could have made uh, appropriate arrangements at that time. She waited all the way till Wednesday, which says to me it wasn't quite as much uh, uh, an, an urgency uh, as she is now trying to suggest. This is an attempt to disrupt the uh, orderly operation of the Senate. I mean, there is, as it, uh, at the best of times, at the best of times, there is not actually um, that much government business time. This is an attempt to interfere Order. with the uh, time of government business now. Uh, there is business. There is business of the Senate uh, to uh, be progressed, and uh, indeed, we've got uh, an important uh, set of bills on our agenda this morning. Uh, we will not be supporting uh, this uh, suspension. Uh, there are uh, there are ways and means available to Senator Faruqi and to other senators in the chamber uh, to uh, progress uh, the matters that she has raised substantively, and we would strongly encourage her and others uh, who support the substantive uh, proposal that she's put forward. Uh, to pursue those uh, other opportunities uh, in the appropriate fashion. Um, you know, Australia is um, you know, going through a pretty difficult period, and this is not a time to apply procedural games. Uh, this is a time uh, to get the job done that the Australian people have elected us to do. And uh, part of getting the job done uh, is to progress uh, the uh, items of government business at the time when uh, the Senate, by consensus, is uh, scheduled for government business to be dealt with. So, I mean, this is, this is I mean, let's be very clear. Senator Farouk is not bringing this on now because uh, there is some sort of urgency to deal with it now. If there was an urgency, she would have dealt with it on Monday. Uh, Senator Farouk is bringing this up now to disrupt the uh, agenda of uh, the government during government business time uh, this, uh, this morning. And so that is not something that we can support or facilitate, uh, and we won't. Uh, so I will not take my uh, full five minutes so that the uh, Senate can get back to its business as scheduled on the agenda uh, at the earliest opportunity. Senator Lambie was first. Thank I'll come you, to you, Mr. Senator President. Gallagher. Um, I have to say, since uh, the country is going through such a difficult time at the moment, and it's so difficult, we're now sitting here on a Wednesday morning before we finish, I think, for nearly eight weeks, is it, until, until we get back? And we're talking about electoral legislation. That's first on the agenda this morning, Australians. Yeah, the money laundering bill. The money laundering bill. Order. That's the one. How about that? Because we are going through such a crisis in this country, such an economic one. These guys here, these major parties, have made a dirty, filthy little deal to talk about electoral matters. That's where we're at this morning. Don't worry about these people. Don't worry about that we've got, we, we have no vaccine. We have no vaccine going on. Uh, nobody's got any vision from this side that this could be going on for the next few years, that these people may need pandemic leave. And what are you going to do? Just leave them without money, are you? How's that going to keep the economy going around? So, you know, you want to talk about what's important to this country, and you're in here chucking in our face. And by the way, this was never 
on the agenda. This was never on the agenda. This has been chucked at the crossbench this morning, right in our face, because this is so important that it's been chucked on late last night to tell us we're going to talk about electoral matters here this morning. We're going to talk about electoral matters, all about cash and about winning seats instead of the health of Australians in this country. That's where we're at this morning. That's apparently what's more important than anything else. Not about you guys, not about your house loans if you get pandemic leave, not in, not in why these guys are saying open all the borders, open all the borders and waiting for a catastrophe to happen and then wondering how we're going to keep these people going for two weeks. Wondering how, if they're on pandemic leave or they're on leave and nothing to cover that, how they're going to feed their kids, how they're going to pay their house payments. That's what we're doing this morning because apparently that's the most important thing. So, quite frankly, you should be ashamed of yourselves this morning. I mean, this is, this is just rubbish. Uh, you know, we've, my office has looked at this this morning, and already we're finding holes in it. You're not talking about the loans and, and how that's not going to be transparent, and how that's not going to be how you're going to borrow your money from loans, uh, and like the, Liberal, like the Labor Party did last time on $30 million, and that apparently you can pay these loans back, but that's not a political donation, even though you're using that $30 million to win political seats. My God, that's where we're at, and you've had an inquiry. You've been sitting there saying this is great now, and you've got a girl from Tasmania, hasn't got a university degree, and I'm already, in 10 minutes this morning, finding holes in this bill. That's where we're at. So I say bring it on. Bring on the debate. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and uh, Labor will be supporting the suspension uh, today to bring on universal paid pandemic leave uh, bill for for debate, the Fair Work Amendment COVID-19 bill. Um, and the reason we uh, because we shouldn't be in this position where we're having to move a suspension for a private member's bill, a uh, private senator's bill. This should be uh, a scheme that is has been brought in by the government. It should have been brought in months ago. Uh, and I think the point that the uh, Green senators are making here is uh, this is the last couple of days we sit before the budget. Um, there's another month to go, and we haven't been able to um, get the government to bring in a paid pandemic leave scheme. And I think it's one of the real weaknesses in our response to COVID-19. Actually, I think uh, the more and more we learn about this virus. Uh, the more and more we understand about the need for people, if they are feeling unwell, to be able to stay at home uh, and isolate pending tests. And what we also know is that for many people, staying at home is not a choice uh, that they are able to make because they have to make a choice between um, income, putting food on the table, looking after their kids, paying their bills, um, or not. And if there's no sick leave or other entitlements for them—and let's remember there's 3.7 million workers in this country that don't have access to um, leave entitlements, and that's the fundamental issue that needs to be addressed through a paid pandemic leave scheme that operates across the country. I think um, you know, people who uh, represent workers, the unions, they've been calling for this uh, like back at the beginning of the pandemic, because they realised that with the, ins the nature of insecure work in this country, the fact that we have millions of workers without access to leave entitlements, uh, the fact that when it comes to the crunch, those workers will be forced to go to work so that they are able to earn an income and they won't be, they're not in a position to make that choice of um, staying from home or working from home or, or keeping away if they're unwell, and that this was a real gap in the response. And I think we've seen it played out. We've certainly seen it play out in aged care. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest issues in terms of the outbreak in Victoria has been cas the casualised workforce working across multiple sites when they are unwell and the um, COVID-19 infection spread across sites because they didn't have access to leave entitlements which would have allowed them to stay at home. Now, the Commonwealth has acted in relation to um, aged care workers um, in Victoria. The state government has responded with a payment arrangement to be put in place, but it's not universal. It doesn't happen across the country, and it's not in place early enough. It's, again, been a reactionary measure from this government to a problem, uh, to dealing with the problem once the problem arises, and for the 
workers that have become unwell, for the outbreaks that have spread, that's been too late. So we do support this suspension. We think one and a half hours debate is reasonable. We actually think it should be a government bill. I mean, you're in charge. You're the ones that are getting all the information. You should be taking the lead on this, and you should be providing nationally consistent arrangements. Because, as we understand, without a vaccine, the situation that for many um, casualised workers, for those who don't have permanent employment, contractors, freelancers, sole traders, gig workers, um, all of those people are going to face this pressure until a vaccine is here, and that could be some time. Uh, so I think the suspension from, uh, by the Greens um, should be supported. Um, it is sensible. We need to take action on paid pandemic leave. The bill that the Greens have moved isn't exactly as Labor would have done it. Um, we have some areas that we would do differently, but I think we welcome the debate on the issue itself because what it's highlighting is a significant gap in the national response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a gap that is easily addressed and would allow those workers who aren't in the fortunate position that people like we are in to choose about or to make those choices in the interests of the community as opposed to having to make choices for themselves and their families. And it becomes a choice between earning an income or not earning an income. And not earning an income has significant consequences for families. Uh, and I think this, there's a sensible way to deal with it. The unions have been arguing it for months. Uh, any casual, casual worker will tell you that this is a real problem for them. And if we're going to be serious about stopping the spread, managing the outbreaks, opening up the economy, then this has to be an ingredient Order. to support Senator that recovery. Gallagher. Senator Seward. President, well, the Greens are doing the job that the government should have done. And instead of agreeing with us and realising they are leaving people behind, they are choosing to label this as an excuse to disrupt the Senate. No, it's not. It's the Greens with the, with the opposition and the crossbenchers trying to do what the government has failed to do, and that is to protect all workers in this country, to stop the spread of COVID because sick workers are having to go to work because they have no income. But the government would rather spend their time with rushing through bills to trash our environment laws, because that is what they are trying to do. They would rather rush through bills to trash our education system, to trash our universities and make life so much harder for young people in this country, both of which they don't want to refer to committee. Oh no, why would you do that? No, we want to rush that through. But when it comes to actually protecting our community, to making sure that no one is left behind, the Greens get accused of disrupting the Senate. Well, no, we're not. We're not disrupting the Senate. We're doing the government's job for them to ensure that people are not left behind, to ensure that we don't get situations where sick workers have to go to work because, for example, they may have used up all their sick leave. But they should not have to, in fact, use up all their sick leave in order to take time off work. They should know that they have the security of pandemic leave, because that is what we're dealing with this in this, in this country. We're dealing with a pandemic. We need leave to make sure all workers are protected, particularly those casual workers, which the government has so clearly left behind. They don't get access to JobKeeper. Those on temporary visas don't get access to JobKeeper. So the government's quite happy to leave those people behind. While saying we're all in this together, well, no, we're not. Those that don't get access to leave aren't all in this together. They, they are being left behind this, by this government. This bill would provide for 14 days paid COVID-19 leave to all workers, including part-time casual and gig, gig economy workers. They would get this on the basis of they were diagnosed with COVID-19. They are unable to attend work because the workplace has been shut down due to COVID-19. They need to self-isolate or quarantine in accordance with the Commonwealth state and territory government policy relating, of course, to COVID-19. Or they are caring for another person who has been diagnosed with COVID-19. Or they need to self-isolate or quarantine in accordance with a, with a direction from a state or uh, Commonwealth government. 
Paid pandemic leave would be added to the National Employment Standards with the Fair Work Commission, and the Fair Work Commission would have the power to make COVID-19 leave orders to extend 14 days paid leave to workers or a class of workers who may not be employees, such as food delivery drivers. Now that makes absolute sense. Makes absolute sense. The government should be doing this. We shouldn't have to be seeking to move to suspend standing orders in order to bring this debate on. We are being very reasonable. We're asking for an hour and a half worth of time to deal with this. And given the need for this, given the urgency for this, because all Australians know we are not out of this pandemic yet, we need to act to protect everybody. This not only ensures that workers are looked after, it is also in order to protect the broader community. Having sick workers go to work does not help anybody, and in fact it, it, in fact it could help spread COVID-19. This is a complete flaw in the government's approach to COVID-19. It's a whacking great hole in their approach. And how can you think of moving to recovery, moving out of this and lifting restrictions by Christmas, the Prime Minister is now saying? Well, unless we're looking after all our workers, we're not going to get there because this is part of our response to the pandemic, but it's also ensuring that people are not left behind because I tell you what, this government is leaving people behind. This is essential legislation that the government should have moved and we're doing their job for them. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to support uh, the Greens' uh, motion and uh, note the contribution from the uh, previous uh, <coughs> speakers. Um, I don't think there's any uh, greater issue that this country faces at the moment than confronting uh, the <coughs> issues around the coronavirus and the uh, and the response uh, to that uh, that pandemic that we now find ourselves in. And it's almost as if, uh, Mr. President, we're living in a parallel universe. On the one hand, we're in here discussing <coughs> other bits of legislation which um, may or may not be of uh, <coughs> interest to the community. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the Greens and Labor maintain that the most important issue that this country now faces is dealing with the issue of the pandemic leave. Um, <coughs> now, um, we've seen the response of the government to the aged care crisis that's currently going on in Victorian um, uh, aged care homes and in Victorian hospitals. Um, <clears throat> what was the trigger? Well, what was one of the triggers uh, for that um, development in, in Victoria? Well, one of the triggers was uh, that uh, employees were going from uh, aged care um, facilities to aged care facilities. Why did they do that? Well, the people in this industry tend to be relatively low paid uh, in order to maintain an income because of the casual nature of the employment. They have continued uh, to, to work, and obviously in circumstances where what they should have been doing was staying at home um, and uh, recovering from this terrible virus, but instead, in order to feed their families, to pay their bills, uh, they have been going to work. Um, now, of all the issues that we could confront here this week and over this two-week period, I don't think there's a more important issue than the ones that the Greens have put to the table today. Um, we, yes, Order. no, no. I am. <clears throat> this is the second time this week. This is the second time this week I've supported the uh, the Greens, and I'm supporting them because they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. The Greens are absolutely right on this issue. Order. There is no, there is no Order greater. On my right. <laughs> there is no greater issue that this country uh, confronts. Anybody, anybody who has a family member in Victoria, anybody who's got a family member in Victoria, knows um, the risks that are going on in that uh, in that state. <clears throat> And lots of frontline workers are out there. Um, one example that I'm familiar with are the retail workers. They've continued to work throughout this whole period if they work in supermarkets. People have um, obviously continued uh, to need to eat, 
These workers have been frontline workers. What happens when their sick leave runs out? Uh, they have to make a choice for their families. Uh, do I go to work and risk infecting other people <coughs> if I've got the virus, or, or do I stay home and have no money to feed myself? Um, it's a pretty simple proposition. And I think until <coughs> this government understands uh, why this crisis has occurred in Victoria, under their watch, uh, the, co the, the total collapse in the <coughs> um, aged care industry, um, I don't think we're going to get a solution to this problem. <coughs> and the more we can do to assist those workers who've got to make that choice, um, and it's not an easy choice, <coughs> and we know people have been making the wrong decisions. Why have they been making the wrong decisions? Well, they haven't got paid pandemic leave. Um, and 14 days is a good period because, by and large, hopefully you'd, you're over and done with with the virus. You can get a test. So I'm going to have to do when I go back to Adelaide on, <coughs> on um, Friday to make sure I haven't uh, caught the uh, <coughs> virus up here. Um, <coughs> those people uh, can have the opportunity to go and do their test recover and then come back to work. Um, but the small price, the small price of paid pandemic leave um, is minuscule compared to the damage that is being done to this economy uh, by um, these, uh, these lockdowns. Uh, and it's a small price to pay both to help the individual themselves, who's obviously run out of sick leave, but to help the country uh, get back and overcome uh, the economic carnage that uh, has occurred. So I support very much the debate this, after, uh, this morning on this bill. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Well, one of the things that this pandemic has done is to expose uh, some very significant pre-existing fault lines in our economy and our society. And too many Australians have found themselves on the wrong side of these fault lines. And one of those fault lines is casual and insecure work, where people who may be feeling sick or displaying symptoms of COVID are placed in the most invidious of positions. They are placed in a position where, on one hand, they want to stay home and do the right thing by themselves and do the right thing by our community to minimise the risk of transmission. On the other hand, they know if they stay home, they won't get paid and they won't be able to pay their rent. They won't be able to put food on the table for their families. They won't be able to do all those things that we all take for granted in here, but for many Australians are a matter of day-to-day -day decisions and the most difficult of decisions at that. Now, we know, particularly from the Victorian experience, that insecure work is driving a health crisis in this country because so many millions of Australians have no paid sick leave and they lose income, as I said, if they don't go to work. And we know the dangers posed by workplace transmission of COVID. And we know that workplace transmission in Victoria was the most significant driver of the second wave of infections that are still seeing lockdowns and constraints on people's lives quite rightly, but very difficultly in Victoria. Now, when we introduced this bill in May, our leader, Anna Bant, wrote to Prime Minister Scott Morrison asking for cooperation to find time in parliament to pass this critical legislation, which protects workers which protects the well-being of our community and protects our economy. And what the government is saying today, when it stands up through its leader in the Senate, Senator Cormann, and says that it is not prepared to cooperate to provide the Senate time to debate and hopefully pass this legislation, is that the government has other priorities. Well, let's look at the government's other Priorities. Let's look at what the government wants to do instead of debating this bill today. Well, first cab off the rank is a piece of legislation that is a stitch up between the major parties 
that will effectively allow them to launder political donations. It is nothing more than a money laundering bill for the benefit of the major parties in this country. That is what the government wants to prioritise instead of addressing a massive issue, a massive fault line in our country, which is how we have allowed so many millions of Australians to face the harsh day-to-day -day realities of casual and insecure work and how that is now driving a significant health crisis in our country. So we are all judged in here quite rightly by the Australian people on our priorities. And I invite the Australian people to make a judgment on the priorities that are being displayed by all of us in, place today, in this place today. On one hand, you have the Greens, with the support of Labor and the support of many of the crossbench, coming in and wanting to have a debate about a bill which will provide for 14 days paid COVID-19 leave to all workers if they've been diagnosed with COVID, if, they've, if they are unable to attend work because their workplace has been shut down by COVID, or if they need to self-isolate or quarantine in accordance with a Commonwealth state or territory government policy relating to COVID, or if they are caring for a person who's being diagnosed with COVID-19. And on the other hand, you have a government that wants to prioritise the laundering of political donations. I invite people to make their judgments, and I know full well where the Australian people will land on that. They will land on the side of those of us that are trying to stick up for people who are so Order, affected. Order, Senator by McKim. Um, time for the debate has expired, I believe. I'm looking at the clerks. Thank you. Um, so I'll now put the motion moved by Senator Faruqi, which is the suspension of standing orders. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is, stop the bells. The question is, the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. So we will return to the notice paper. I'll give senators a moment to uh, either vacate the chamber or take their seats before I call the clerk to resume business. Senators could uh, leave the chamber if they're not uh, participating in government business or resume their seats in silence. Clark. Government business order of the day number one, electoral legislation amendment, miscellaneous measures bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Farrell, I believe you're seeking the call. Thank you. Uh, you have the call. Chair. Uh, acting. Deputy Chair, uh, I seek to uh, make a contribution uh, to the uh, Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020. <coughs> uh, this bill seeks to make a number of amendments to the Commonwealth Electoral Act uh, 1918 and the Referendum Machinery Act 1984. Uh, many of the amendments contained in the bill are technical ones <coughs> that were recommended by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. In its review of the uh, 2016 federal election, these recommendations flowed from submissions by the independent regulator, the Australian Electoral Commission. However, the amendments which have garnered most attention are the amendments to section uh, 200, uh, sorry, 302CA and 314B of the Commonwealth Electoral Act. I want to make Labor's position clear up front. front. Labor supports the technical amendments and supports the intention of the amendments to section 302CA and 314B to clarify the Commonwealth's power to make laws with respect to Commonwealth elections. Labor will therefore be supporting the bill, uh, provided some important amendments are made, uh, which I will expand on shortly. The bill's proposed amendments to section uh, 302 CA arise out of the High Court's decision in the case of Spence versus Queensland, where the court found that uh, <coughs> section uh, 302 uh, CA to be wholly invalid. Section 302 CA provided that despite any state or um, territory law, 
a donation could be made to a federally registered party if the donation was required to be or must be used for federal purposes. This provision allowed gifts to be made to a party which may not be permitted at a state level as long as the gift was used or might be used for federal purposes. <coughs> the amendments to section 302CA um, seek to rectify errors in the drafting of the original clause and uh, bring it within the Commonwealth's power. Under the amendment, it is not good enough that a donation might be used <coughs> for a federal election. Uh, the donations must be expressly offered, sought, given, accepted and used for federal purposes. If they are not, then the relevant law, uh, state law will apply. The bill also seeks to amend <coughs> section 314b. The amendment should mean that donations which are above the state's threshold for disclosure but below the federal uh, threshold, which is currently $14,300, would not need to be disclosed to the State Electoral Commission if they are expressly given and used for federal purpose. Labor has taken time to consider the implications of the bill <coughs> and the recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, including those in Labor's dissenting report. As many of the submissions to JSKIM noted, the Commonwealth laws on political donations lag behind those of the states, and it's not Labor's intention in any way to weaken any of those provisions already uh, in place in the states. But the Commonwealth Parliament should be able to make laws with respect to Commonwealth elections. And those laws should not be able to be overridden by the states. <coughs> These members do not try to control the laws that state governments make in relation to state elections. They simply confirm the Commonwealth Parliament has the legislative responsibility for making laws in relation to Commonwealth elections. Labor is of the view that we should have a uniform federal system that treats federal parties and candidates equally, no matter which state or territory they are based in. All federal parties and candidates should be uh, playing by the same rules contained in the Commonwealth Electoral Act and not eight different state and territory electoral acts. I think we can all agree that we do not want to go down the path of the United States where the laws of the 50 states govern presidential elections. Imagine if an Australian state did not allow postal voting in a federal election, for instance. We must never forget how fortunate we are to have a uniform federal system for federal elections and we should not be undermining that now. If we do not address the inconsistencies raised in the Spence case, then it is not beyond the realms of possibility that a state donation law that is actually worse than the Commonwealth law could be imposed upon us. The state government could, for example, try to restrict the role of unions or charities in elections. Legitimate third parties that have a legitimate role uh, to play <coughs> in our democracy. Just because a current state law may be deemed uh, to be better uh, than the Commonwealth's, we cannot simply cherry pick that and apply it to Commonwealth elections. We wouldn't want to do that if the state law was worth, so we wouldn't want to do it just because it's uh, <coughs> allegedly better. What we should be aiming for is a better federal system, and we recognise the concerns raised by some submissions in JSCAM's inquiry. <coughs> we are pleased that the government has listened to Labor's concerns and has drafted an amendment to require federal donations to be paid into dedicated federal campaign accounts. We will have more to say on this uh, during the committee stage. <coughs> because we don't uh, want there to be any confusion as to which laws apply during the committee stage, Labor <coughs> will also be moving an amendment to delay the commencement of uh, the bill until after the Queensland election. That way parties and candidates and the Queensland Electoral Commission uh, will have certainty in the up-and-coming election. <coughs> we believe that a combination of those two amendments will ameliorate some of the concerns with this bill. Many of the submissions to the JSTEMS inquiry <coughs> called on the Morrison government to implement wholesale changes to the Commonwealth Electoral Act to improve the transparency of the electoral system. <coughs> <coughs> Labor has a proud history of political donation reform. It was Labor that secured the ban on foreign donations, protecting our political system from foreign interference. It was Labor's am amendments that linked public funding to the campaign expenditure, preventing parties from profiting <coughs> from the electoral system. And it was Labor under Bob Hawke that was the first to introduce a donations disclosure regime back in 1988, uh, sorry, 1983. <coughs> the Labor Party currently has two bills before the Senate which deliver 
on some, some of our long-standing commitments. One of these bills seeks to lower the disclosure threshold <coughs> from the current $14,300 indexed to inflation to a fixed $1,000. The other bills seek to introduce a system <coughs> of real-time disclosure where donations above the threshold uh, would need to be disclosed within seven days. If the Morrison government had any desire at all to improve the integrity of our system, uh, then it would immediately support these bills. <coughs> and Mr. President, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, I'll be moving a second reading amendment calling on them to do just that. A second reading amendment includes other reforms that will increase transparency, level the playing field and reduce parties' reliance on political fundraising and the, corro <coughs> the corollary of uh, the risk of corruption. We must catch up with our state counterparts and implement donations and expenditure caps. Recently, there's no limit to how much a person <coughs> or an entity can donate to a political party or candidate. In the 1617, uh, uh, Malcolm uh, Turnbull donated uh, $1.75 million to the Liberal Party, the largest political donation that year. <coughs> That uh, was, of course, eclipsed by Clive Palmer's record-breaking donation to the United Australia Party leading up to the 2019 election, an eye-watering $83 million. New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland all have caps on political donations and the Commonwealth should be following suit. <coughs> donations caps should work hand-in-hand -hand with expenditure caps. Expenditure caps would uh, level the playing field for candidates and parties and ensure that election debate is not dominated by the party with the biggest bank balance. To support these measures and to reduce parties' reliance on fundraising, the rate of public election funding should be increased and parties and elected independents should be provided with administrative funding to help cover the increased cost of compliance. <coughs> we call on the Senate to support these measures to improve the integrity of our electoral system. As mentioned earlier, the bill makes a number of technical amendments designed to rectify drafting errors and improve the processes of the Australian Electoral Commission. Labor supports these technical amendments. I would, however, <coughs> like to note the one amendment in particular that was raised in submissions to JSCM inquiry, and that is the provision relating to questions uh, that uh, polling officials ask of a voter to ascertain their entitlement to vote. <coughs> Currently, the Electoral Act requires a polling officer to ask, what is your full name, where do you live, and have you voted uh, before in this election? Occasionally, these questions can cause confusion and a polling official may need uh, some scope to rephrase the questions. The amendments provide the flexibility, but some submissions raise concern that the changes would allow a polling official to ask a voter to provide identification. As Labor's dissenting report for the JSCM inquiry pointed out, Labor does not support so-called voter ID laws. We believe that requiring people to provide identification may have, in effect, the effect of discouraging some people from voting and, in turn, undermine our system of compulsory voting. However, we are assured that the amendment is necessary in circumstances where a voter has a hearing disability or there is a language barrier that we will be seeking further assurances from the Electoral Commission that will not result in polling officials being asked, uh, asking for identification. I look forward to speaking more on the bill during the committee stage. <coughs> Senator Waters. Thanks very Sorry. much. Um, Senator Waters, just uh, hold for a minute. Senator Farrell, did you actually move your second reading minute or did you just uh, advise you would be? I didn't. I uh, certainly intend to. So do you move it now? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do it now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Senator Waters, you have a call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, here we have a government that said it was uh, not urgent to deal with paid pandemic leave so that people could stay home when they're sick and not spread COVID-19. But they think this bill is urgent. And this bill would allow massive donations from the big corporate mates of this government to keep giving them those dirty, big political donations. And that's what this government thinks is urgent business for the federal parliament. They are shameless. They don't want to actually help people uh, who uh, and stop the spread of COVID-19. They want to keep the spread of dirty political donations flowing. So that's what's been listed at last minute notice last night for the federal parliament to debate today. 
Now, the High Court had something to say about this. The original attempt by this government to try to get around the stronger state restrictions and the stronger state requirements on disclosure of political donations. The government tried to get around this the first time with the EFDR bill a couple of years ago. And the High Court said, well, no, you can't. It was terrible drafting um, and you simply can't get around those stricter state laws. And so here this government is again, it's come back with a redraft because it is desperate to keep those millions of dollars of big corporate donations flowing to its coffers so it can shore up its own re-election and keep delivering for those same donor mates. What an absolute crock. <laughs> We've got some stronger donations laws around the country at the state level. They're not perfect. Um, some of them, in fact, are still quite weak, but some of the states have moved to stop the flow of that uh, big, dirty money to try to make sure that democracy isn't for sale and that those big corporate donations don't simply uh, deliver representatives who can facilitate an agenda that boosts private profits. So New South Wales, of course, is the most well-known example. It's got much stronger donations disclosure rules and donations caps and donations bans. Now, it's not perfect, but it's a damn sight better than um, anywhere else in the country. Queensland has started to follow suit. And uh, thanks, I might add, to uh, pressure from the Greens in the lead up to the previous state election. The Queensland government have banned donations from property developers. Well, this federal government is not happy about that. And so now it's brought in uh, this bill today, uh, which, is, which is rushed through. Uh, and it's an attempt to allow the dirty money to keep flowing. Now, the statistics are appalling. This government, and frankly, the opposition too, are for sale to big donors. $100 million in corporate donations to both of those political parties since 2012. Is it any wonder that we see big tax cuts for corporations on the agenda, that we see $270 billion given out for weapons manufacturers, and yet they won't even provide paid pandemic leave for ordinary workers, and they won't even let casuals and temporary visa workers get access to JobKeeper. The priorities of this government are so clear, they are here to deliver for their big corporate donors. And so they don't want the restrictions that the states have started to impose on the flow of that money. And so this is an attempt to get around the High Court and allow that money to keep flowing into their back pocket. Now, we had hoped that Labor might stand with us and oppose this. And I can see that they've got some second reading amendments um, which we'll be supporting. But it remains to be seen whether they will support our committee stage amendments that would actually stop the flow of, of dirty money and would actually restore democracy uh, and, and give it back to the hands of the people, not vested interests and donors. Now, uh, we've got an amendment in particular which would lower the disclosure threshold for donations nationally. Because at the moment, it's a much higher threshold. Nobody knows who's donating to who if you donate less than that $13,800 threshold. Getting rid of the dirty money is the most important thing, but at least knowing about the dirty money is the second most important thing. But we're not even sure if the Labor Party will stand with us to fix that loophole or whether they just want to uh, have a second reading which says that but won't follow through and vote for the actual amendment when it gets to committee stage. So we'll be moving other amendments that actually slam that back door shut and that say that you can't just donate money to state political parties um, and allow other money to be freed up to be used. You can't just use that back door to keep the dirty money flowing. We want to eliminate that possibility and we want to clean up the system so that you can't actually donate if you are a property developer, uh, alcohol, tobacco, big mining, uh, coal seam gas, uh, a list of other industries that have for too long been influencing this parliament in a way that is not good for the community or the planet. The reason why we have no decent climate policy and why emissions have been increasing, uh, particularly export gas emissions, even in this COVID um, blip of a reduced emissions uh, time, the reason we don't have a climate policy is because this government takes millions of dollars from big oil, big gas uh, and big fossil fuel companies, big coal. Uh, this is exactly why we should be banning donations 
from that sector and from other big sectors that seek to boost their own private profits at the expense of the public interest. Now, I think that we've got some cross-bench support for those amendments, but this is a real test for Labor and the government. Do they actually want to stand with the community and with the public interest, or do they want to stand with their vested interests and their donors and let that dirty money keep dictating their policy agenda? We will find out soon enough, but sadly, um, I, I don't have a lot of hope that they will stand with us to ban that dirty money from those vested interests. Those same uh, vested interests that then offer very well paid jobs, I might add, to MPs once they leave parliament. It's a very cosy relationship. The money flows in, um, that gets used in the, uh, in the political campaign to keep seats, the policies get written that suit that corporate agenda, and the MP gets a lovely job once they exit parliament. It's a very cosy arrangement where everybody wins except the public. So we've got a chance to clean that up today, and it will be a real test for the big parties if they want to vote to support that. Now, the other thing we think is that dirty money should actually not be running uh, this place, irrespective of where it's coming from. So another really important measure that we've long proposed and will again be proposing today is to cap political donations from anybody at no more than $1,000 a year. So that includes um, corporations, it includes individuals, it includes organisations, it includes unions. Across the board, big money should not be buying outcomes. Outcomes should be determined by what's in the public interest and what's best for the nation. So again, it will be a big test for the other political parties in this chamber. Do they actually want to do their job to represent their constituents and to, to further the interests of the nation in a way that benefits everyone and benefits and protects nature? Or do they want to just be here for, for power's sake, keep taking the money and keep delivering for their corporate uh, big vested intra interest donors? Uh, we will find out. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is that we want to at least know the extent of dirty money that is slushing around in this system. Now, the federal government has long had much, much weaker disclosure rules than many other states have. And as I said, the uh, disclosure threshold is much higher. Many of the states have a disclosure threshold of $1,000, and often it's within a much shorter time frame, say seven days, for example. Now, we think there should be real-time disclosure, but the federal rules are so much weaker. You don't have to tell anybody about your donation that you've either given or received as a political party, except once a year. So it can be 12 months after the fact that you just got a whopping great donation that you have to disclose that to the public. Well, that's not accountability. That's not transparency. That means that people could vote in an election not knowing who's funded a political party's campaign and conveniently only be told about it many months after the fact, on the 1st of February each year. So that time frame for disclosure and the, uh, the threshold for disclosure are far too weak, and it allows a tonne of dirty, dark money to be slushing around funding political parties and exerting influence without the public even knowing. They don't know who, and they don't know in a timely manner. So we've got an amendment to fix that as well and to lower that disclosure threshold to $1,000, which matches the threshold of many of the other states. People have a right to know who is trying to buy influence from a democracy that is meant to represent people, but which has been hijacked by big donors and vested interests. People have a right to know. Now, I know this is the Labor Party's policy and we welcome that, but are they going to vote for us? I haven't got a reply yet. Even though they've got their own second reading amendment to the same effect, which we all know, sadly, is a great statement of principle that doesn't actually change the law, it doesn't have any tangible uh, impacts. The tangible impact that could occur is if they vote for it at the third reading stage, the committee stage, where I will move that amendment. And I really hope they do, because what's the point of having a policy if you don't vote for it? It's kind of meaningless. I've got a chance to lower the disclosure threshold for national donations, a huge improvement, but are they going to vote for it? We will find out. I believe we've got crossbench support for that, so it's coming down to Labor. It'll be very interesting to see whether they want to actually reveal who's funding their own campaigns because there's an awful lot of corporate money that flows into their campaigns as well. Now, um, we've seen the Labor Party come to an agreement with the government. Happens quite a lot, doesn't it? It's particularly where big, dirty donations are in question. 
uh, they've come to an agreement that they're okay with this backdoor that continues to let uh, donors get around stricter state donations laws. They're okay with this backdoor as long as they can get past the Queensland state election first. Well, that's a pretty cynical approach. Either you have a principled stance where you think that dirty donations uh, shouldn't keep on flowing and where stronger state restrictions should be respected, or you don't. It shouldn't be contingent on your own electoral prospects um, in a state election. So I found that a particularly affronting approach from the opposition. And I would urge them to support the Greens' strong amendments once we get to committee stage to really restrict the influence of big donations on our polity. Um, this is a long and sordid tale. We have been trying to uh, remove the influence of big money from politics uh, well, since as long as I've been in the parliament, and that's going back to, to um, 2010 election now. And still, we have $100 million in corporate donations that have flowed in to the big parties' uh, re-election funds. Donations reform is so long overdue, it is beyond a joke. And we've got a chance today to start to fix it. But it looks to me like the two big parties have once again reached an agreement that suits their political party's bottom line and it very much suits the agenda of their corporate and other large donors. Well, democracy should not be for sale. Political donations reform is absolutely critical. And in fact, it's the one issue, as I've campaigned for many, many years, that the community consistently raises, no matter who they vote for, they all think it stinks that big donors can make big donations to big political parties and get fantastic policy outcomes that suit their private profits whilst throwing the community and nature on the scrap heap. Everybody thinks that's corrupt. And what we have here is legalised corruption. It's legalised flow of big donations to buy outcomes that suit private profits and that deliver a well-paid job once that politician leaves parliament. It is legalised corruption. And we have a chance to clean it up today and to put democracy back in the hands of the community and start taking decisions that actually help people. You know, what an absolute shock that we might maybe give paid pandemic leave to workers so that they don't go to work sick and potentially spread COVID-19 because they can't afford to not get paid. You know, that's the sort of stuff that this parliament should be working on. And it took the Greens this morning to bring that forward. And of course, the government didn't want to support it. I'm grateful that on that occasion, we did have the support of the opposition. But no, the government thinks that's not urgent. What's urgent here is creating a backdoor so that big donors can keep making donations to political parties and shoring up outcomes. It is absolutely disgusting. The priorities of this government have once again been made completely obvious, and it's all about corporate favours for big donors. It's really heartbreaking stuff because we've got a chance to actually fix that today. And I, I know we won't get support from the government, but it remains to be seen whether we will get support from the opposition. And I know and I'm grateful for the support that we have from the crossbench. And I thank those members of the crossbench that have said they will support our amendments. Let's clean up democracy. Let's make it work for the people, for the public interest, like it's meant to, like we've all been elected to do. We're not here to deliver for corporate mates, memo to the government. We're here to actually protect the public interest, and it's about time they started doing so. Look forward to moving the amendments thank once you, we get Senator there. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I wish to contribute to this second reading debate on the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill. It is a key function of committees to ensure that any proposed legislation is carefully examined and that the public has an opportunity to contribute to those parliamentary deliberations. It is also crucial that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, in examining bills, seeks to ensure that any proposed legislation lessens regulatory burdens and red tape, which can significantly impact 
not only on smaller parties and independents, but also the wider voting public. The Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 contains a number of amendments designed to improve clarity, enhance electoral processes and strengthen electoral integrity in the Commonwealth Electoral Act and the, Ref and the Referendum Machinery Provisions Act. The bill makes necessary amendments to sections 302CA and 314B of the Commonwealth Electoral Act and clarifies the relationship between the electoral laws of the Commonwealth, states and territories. To alleviate unnecessary administrative burdens, the bill also includes a number of practical amendments, including changing the telephone voting method available to Antarctic electors to provide secret voting, changing staffing requirements for the Australian Electoral Commission to allow greater flexibility, allowing AEC staff, staff to make administrative marks on ballot papers, allowing pens instead of pencils to also be used to mark votes on ballot papers, minor practical changes to the Senate ballot paper to mitigate against excessive ballot width and streamlining the vote issuing process. These changes, amongst others, contribute to the Australian Electoral Commission's ability to deliver transparent, consistent and efficient elections while removing unnecessary prescriptive practices. The committee has therefore recommended that the bill be passed. The committee has also recommended that the government amend the bill to clarify that the recipients of donations will only be provided exclusive coverage under federal donation laws where they place donations in a federal electoral account that can only be drawn down for federal electoral purposes. This will ensure that the banking and accounting treatment of donations aligns with the legal treatment supporting a separation of state campaign activity from federal campaign activity. This amendment squarely addresses the main issues raised in submissions. I would like to, to thank everyone who made a submission into our inquiry into this bill, and I'd particularly like to thank my chair and the other members of the committee, along with the secretary, for their work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Madam De Deputy President. There's not much in politics that is predictable, but what you can always bet your last dollar in on is that when there's a chance to fix our rotten donation laws, the Labor Party will flub it. And I've got to say, always make this, make this same mistake. I'm owning up to it. Every time I hear the Labor Party talk about how they want to strengthen, fix, tighten up our donation laws or let's bring on national ICAC in Australia, I make the mistake of letting myself get sucked into having a bit of hope that they'll stick to their word. I make the mistake of getting my hopes up every time I make that mistake and we get burned. And so do the Australian people, because every time I hope they'll get it right, they just send it further backwards, and I'm always so disappointed. Maybe I'm just a slow learner, but I reckon there's a lot of Labor voters who'll feel pretty burned about this as well. Do you ALP backbenchers over there or in here even know what your own party is doing? Do you have any idea what they're making you vote for? You tell your voters that you want there to be greater transparency in Parliament. Once again, do you know what you're talking about? You say you'll fight corruption and combat the influence of big corporate donors, and then when the time comes for you to stand up for what you believe in, you blink, you roll over, you scurry off into a corner like cockroaches. No wonder no one listens to you anymore when it comes to transparency and what's best for the country when it, over political donations. We might as well not have an opposition party in this parliament because you, you give the government what they want every time. You care more about protecting your donors than you do more than what you do about your own voters. And I hope to God that they wake up to you sooner than later. Everyone who's giving big piles of cash to major parties wants things to stay the way they are. Everyone who's pinning their hopes to major parties that things will get better wants things to change. And every single time, the donors win the day. We're stuck in this chamber of acting only with the permission of the donor classes. Nothing about our donation laws can change if it hurts the ones who are donating their way into the hearts and minds of the major parties. <coughs> and because the ones who win out of our crummy donation laws are the donors, not the voters, the voters don't win out of this. Because the voters weren't were going to win, you'd actually go out there and earn your seat instead of paying for them. The voters just keep getting told to suck it up and shut it down. 
Why is it up to the crossbench to stick up for something so popular that 80 per cent of voters want? 80 per cent of voters out there want electoral change in the right way. You guys are always accused of being too focused on doing what's popular instead of doing what's right. And I'm here to defend you against that accusation because we've got evidence that it's wrong, wrong and it's right in front of us today again. Here we have a chance to do something that 80 per cent of voters support and you're not saying no too bad because I've got to keep my political seat and that's more important than doing what's right by the voters and what's right by the country, showing that there is no influence in both these chambers. And that continues to be shown out there that you know, pay enough money and you get plenty of influence up here in the big White House in Canberra. There's no doubt about that. There's no argument there. So full credit for Australians for standing up to the will of the people. Congratulations on fighting against the will of the people who voted you in here in the first place to begin with. There's something admirable about having the, having the strength to fight against your voters and fight for your donors. But I'm sorry to inform you that I don't have your spine. Unlike you, I don't take the big donations from the big spenders. There's two reasons for that. Firstly, they don't offer it, to be honest. And secondly, even if they did offer it, I don't turn them down. I'll care about my dignity too much to sell myself out and to sell out Tasmanians for that. I'm sure you and your voters would say it's always worth selling your souls if it gets you into office. Well, if you can sleep of a night time because of that, good for you. You're bigger than what I am. And maybe you genuinely believe that. After all, you can't do anything if you don't have government. That's what they say, at least. But here again, we have evidence today to prove that is not, that is not true. Because from the benches of the opposition, Labor is about to achieve something really huge. Let nobody say you have no power to make change from opposition. Because Labor is about to make huge change and they don't even need to win government to do it. What's about to happen in, in front of our very eyes is a pea and thimble track that would make a street magician blush. Labor is about to vote for legislation it says will strengthen our donation laws. It's about to move some amendments that will pass that it says closes all the loopholes and maintains all the integrity of our donation system. And as soon as they do, the cracks in our federal donation laws will blow open even further. They'll say they'll strengthen them and they'll get weaker. They'll say they're making things more transparent and they'll get less transparent. That's if there's not that there's much transparency left at all. They don't even need to have one government to do it. I bet the Liberals and Nationals are sitting back right now thinking, you beauty, they're laughing their butts off at you people over here. You just fell for it hook, line and sinker. And if the Labor Party wants to move amendments to the Liberal Party's dodgy donations bill, that will make it even dodgier. Nobody in the Liberals is going to stand in the way. They've walked all over the top of you. It's shameful today. And every time the Liberal and Labor Party get together to work on our donations laws, you can guarantee, you can guarantee when they're working together on donation laws or covering each other's butts, we are going backwards, not forwards. Scary stuff. Labor's about to argue that federal donation laws should be more like state laws. Boo jeez, I hope you're not following the state laws of Tasmania, because when it comes to donation laws, there are none. Isn't that right, Senator McKinn? That is absolutely right, Senator Landy. None at all. None at all. Then it's going. Fantastic, great move, well done. God, shameful day. It's going, to, it's going to say we should lower the disclosure threshold and speed up disclosure times. It's just not going to move any amendments to do either of those things. So, you know, and even though I know your amendments you want to do that, you know you don't have the votes. All you're doing is to make, try and make yourselves look good. Well, we're on top of it. We're on top of it. You know, people aren't getting fooled anymore by your amendments to say this is what we want when you know very well you don't have the numbers for it. That in itself is probably even more shameful, that you are trying to pull the wool over Australians' eyes. And I'm going to call you out for it. And instead it's, going, instead, it's going to pass a bill that insulates donations from any state laws that are tougher and stronger than the federal laws we have here. Laws which are, according to every expert who looks at them, the weakest of any jurisdiction in the country. Imagine arguing we need stronger donation laws and five minutes later voting to weaken our donation laws. I'd argue you have no shame because you have none. I don't even need to argue it because I imagine there's millions of Australians out there going, well, they do actually have no shame. We've known that for a long time. You know it because I've told you this is going to work. I looked at your amendments for 10 minutes and found a way to get around them. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So this has been through a committee, everything. 
apparently we're supposed to be, you know, we're supposed to be with it up here. We're supposed to be leaders. I look at a bill in 10 minutes, and already I'm finding holes in it. So I ask, was that deliberate, or are we that stupid and incompetent up here? We've already got law. We've already got holes in the bill. I actually believe it's deliberate. I actually believe that. I sincerely believe it's deliberate because I just don't believe you're that stupid up here. Well, I would hope not because otherwise we've got much bigger problems than what I first thought we had. Let's go through them. Before every election, parties take out massive, a massive loan from the banks. They use the money from the loan to pay for their election campaign. Then after the election, the AAC gives them back all the money they spent, courtesy of the public, courtesy of you people out there in Australia. You pay them back the cash. The parties take the money they got from the AAC and give it right back to the bank to pay back their loan. The interest on that loan gets paid by, their do by the donors. And none of this system gets touched by this bill. Not one bit of it. No transparency. It always amuses me how you guys always find a way around something. It's a pity you couldn't put all that energy and effort into actually making something solid instead of finding wriggle room or ways to go behind so no, you're hoping nobody picks up exactly what's going on up here. You can take money from any source. The source says it's, it's to be used for federal purposes. Fine. Paying back a loan counts as a federal purpose about as much as anything else does because it doesn't count as anything. No transparency going on here. You want it to be used for state purposes only? That's fine too. You aren't required to take out a loan for federal purposes only or a state purpose only. So you aren't required to repay a loan the same way either. This matters because loans, loans are not counted as donations. Oh dear. Oh dear. It's a pity we couldn't go and uh, borrow $30 million through the chair, Senator McKinn. Hey, we get away with this as well. They are called, they're not donations, they are called other receipts. Other receipts. If you're not sure what that means, it's because it doesn't mean anything, apart from there is no transparency of who's buying them up this time round. It's designed to mean absolutely nothing. It's like calling a bill miscellaneous measures, which is what this one is called. If you want nobody to pay attention, call it something boring and chuck it in first thing in the morning. So nobody else catches on before it's too late. My amendments would remove the unconstitutional sections 302CA and 314B from the Commonwealth Electoral Act rather than rewording them. <laughs> this would mean that state and federal donation regimes will operate together. Together. One scheme. Geez, that would be common sense. So state branches and political parties would have to disclose their donations causing to the rules in their jurisdiction. In the absence of strong donation laws at the Commonwealth level, this is the only way to ensure state branches don't use technicalities and loopholes to hide their donations from state disclosure regimes. This is what was recommended by multiple integrity experts in submissions to the inquiry on the bill, including the Human Rights Law Centre and Centre for Public Integrity. Integrity. I do get that word, integrity. So you would think this would be an integral part of the bill. If the bill passes with the new section 302CA and section 314B in it, we will effectively be knocking the legs out of state disclosure regimes. It would be a real shame if that happens, since the states are the only jurisdiction that are doing anything about donation reform at this stage. Well, they're trying to go forward, we're going backwards, except for the state of Tasmania, who's doing nothing. If you'd like to support my amendments, that would be great. If you can't, I understand. I'm not getting, the I'm not getting my hopes up on this one, once bitten, twice shy. And I've been bitten about 10,000 times by the Labor Party saying it cares about trans transparency, only to see it vote the opposite way. Sooner or later, I've got to stop getting my hopes up. I do have faith. I do have faith. I have to be honest. Because if you choose between breaking the hearts of voters or your donors, you have made up your mind faster than I can finish this sentence because you always, always put your donors first before the voters. And the sooner that those millions of Australians get this through their thick head, that what these donations do 
because there is very little transparency on them. There is very little, there's no time disclosure, 14 months later, to reveal where your money comes from. If you've got nothing to hide, let's be honest, if you've got nothing to hide, what's wrong with seven days? What's wrong? And, you know, and then I get some rubbish from, from uh, Minister Cormann saying, oh, but you know, small business, they give 10,000 bucks, they'll have the union thugs outside their door. I mean, what is, that's not the biggest load of rubbish. I have heard in this chamber since I've been here, blow me over. And you know what I said? I said, where'd you get that from? I haven't read that in any of these submissions, nothing. I think it was just something he made up after his wheat picks yesterday morning. Must have had an extra couple. I mean, come on. This is why the Australian public has very little trust, very little trust in us. And you people up here are not helping. You are not helping. You are going in the opposite direction of transparency and fixing up our political disclosure reforms. That's what you're doing, and you should be shameful. You've got the Greens bill, you've got my bill going on, you've got Central Alliance bill, but oh no, 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 the government doesn't want to talk about that, doesn't want to talk, doesn't want to bring that to the table. And you know why? Because it would clean it up. It would clean it up. Why, you don't care about trust from the community because you buy your seats with your million dollars worth of donations. We do, because we have to go and earn it. We have to go and earn it. You let me know when you're standing at traffic lights with campaign signs and spending 50,000 bucks of your own money to earn a seat, and then I might take you seriously. Because I know I can stand here and know that I can truly say I did not buy my seat. I earned it, and by God did I earn it. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, there's an old saying in politics. We run a coin down the side of anything that's going on, and the first thing you'll expose is self-interest. And the Australian people are about to get a classic demonstration of that old adage. Because self-interest is right at the heart of this legislation. And let's name up what this legislation does. This will legalise money laundering by political parties. Let's be frank. Political donations corrupt our democracy. They encourage the corruption of individuals, the corruption of members of parliament and senators, and they encourage the corruption of political parties. This is the government making it legal to funnel money that would otherwise be illegal under state laws through their federal branches. And I want people to understand what is going on here. This legalisation of money laundering, this encouragement of political corruption, I predict is going to slide through with the support of the Labor Party. They're going to make a big hoo-ha now and try and make it look as if they've got some issues here, but I reckon they're going to let it slide through. And it'll be very interesting to see how they vote on some of the amendments that the Senate will shortly consider. I want to remind people that my home state of Tasmania has no state-based political donations disclosure laws. None whatsoever. And believe me, in the last state election in 2018, we lived through the impacts of that lack of state-based political donation disclosure laws. Because the state of Tasmania and the people of Tasmania have never seen anything like what happened in the 2018 state election. And it should be a lesson to the Labor Party, because it actually cost them a go at forming government in Tasmania. Because for once in the Tasmanian Labor Party's recent history, they actually took a half-decent policy on poker machines 
to the election. It wasn't as strong as the policy the Greens took, but at least it actually had a go at constraining the monopoly power of federal hotels, an obscenely rich privately owned company from New South Wales that has and still has that had and still has a monopoly on poker machines in Tasmania. A company owned by Greg Farrell, who's made himself obscenely rich by sucking the food off the table and the money out of the wallets of so many Tasmanian families who are doing it so tough. And that campaign cost Labor a go at forming government. And how did it happen? It happened because people like Mr Farrell, people like the mainland pokies barons, stuffed millions of dollars into the pockets of the Tasmanian Liberals, into the pockets of the Tasmanian Hotels Association, run by Mr Steve Ould, who prostituted himself for the pokies barons during that election. And you couldn't move in Tasmania without seeing the signs on the sides of the pubs that themselves have been making obscene profits from the pokies' monopoly for so long. You couldn't move down there. We've never seen anything like it. I've been in politics for a long time. I've never seen anything like it. And the Greens live in this space. We face these campaigns against us every single time in Tasmania. They get bigger every time. And I've still never seen anything like what we saw in 2018. The pokies, barons, bought government for the Liberal Party in Tasmania, and they are still in government today as a result of that corruption, that base corruption of our democracy in Tasmania, made possible because we don't have any state-based donations disclosure laws in my home state. What an utter disgrace. What an utter disgrace that is. We will never know how much the pokies barons threw at that campaign. We will never know. And we should know, because it is a fundamental right of voters, when they go to the ballot box, to know who has donated how much to which political party and candidate. Because elections should be a contest of ideas. They shouldn't be a competition to see who's got the deepest pockets. But unfortunately, that is where we are in our completely cooked democracy in this country. Because elections have become about who has the deepest pockets. And our democracy has been fundamentally corrupted by political donations. And when you add the effect of political donations on our democracy to the revolving doors that exist between the boardrooms of the big corporations, the greedy profit-making machines that couldn't care less about the impact of their actions on the environment or on our communities, the revolving door between their boardrooms and this place in here, where we see time after time major party politicians accepting political donations, coming into this place and running corporate agendas and delivering for their political donors and then sliding out the other side of the revolving door and walking straight into a cushy consultancy or a cushy directorship in the boardrooms of those very corporations. It makes me sick. It makes me sick to witness it. And both major parties do it time after time after time. Whether it be big banking, whether it be big gaming, whether it be big fossil fuels, we see it again and again and again. And who loses? The Australian people lose, our environment loses, and our democracy loses. And who wins? 
the big greedy corporations win again. 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 And if you want a prime example of the revolving door, I'm going to refer you to the scandal that was the Australian government's bugging of the Timor Leste government during negotiations around a treaty to allocate fossil fuel resources uh, from uh, the Timor Sea, when Australia illegally bugged the Timor Leste government during the negotiations for that treaty. This is the matter that uh, Mr Caleri is currently uh, undergoing a secret trial in relation to. And what happened? Shortly after that scandal, Mr Downer walked out of politics, a man at the very heart of what happened, walked out of politics and into a cushy consultancy advising Woodside Petroleum, the big corporate beneficiary of that unlawful action. I could go on about that revolving door, but suffice to say, it makes me absolutely sick. So this legislation gives us the chance, as Senator Waters said, to actually start fixing up this corruption of our democracy, to actually start making sure that laws actually do their best to restrain this corruption, to make sure that laws actually do their best to turn elections from being a competition to see who's got the deepest pockets or the thickest wallets into a contest of ideas. Because, colleagues, surely we can all agree that elections should be a contest of ideas conducted on a level playing field. But at the moment, the playing field is tilted and it's tilted in favour of the major parties and the people that they truly represent in this place, particularly the LNP, who, uh, let's face it, are the political arm of corporate Australia. I mean, in my home state of Tasmania, you don't even have to worry about using a brown paper bag. That's how bad it is down here. What's that? It's an Audi bag, says uh, Senator Patrick, and he makes a fair point. But whether it's a brown paper bag or an Audi bag, the point remains. You don't even need to wrap the cash up down in Tasmania to try and hide it. There's nothing to hide it from because we don't have state-based political donations laws in Tasmania. And there are some of us in this place, and look, there's a lot that uh, Senator Lambie says and does that I don't agree with, and I think that's pretty clearly on the record. But what, she's recent, what she said in this debate, I 100 per cent concur with, 100 per cent, and so do the Australian Greens, because Senator Lambie, like the Australian Greens, has been a long-time campaigner for reform on political donations. We've been at it for decades. She's been at it for a shorter period of time, but, uh, but that's because she's been in parliament for a shorter period of time. And we've been campaigning for this for a long time, and I, and I want to thank uh, other members of the crossbench that actually do demonstrate integrity, like uh, Senator Patrick. And if um, the LNP needs some help with integrity, let me spell it for them. I N T E G R I T Y. Can you say it? Do you know what it means? I don't think you do. I don't think you do. And what you're doing in this place here today demonstrates that whether or not you can spell it, you actually don't know what it means. Because you're bringing this bill in to facilitate money laundering. You're bringing this bill in to facilitate corruption. The corruption of our democracy, the corruption of politics, the corruption of Australia. Because if you can't have confidence in your democracy, 
and in your political systems, how can you have confidence in anything that goes on in this place? So I look forward uh, to the debate on this bill. Uh, as Senator Lambie says, uh, we've got concerns about the position Labor is going to take, particularly in regards uh, to some of our amendments, and we will see whether Labor let this one slide through. But I just urge senators, please, we need to tidy up our democracy. We need to clean it up because it's broken and it's cooked and it's not delivering for the Australian people. Who it is delivering for are the big corporations. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on uh, this bill. Um, I note that the uh, bill has a very um, innocuous title, um, Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill. And indeed, that's what this is. It's just miscellaneous measures. It doesn't actually go to the heart of what really needs to happen in respect of uh, electoral reform. You know, Australians need to know that if, if you donate anything less than you know, $14,300, the disclosure requirements are almost non-existent, and uh, that's the thing that uh, needs to be uh, dealt with. That's the real issue that needs to be dealt with that is not being dealt with by this bill. And people ne also need to understand uh, you know, what's happened. This bill wasn't actually uh, 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 listed until late last night. The way things work, just to let you know, is that. Uh, uh, prior to parliament uh, sitting, the government provides parties with a list of legislation that they uh, expect to be brought up in the, in the upcoming sitting period. And that allows people uh, like crossbenchers and Labor uh, to examine legislation and uh, they know which legislation to focus on. Well, this bill wasn't on that list. What, what's happened over the last couple of weeks is that uh, uh, Labor has concluded its discussions with the government. They've reached a, a position, and now that they've done that, they have to urgently deal with this. And Senator Lambie was absolutely correct this morning when she pointed out uh, during the uh, 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 motion to suspend standing orders that instead of looking at legislation that would be designed to uh, help people who have to make a choice between going to work, uh, with, you know, understanding they, they potentially have COVID or certainly understanding they've got a cold, uh, or staying at home and not being able to feed their family. An awful, awful choice. And that's a bill that we could have uh, talked about today, we could have debated, that would have helped Australians. Instead, we've put to the top of the priority list a miscellaneous uh, uh, measures bill that is so miscellaneous it actually doesn't go to the heart of the problem, the heart of the thing that concerns most Australians, and that's uh, political donations and the transparency around those political donations. You've, you've uh, seen over the last two weeks in this place, um, we've seen JobKeeper legislation uh, passing through the, uh, the Senate yesterday, and during, that, uh, uh, during the debate on that, we looked at how taxpayers' money is, is going into the JobKeeper program, and, and everyone in this chamber supports that. But then following the money and seeing what happens afterwards, we saw Accent Group receiving $13 million of JobKeeper and uh, its CEO getting a $1.2 million bonus from that. We saw IPD Education uh, receiving $1.4 million in JobKeeper and its CEO getting a $600,000 bonus. We saw co companies like Nick Scarley receiving $44 million from Australian and New Zealand governments to help them through the pandemic and then paying $2 million in dividends to their, uh, you know, to their investors. Now, what we didn't talk about was what else that money might be used for. What else would that money be used for? It's a gift, effectively, from the taxpayer getting funnelled through a system, and I have, I have no doubt in my mind some of that will end 
uh, up in the hands of uh, the LNP and indeed Labor through donations. And this bill doesn't seek to, to, to look at that. But that's just Australians need to be aware of what's happening with their money. So often the money that is getting uh, passed to uh, the large parties by way of donation is not even the company's money. It's money that's been taken from the taxpayer. We also talked about uh, over the last uh, week or so, we talked about grandfathered large proprietary companies. These are companies, 1,119 companies, that are not required to lodge financial returns to ASIC. So we don't know even uh, if they're paying higher dividends. We don't know if they're paying uh, uh, bonuses uh, to their executives as a result of perhaps receiving JobKeeper. We don't know what a JobKeeper is doing to, to position those companies so that they can donate to political parties. And uh, on numerous occasions in this chamber, we've tried to, to uh, stop that loophole, and the government has resisted. And I do thank uh, 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 the Labor Party and all of the crossbench for their support in trying to stop this. But the government has, uh, on multiple occasions, uh, voted against that. Uh, uh, failed. It's gone to the House, come back. Ping pongs occurred. Uh, but but in, in doing so, they've provided no policy basis for uh, that provision to stand, for, to, to give elitist companies the ability to, to not lodge those uh, ASIC returns. And I am absolutely sure that some of that money will flow from uh, uh, some, some of the profits of those companies will flow into the hands of uh, the major parties. Now, uh, I mentioned this last week. Uh, Michael West, who examines these things, is looking at every one of those 1,119 companies. He's using uh, uh, the ability uh, that journalists have to access uh, corporate uh, uh, reports uh, and uh, uh, to do so free of charge, and I encourage all journalists to utilise uh, that facility that was negotiated by Nick Xenophon and myself uh, with the government uh, uh, in the last parliament. Uh, Michael West is going to pull all of this apart, and we're soon going to learn who those 1,119 companies are, who the beneficiaries are of those companies, and indeed. Uh, uh, then we can start looking and uh, tracking back to donations back to the Liberal Party, and then we might find the policy reason for them resisting closing down that loophole. This bill doesn't get to the heart of some of the, some of the matters that uh, uh, that really do concern voters. Let me tell you how this works. Yes, uh, we've got Senator Rustin, we've got uh, Senator Cormann sitting on the other side of the chamber. Um, the way this works uh, to avoid disclosure, and this needs to be addressed, and the Greens, one of the Greens' amendments uh, seeks to do this, um, a lot of companies are not allowed to make political donations. Their corporate governance prevents them from making uh, political donations. So what do they do? They turn up to a Liberal Party function and they'll pay $2,500, $5,000 per ticket just to have dinner. Now, if that is not understood to be uh, uh, you know, outright corruption, bypassing their own govern governance to pass money to political parties, they don't have to declare that as a donation. They're simply paying to go to dinner. Everyone needs to understand that's how the Liberal Party raise a lot of money. Completely. Um, opaque in respect of, uh, of, uh, of, of who's contributing. And uh, I can see on the other side of the chamber, no one's looking at me. No one's looking at me. They're all embarrassed by what I'm telling you. How I'm, uh, you know, this is how they generate money. And it's unacceptable. You should be declaring that. You should be declaring that uh, you had a dinner and you charged $10,000 a seat and you raised half a million dollars for uh, the purposes of, of then later getting yourself re-elected, but you're not. 
And the, and the bill that's before the parliament today doesn't address that. We need to have disclosures for uh, donations that are uh, real time and have a much lower threshold uh, than what currently exists, $14,300. I don't, I don't mind people who, who donate to a political party because they like what it is that they're doing. I like the idea that grassroots people can uh, contribute. They look and say, I like that party. I'm going to support them. I'm going to send my 20 bucks to, uh, to the party and I'm going to help them. I'm appreciative of them. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, encourage them. And uh, you know, I think that's okay. But there's a difference between saying, I like what you do and therefore I'm going to contribute, and, and saying, uh, give me lots of money and you've bought me. And that, at the very least, is the uh, apprehended position of most Australians. They see that as political parties being bought by big corporate donors. Okay, so um, th these dinners have to stop. But they won't stop because neither of the parties will let that happen. In fact, even COVID couldn't stop, that, stop it. We've had, uh, we've had uh, dinners that are being paid for uh, by uh, big corporates to come and sit down and have dinner with uh, their friendly uh, LNP MP, paying a mozza for it and doing it during COVID, whilst everyone is being told to uh, be responsible, to self-isolate, to avoid gatherings. All of that good medical advice gets ignored when it's about funding political parties. And this bill does nothing to address that. So um, you know, it is accurate the bill title. It is a miscellaneous measures bill. It hardly does anything. It doesn't go to the, to, to the big issue that most Australians are concerned with. And that is making sure that democracy is, uh, it, it, you know, it functions on behalf of the people, not those with the biggest checkbooks. We have to get uh, solid reforms uh, occurring not these miscellaneous measures. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I thank uh, all those in the chamber who have contributed to the debate on the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020. Uh, I also take uh, the, this opportunity to thank the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters for their thorough review of the bill and their even-handed examination of the issues raised in submissions. The committee found that the reforms in the bill will deliver important enhancement, uh, enhancements to our electoral system. I also thank the committee for their recommendation uh, for minor amendments to clarify key parts of the bill related to the interaction of electoral laws of different jurisdictions uh, consistent with uh, the government's intent uh, with this reform legislation. The government will move amendments that reflect that recommendation, and I will say more on those details during the uh, in-committee stages of the debate. I also foreshadow that the government uh, is uh, also willing to support uh, an opposition amendment to the commencement date, as was proposed separately by the opposition members of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 is one of the oldest pieces of legislation in Australia, and the reforms in this bill are important to help modernise parts of the electoral system and to assist the IEC to deliver effective and timely electoral events. Many of the amendments in this bill were included in an earlier technical amendment bill in the last parliament, and while those reforms were recognised at the time as necessary, they were carried across to the current parliament so the IEC could focus on the delivery of the most urgent machinery changes ahead of the 2019 federal election. This bill contains numerous improvements. Uh, uh, the most important uh, among those it extends a confidential voting service to Australian voters working in Antarctica. It removes the requirement to designate some divisional offices as pre-poll centres where they are unfit uh, for purpose, including lacking disability access. It helps contain the width of the Senate ballot by allowing candidate names to be printed underneath preference boxes instead of only alongside boxes. 
It clarifies the interaction between federal, state and territory funding and disclosure regimes and it allows flexibility in work wording of questions to help find a voter on the roll, which will better assist people with a non-English speaking background or those with a hearing disability. In summary, these reforms will improve the operational efficiency of elections, remove overly prescriptive language in the Act, improve services to particular disadvantaged or geographically remote voter groups, and strengthen electoral integrity and administration. Um, and I, I should say, having uh, listened uh, to the uh, contributions uh, to this debate, um, you know, as far as this bill is concerned, it appears that most of the um, contributions have focused on uh, the uh, measures in this bill which clarify the interaction between federal, state and territory funding and disclosure regimes. And uh, the principle that the government is uh, seeking to pursue here is a very simple one, and that is that state laws uh, should govern uh, state elections and federal laws uh, should govern federal elections. State laws should not govern federal elections. And uh, I, I got to say, um, I, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised by the strength of um, commentary from the Greens and, and even from my good friends and valued colleagues in Centre Alliance. Because, well, and, you know, you, 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 you're, you're making all sorts of allegations using offensive big words. In relation to a piece of, and, and here we go, and we've got Senator Waters now making signs, uh, money signs on the, on the screen. When, when, when the last, I mean, this, this is actually something that has previously been legislated through this chamber. This, this principle is something that's previously been legislated through this chamber, except that it was much broader than what is in front of us now. It was much broader than what is in front of us now. What is here is a very narrow set of measures to ensure that there is clear separation between federal and state laws when it comes to the, uh, the management of uh, federal election and state elections. And you know what? The broader arrangement, the arrangement that went further than what is in, in this bill in front of us, you know who voted for it? You know who voted for it? The Greens voted for it, Senator McKim voted for it, uh, Senator uh, Waters, I'm not sure whether Senator Waters was uh, in the Senate at the time, it might have been uh, at a time when um, she was inconvenienced with constitutional matters, but I certainly know that Senator McKim voted for it. I also know that Senator Seward voted for it. I know that Senator Patrick voted for it. I know that Senator Griff voted for it. So this confected outrage now that somehow we're doing something terribly uh, secretive. I mean, this is something that's been around for some time. It is something that all of you have voted for in the past, you know, applauding the government for you know, pursuing sensible reform. And now, because it's convenient in terms of the political narrative that you want to run, you, you, are, you are somehow suggesting that there is something nefarious here. Well, this is very, very plain and straightforward. This is a housekeeping bill. This is actually a housekeeping piece of legislation that helps to facilitate the proper functioning of our democracy, of our parliamentary democracy. Yes, I, know, I mean, Senator Patrick, you voted for a much more significant measure consistent with this principle of separating federal and state laws when it comes to electoral matters. There is nothing I mean, it, it is entirely appropriate, the principle that federal law should govern federal elections yeah. and state laws should govern state elections and state laws should not seek to interfere with the conduct of federal elections is entirely straightforward, it's entirely proper, it is entirely proper and, and that is of course why I thank uh, the um, uh, opposition for their appropriate and sensible support for what is an ab absolutely appropriate and sensible housekeeping reform. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I think we'll deal with Senator Farrell's second reading amendment now. Uh, the question is that the uh, amendment moved by Senator Farrell uh, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. 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 I think the noes have it, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, it's unfinished. Stop the bells. The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy, tell her for ayes. Senator Brockman, tell her for the noes. The result of the amendment is ayes 24, noes 24. It is therefore negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for looking at the whips. One minute.
I'll ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Brockman, teller for the ayes. Senator Seawitt, teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 42, noes 4. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask a chair of committees to take the chair. Oh, the clerk, sorry. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to electoral matters and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I uh, table a supplementary ex explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this yeah. bill, and uh, I seek leave to move uh, government amendments uh, 1 to 8 on sheet UV 130 by leave together. Just a moment, Minister. Before I see if leave is granted, I'll just um, I skip the preliminary starting. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Um, so, uh, is leave granted to the minister to table the? No, I, I don't need leave for the tabling. It's just for the moving. Of the yes, bills. leave is granted for the. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I move uh, government amendments on sheet UV 130. Uh, these amendments give effect to recommendations from the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. I restate on the record uh, my thanks for the committee's work. The government and the opposition representatives on the committee agreed that the Commonwealth Electoral Act should apply exclusively uh, to federal political donations, but they recommended that this should be conditional on banking uh, federal donations in separate federal purpose only uh, accounts to strictly separate these funds from any state campaign funds. As the committee puts it, this would align the accounting treatment of federal donations with the legal treatment proposed in the bill. Uh, this proposal, raised on a bipartisan basis by JISCAM members, is compatible with the technical amendments in the government's bill uh, and is entirely consistent with uh, the, intentions, uh, the intention behind uh, those amendments. The government amendments circulated in my name will implement this recommendation. The amendments provide that as a condition for being covered exclusively under federal electoral law, federal funds must be deposited in a federal account and can only be used for federal electoral expenditure or transferred to another federal account. This is equivalent to legislative requirements adopted in some state and territory electoral laws. It is increasingly the case in recent years for state and territory jurisdictions to require that political parties deposit all funds intended for election use uh, at state and territory level in dedicated campaign accounts. Accordingly, many political parties already operate separate bank accounts for their state and federal campaigns. To the extent some do not, these amendments will require new practices for dedicated handling of federal money. As JISCAM put it, and I quote, a federal purpose account would effectively create a, a sanitized stream of financial activity within a state arm of a party that is fully separated from the state affairs of the party. It would remove the capacity to shuffle funds between purposes after they have been committed and banked. The amendments include integrity rules that will nullify inappropriate attempts to misuse federal donations for non-federal electoral purposes. For example, if a political party initially banks a donation in a dedicated federal account but later spends that amount at a state level, then Commonwealth law is deemed to have never applied to that donation. The federal account would also lose its federal status at that time. In this instance, a donation may be subject to state or territory law, including where relevant penalties, reporting requirements and potentially registration obligations. Importantly, while the amendments protect the right of the Commonwealth Parliament to make exclusive laws for federal elections, they are very carefully drafted to ensure state and territory electoral regimes continue to apply to the fullest extent possible uh, to donations related to their own elections, to their fullest extent, I should say, to donations related uh, to uh, their own elections. Specifically, uh, these amendments make clear that for avoidance of doubt, the Commonwealth does not in any way impair powers of a state regulator to seek compulsory production of documents in relation to contravention of state laws. Together, the effect of this set of amendments is to ensure that there is a uniform federal set of requirements for donations that have a federal purpose. Without laws to protect the Commonwealth Parliament's power to regulate its own elections, people in different corners of the country uh, could potentially be subject to very inconsistent uh, donation rules based on where they live. The amendments reflect the government's readiness to address issues that surface in the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters process. Uh, these amendments make uh, parts of the bill more targeted and key, uh, and they demonstrate the value of improving electoral legislation on a bipartisan basis through uh, that committee. I commend the amendments to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, Labor will support the um, government's amendments. 
And in particular, we welcome the government listening to uh, Labor's uh, suggestions that parties should be required to keep separate state and federal campaign accounts. Several state jurisdictions already require that separate state campaign accounts be maintained. Separate federal accounts will provide an additional layer of transparency and accountability to ensure that the actors in the electoral process cannot use the Commonwealth um, Electoral Act to circumvent state electoral laws. Uh, Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Well, this is a bit tricksy, really. The government has managed to sew up the opposition's support for this whole bill, which I might add its Queensland state counterparts strongly oppose, and they've done so on the basis of this provision, which requires a separate bank account to be used. Well, I'm afraid that's not enough protection from the influence of big money over our politics. Um, clearly, if money goes into a separate bank account, it's still going into a pool of funds. It will still therefore free up other funds that could then be used for state purposes. So uh, whilst this is a very small improvement, it is nowhere near enough of an improvement and it still allows a dodging of those stronger state restrictions. So I'm, I don't take any comfort from this. I know the opposition does. I know the Queensland Labor Party does not, uh, but your internal squabbles I, I will leave to you. Um, but this is not enough of a reassurance. The fact is big money is still flowing. And um, I note uh, Minister Coleman's reference there to disparate regimes, well, harmonise them, have some strong national laws with caps on donations and with proper disclosure thresholds. That's the solution uh, that would actually clean up politics and deliver a good outcome. And I might just also address some of the comments that Senator Cormann made in relation to uh, the Greens' support for previous versions of this bill, the EFDR bill. I was uh, in the parliament when this vote occurred. And we moved an amendment that would say that federal laws should not be allowed to override stronger state donation uh, laws. And you guys voted against it. So it's a bit rich for you to uh, somehow accuse us of having a curious position when, in fact, we sought to improve this last time. We are now seeking to improve this this time. I have a private member's bill which would also seek to clean up donations laws. Uh, we have been entirely consistent and will continue to bang our head against the brick wall that is uh, made of your big donors' vested interests until we smash it down. So I just wanted to get that on the record. I might also sadly add that the supplementary explanatory memorandum, which uh, Senator Cormann tabled what, four minutes ago, um, has not properly been circulated. I've managed now to se secure a copy of it. But again, we see a government that doesn't take this chamber seriously. Um, it's sewn up the opposition to support them on this amendment, so it's thrown due process um, out the window once again. Uh, but we understand the intent of these amendments. We've read them. We don't need the sup EM, but I just wanted to note that it is bad practice to not circulate um, documents like that that pertain to chamber business. Um, and so, yeah, they are the comments that we have about this amendment. As I say, it is a very small improvement, and on that basis, we will be um, supporting this amendment. But it is nowhere near enough, and it does not overcome the litany and the tide of big, dirty political donations that you are still allowing to flow. And it doesn't really disguise the fact that you're still attempting to circumvent stronger state donation laws. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. Just, just to assist uh, Senator Waters, uh, on uh, 15 November 2018, uh, a previous bill uh, pursuing a, a, much more, a much more broadly framed change, seeking to separate federal electoral laws from state electoral laws, passed uh, you know, in the period between uh, 10 past 6 and quarter past 6 uh, unanimously unanimously. Uh, this bill, even unamended, even without this amendment, is much, more narrow, is much more narrow in its focus. It is being very explicit that there can't be any interference in any way, shape or form by federal electoral laws into state electoral laws, in the same as we don't want to have any interference by state electoral laws into federal electoral laws. Uh, it is, this 
bill in front of us is already much narrow. The amendment that I've just moved puts it beyond doubt that there is to be complete separation. The Greens previously were part of a unanimous support in this chamber to uh, implement a change of this nature, which is eminently sensible. And uh, the reference uh, for uh, Senator Waters, it's uh, page 8,430 uh, in the Senate handset for uh, 2018. It uh, was uh, just before quarter past six on Thursday, the 15th of November, 2018. So the question is that the, uh, Senator Waters. Yes, Chair, that is exactly why I sought to place on the record the amendment that we sought to make to that previous bill, which this government voted against. So I'm, I'm a bit baffled as to why Senator Cormann thinks he's scored a point against us there. Um, I, re I will let the hands hard stand on that record. So the question is that the... Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, what I want to ask uh, the government, and I just want to make it known that One Nation had no idea this bill was being brought on this morning. So everyone else knew about it, moved amendments to this bill. But what I want to ask Senator Cormann, and in, in light of the fact that this is due to the Queensland government moving legislation which will impact on the federal, uh, um, federal government in the states to do with election um, donations. Um, Minister, if this bill's not passed today, will that mean that the federal arm um, of the um, of the political parties in Queensland will be treated totally different to every other state? Uh, Minister, uh, the answer to that question is yes, uh, and um, this, this is housekeeping legislation, which should be entirely uh, non-contentious. Indeed, it was entirely non-contentious when a much more far-reaching reform along those lines was passed by the Parliament uh, back in 2018. We want to ensure that federal elections are uh, organised nationally on a nationally consistent basis. A state electoral laws should not be able to interfere with the conduct of federal elections and uh, you know, our federal candidates and federal representatives uh, out of Queensland should not be uh, disadvantaged compared to uh, their counterparts in other um, other states and territories. I mean, this is uh, it, it is a completely and utterly commonsensical position that there should be a, a uniform approach to the conduct of federal elections on a nationally consistent basis, uh, and uh, passage of this legislation. Uh, will ensure that happens and uh, you know given that the uh, joint standing committee on electoral matters uh, provided its report um, this is uh, this is the opportunity to deal with this senator lambie um, thank you madam deputy president um, how will loans be treated under these amendments Minister. Uh, there is no change under this bill uh, to the treatment of uh, any loans. I mean, that will be handled in the usual way, the way it's currently handled. Senator Lambie. So, um, so there's no change. So how, do you, how, how are you going to make sure the, the repayments on loans aren't used to launder donations for federal purposes into state branches of political parties, if you've made no changes to that? Minister. Um, the, the purpose of uh, this bill, as well as addressing a range of practical issues that um, the uh, Joint Standing Committee Electoral Matters has identified, the purpose of this bill is to ensure that the conduct of federal elections nationally, on a nationally consistent basis, uh, is governed by federal electoral laws, and the conduct of state elections you know, consistent, uh, as it is consistent across re relevant state jurisdictions, is governed by state electoral laws. Um, we, we think that that is an entirely straightforward uh, proposition and we, we can't see where the contention should be in that very straightforward proposition. Okay, Senator, so uh, Senator Lambie, wait for the call. I'll call you now, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, okay, so you've left a massive gap here, let's be honest. How much does the Liberal Party loan? Well, how much did you loan in the last election? 
Minister. Uh, I, I don't believe that the um, internal affairs of the Liberal Party are a subject of this bill. I don't represent uh, you know, the Liberal Party organisation uh, in this chamber. I represent the govern government. Um, clearly, whatever the arrangements are that uh, are engaged in by the Liberal Party, by the Labour Party, the Greens uh, political party, uh, the Jackie Lambie network, or indeed uh, the you know, Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, uh, all have to comply with relevant uh, laws. Uh, what we are saying is that when it comes to the conduct of federal elections, uh, those should be federal laws, and when it comes to the conduct of state elections, uh, they should be the state laws. Senator Lambie. So, um, so we still have no transparency. So, if you, if we, it, you get loans, uh, Liberal Party, Labor Party, Federal get a loan. Therefore, uh, when you have your, um, when you are paying that loan back out of people's political donations, apparently that is not counted as a political donation. That is counted as a loan. Now, that to me, that to me is absolutely, I can tell you now, political corruption. When I'm looking at, no, these people over here get $30 million and I've got no idea, no idea because there is no transparency out of those political donations by the time they're supposed to be political donations and now called loan repayments. You don't see that as a gaping big hole? Minister. Well, Lo loans provided uh, to political parties in the context that uh, Senator Lambie suggests are disclosable um, and uh, you know, these, these arrangements um, have to be and should be transparent. But this is actually not the object. I mean, the, the issue that Senator Lambie is raising in the broad is not the object of this bill. The object of this bill in, in relation to the interaction of state and federal electoral laws is that um, state law should um, govern the conduct of state elections and federal law should um, govern the conduct of federal elections. Um, obviously it is open to any uh, individual senator to pursue either amendments uh, to this bill on matters that they wish to raise or pursue or to move a private senator's bill if, if, if there is an issue that uh, in the view of individual senators ought to be pursued. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President. Well, maybe if you'd have given us time, and I go back to through the chair through what Senator Hanson said, and bother to give us time to actually look at this instead of shoving it up, shoving it down our throat this morning in quick succession, then we'll be able to do that. Does that not tell you there's something politically corrupt going on here, or what? Now, so tell me this then, Minister: How is a federal purpose defined in this bill? Minister. Um, in terms of definition of relevant expenditure, it just relies on the existing uh, definitions in the electoral law of uh, electoral expenditure. Uh, and, um, So, so the definitions of electoral matter and electoral expenditure uh, are pre-existing definitions and uh, really uh, what this clarifies is that any um, campaign donations uh, for federal matter or federal expenditure, I mean, election related uh, expenditure and electoral matter, um, ought to be governed by, this federal elect by the Federal Electoral Act, whereas uh, state elections ought to be governed by the State Electoral Act. I, I also don't accept that this is something that has come out of nowhere. I mean, this was unanimously passed uh, in 2018 in a much broader um, set of arrangements. Uh, so, and there was a process leading up to this. This has been with the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters since 2019, uh, since the middle of 2019. And there's been a lot of work done uh, through the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters is uh, recommending that this proceed uh, based on uh, relevant amendments, which uh, the government and the opposition uh, will be uh, moving. This is, this is an issue that's been around for a long time. It is simple housekeeping and, and the basic proposition, which uh, is eminently reasonable, is that federal law should govern the conduct of federal elections and state law should govern the conduct of state elections. Senator Lambie. 
So um, it, was it was unconstitutional to begin with, and it's been to the High Court since then. So of course we have a problem now, and the High Court has a problem now as well. Is it still unconstitutional? Minister. There's absolutely no circumstance in which a government uh, would put forward uh, you know, deliberately an unconstitutional piece of legislation. Uh, clearly, uh, we have taken very careful note of the uh, findings of the High Court in relation to the original bill, which was supported unanimously because it was sensible reform in terms of the intended sort to pursue. Uh, and in this bill, we uh, have uh, ensured that we reflected uh, the findings of uh, the High Court in relation to the previous uh, piece of legislation uh, to ensure that it is consistent with the requirements of um, the High Court in terms of constitutionality of uh, what is in front of us. Uh, specifically, we are being very, very clear that uh, federal law uh, can, uh, only, should only govern federal elections, that state law should govern state elections, but there, that there should, that where there is any doubt, where there is any doubt, uh, then uh, federal law would not apply. I mean, federal law will only apply to those circumstances where donations are exclusively and specifically uh, directed for federal election purposes. And the amendment that I have moved on behalf of the government uh, will provide a further reassurance uh, to, to ensure that that strict separation uh, in, ter in terms of the management of campaign donations is indeed guaranteed. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Except for when it's got to do with the loan repayment, because then it's not a political donation, it's a loan repayment. So I have to ask, and I'm going to ask either side here, those both Labor and Liberal, do you intend, now you know that there's this massive loophole, do you intend to fix this loan situation? Minister. Well, I, I don't accept that there is a loophole. I mean, if, if Senator Lambie is concerned about a loophole, um, I, I'm very happy. Uh, uh, to refer uh, for consideration by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, the issue of uh, loans for the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters to assess uh, any issues that Senator Lambie believes uh, arise. But uh, you know, for the purposes of this legislation, uh, it has no bearing on what um, Senator Lambie uh, might think ought to be addressed. Senator Lambie. And Minister, if you were to do that, can we actually have that sorted before the next election so we don't have no com any confusion between a political donation that floats across here and the next thing it's known as paying off the loan? Minister. Um, uh, look, uh, you know, in, in the end, I, I don't control uh, the timetable of parliamentary committees, uh, you know, as, as you would appreciate. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm quite happy uh, to ask the uh, Joint Standing Committee Electoral Matters to conduct to, to uh, assess uh, the issue. And if Senator Lambie wants uh, to write to me and provide some uh, context and background to what uh, Senator Lambie believes the issue at hand is, uh, I'm very happy to receive such a letter. What I would say, though, again, uh, this legislation has no bearing on this. This legislation, uh, in relation to the relevant point that is being discussed, only does one thing. It ensures that there is strict separation between uh, federal law and state law when it comes to the conduct of federal, election, federal elections as opposed to state elections. And it helps ensure that there is a nationally consistent approach to the conduct of federal elections, which uh, we think is uh, entirely appropriate. Senator Lambie. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. And I, I will do that. So thank you for giving me the option to do that. Um, how will the AAC or State Electoral Commission or state electoral commissions know if money is not is not used for federal purposes. What's what's the complete cut? So we know sometimes that it gets very confused between state and federal passing money over to each other. So could you tell me um, how will the AEC know if state electoral commissions know if the money is not used for federal pur purpose from Minister. state to federal? Well, the, the whole point of this account is to put this even further beyond doubt, and there are integrity and compliance measures on top of that. I mean, the, the fact that there's a requirement uh, to maintain a totally distinct uh, bank accounts for like a federal purpose bank account separate from any other bank account, including any state uh, purpose uh, bank account, uh, means uh, that uh, you know, these matters uh, can be uh, properly scrutinized uh, if and as required. Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, um, 
So do you have a watchdog or something set up? So what will happen when money is not used for a federal purpose? Is there any, yeah, you know, is there any, um, you know, you know, does anyone done get gone criminally, or is there any sort of watchdog? Um, are there any? Is there any uh, any disciplinary action going to be taken? What's the go here? Minister. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, the Australian Electoral Commission is the independent statutory authority that is responsible for the conduct of uh, elections and also to ensure compliance with all aspects of relevant uh, electoral laws. And as I've indicated in my previous remarks, yes, I mean there are uh, penalties and, and, and compliance and integrity measures, uh, you know, in place, including in this uh, bill, uh, to uh, to ensure compliance with these arrangements. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of short remarks before I ask a question, uh, and that's just in relation to Senator Cormann's second reading uh, speech. Uh, I just want to make it clear that, uh, because he was directing, in some sense, a criticism uh, at the crossbench for having uh, supported previous legislation, and of course, uh, anything that makes uh, electoral donations uh, or, or, or pushes electoral do donations to more to, to a position that's got greater integrity, uh, you'll find support. Uh, the criticisms I made in my second reader were not in relation to anything this bill is doing. It's in relation to the, what the bill is not doing, and I think it, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit disingenuous to suggest uh, anything other than uh, what I was suggesting was there wasn't uh, the, the, the bill didn't deal with uh, certain things that uh, that, are, that are important to most Australians. Uh, it's in that vein I'm going to ask questions about coverage of this bill, and in some sense this may go to some of the amendments that. So, so in terms of uh, order, um, it, it may save time later. Uh, as a preliminary question, Minister, are you aware of the arrangements that take place in? Uh, political parties whereby uh, dinners are organised and uh, members of companies or organisations or indeed individuals turn up to, the, to these political functions uh, or political dinners and pay uh, a price which would not reasonably be considered to cover off uh, just the food. In, in actual fact, these, these dinners generate money which uh, are used by parties uh, to participate or to uh, advocate their position in election campaigns. Are you aware of those dinners and functions that take place? Minister. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, f firstly, um, I'm, I'm very happy to note that uh, Senator Patrick has confirmed that he supports this bill. He just thinks the bill doesn't go far enough, and, and I see him not. The hands up doesn't pick up a nod, so I'm, I'm just happy to, to um, hear from his contribution that that is his position. Support for the bill, but he thinks there should be other things in it. We're always happy to talk about what else can sensibly be done, and, and the long-established process in our parliament to deal with matters on a non-partisan basis when it comes to all aspects of the conduct of elections is to do it through the uh, uh, Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, and we're always open to pursue this. Now, in, in terms of, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's long-standing practice that, uh, you know, political parties, individual candidates, uh, you know, people from all backgrounds who uh, want to uh, seek public office. Uh, I mean, you, campaigns have to be funded. I mean, I think that's well understood. So funds have to be raised. Uh, there is a, a disclosure, a transparency and disclosure regime uh, in place uh, to, um, to ensure that that is uh, done in, in an appropriate uh, fashion. I, I'm aware of the uh, fundraising activities uh, of, of my party. I'm aware of the fundraising activities of other parties. I think it is a democratic right for uh, individual Australians, including individual Australian businesses, uh, to participate in and to support the democratic process. In, in fact, I think you'll find that many uh, businesses who, who participate uh, in these sorts of events um, engage with um, uh, politicians from all different uh, sides of politics uh, because you know they've, they've got something that they want people to understand. And, and, but also, I mean, some people are just, just happen to be strong Labor supporters or strong Liberal supporters, or strong National supporters, strong Centre Alliance supporters. And you know, I, I, I would put it to you that every candidate and every uh, party participating in an election 
uh, has to be able to finance their participation in that election. It's, it's a very important part of the process because how else would we get our arguments in front of the Australian people uh, to ensure they can make an informed decision? Senator Patrick. Yeah, so my question goes to, uh, and thank you for acknowledging these, these functions take place. So under the current legislation, does, uh, do, if, if someone turns up to a, a Liberal Party dinner and pays $2,500 for a seat or $5,000 for a seat, uh, are these amounts declared by parties? Are they required under current legislation to declare the total earnings that might come from such a function? Minister. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, de declarations, I mean, all, all political parties, all candidates need to declare the donations they receive consistent uh, with um, our laws. That's entirely a matter for them. Again, I mean, this bill has got absolutely no bearing in relation to this. Uh, you know, if you want to move amendments uh, that, uh, if you want to move amendments uh, because you're concerned about uh, the way uh, some of your political competitors uh, conduct their fundraising, uh, then you know, that is obviously something that's open to you. Senator Patrick, and then I'm going to go to Senator Hanson. So I do concede that these, uh, these, these questions in some sense relate to amendments that will be moved, but I'm, uh, in my consideration of those amendments, I, I'm trying to seek to understand what is currently covered. Uh, if, uh, if a political party were to hold a dinner and charge $2,500 for 10 seats, would the $25,000 have to be declared as a donation under existing legislation or under anything that this uh, bill seeks to introduce into law? Minister. Well, I mean, you know, a gift is already defined in our electoral laws uh, to include an amount without consideration. So the uh, markup on a function, um, you know, based on what you suggested earlier, the markup on a function above uh, cost is a disclosable amount. This is not changed by the bill, and uh, your your concern, your apparent concern, is already addressed uh, by uh, the current uh, electoral laws. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Minister, in your um, section 57, subsection 200D1, it states that a voting officer must um, put to each person attending before the voting officer and claiming to vote in an election or elections questions in order to ascertain the person's full name and the person's place of living and whether the person has voted before in an election or elections. Minister, why is not identification asked for, for it to be shown? prior to voting? Minister. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Senator Hanson. Uh, so um, this bill does not include a requirement uh, to show uh, voter identification. I mean, in this bill, um, it goes to the questions that an IAC official uh, has to ask of voters. Um, there are the three mandatory questions before they hand out um, a ballot paper. This, is, and this bill allows greater flexibility for polling officials about how they can word the three mandatory questions uh, to uh, help the IAC communicate with voters who face uh, language barriers or disability issues. Three questions are about name, address and whether someone has voted previously at the same election. But nowhere in this bill is there uh, any new fourth question permitting an official to ask a voter for ID documents. Having said that, uh, it is uh, the introduction of uh, voter identification is something that the government supports. Uh, it is something that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, uh, chaired by Senator McGrath, is uh, currently considering, and it is something that uh, you know the government would be prepared to bring forward in a separate piece of legislation in the future. Thank you. Um, question. Okay. okay, Senator Hanson. Yeah, thank you very much. I raised that point because. Voting is the heart of our democracy and people should, who vote, we have to know that they are the right person that is voting. What we find at elections is that people get fined if they vote more than once, we don't, uh, if they don't vote. We don't seem to find people who are crossed off on the electoral rolls more than once because we can't identify them. It, it, what I, I'm saying here is um, with also not putting um, 
requesting a person's um, details or showing identification as a driver's license, which most people carry, or maybe a Medicare card or even their credit card to show that that is actually person voting. When we actually go to, to the bank, we must show identification. We want to open up an account. When we go to purchase a mobile phone or a SIM card, we must show three forms of identification just even to get a mobile phone. Yet it's not considered, and this has been the argument of a lot of Australians, that they don't have to show identification when they go to vote. Now, it is known fact that a lot of people go around from booth to booth and vote multiple times. Minister, when will you act on making sure that people have to show identification um, and rather than saying we're working on it, this has been going on for years and years and years, and I must point out to the people of Australia, that it was the Newman government that introduced voter identification. But as soon as the Labor Party got elected in Queensland under Anastasia Palaszczuk, her first um, legislation she put forward was to get rid of voter identification. And I've got to ask the question, why? So, Minister, people in Australia don't want... Uh, we're looking into it. This has been happening for years and years. There is fraud going on in our voting system, when are you going to take it seriously enough to show voter identification and will it be for the next federal election? Minister. Uh, <clears throat> th thank you very much, um, uh, Chair, and I thank Senator Hanson for raising what is a real and genuine issue. Uh, we do support uh, the introduction of voter identification. This bill does not uh, introduce voter identification, but we do support it. And um, it's good to uh, know that uh, One Nation, if there was uh, a relevant piece of legislation coming forward in the future, would be supportive of that. Um, obviously, uh, we would need to uh, convince some others in this chamber uh, that this was a meritorious reform before we would be able to get uh, this uh, through the Parliament. Um, multiple voting has been a long-standing risk that all electoral systems face, and the government uh, welcomes constructive ideas like this one to address this problem. Uh, voter identification reforms, though, will uh, require legislation. Some parties in the parliament um, have voiced stringent opposition to such proposals in the past, and so I guess the reason we are prioritizing what can sensibly be done is uh, in recognition of um, you know, where the um, uh, political realities are in the Senate at present. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, what repercussions is there um, when the money? What will happen when money is not used for federal federal purposes? What is the repercussions? Is there any is there any legal requirements put in? I mean, we know we have no watchdog over this. We're down on AEC staff. So, is it, is it, is, there, is there any action taken over this sort of stuff? Minister. So, as I uh, indicated uh, previously, um, and, and I did um, as part of my, as part of my uh, comments to the amendment that is in front of us, if somebody breaches uh, the requirements of strict separation of uh, funds received for federal purposes from funds received for state purposes, they lose the benefit of uh, federal legal protection. It means that um, state, the current state laws, as appropriate uh, in Queensland you know, in this circumstance, would apply. Uh, all the relevant state uh, penalties would apply, um, and relevant integrity measures at a federal level uh, would apply. The only way uh, campaign donations will fall under federal legislation, federal electoral legislation, as is appropriate, is if uh, there is compliance, demonstrated compliance. Uh, with uh, the strict separation requirements uh, for, in, in relation to relevant funds received. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. How many enforcement actions has the AUC taken in the past 10 years? Minister. I'll have to take that on notice. Senator Lambie. Uh, could you please, whether or not you form the um, chamber, do you intend on putting any more staff um, or adding to any more stuff at the Electoral Commission so that we can keep an eye on this stuff and these changes? Minister. Uh, uh, th thank you very much, <laughs> uh, uh, Chair. Um, uh, thanks, Senator Lambie, for that uh, question. 
uh, the Electoral Commission is an independent statutory authority. Um, you know, we uh, are always open to receiving advice and representations uh, from uh, the Electoral Commissioner, uh, Tom Rogers, uh, in relation to staffing requirements. Um, you know, we believe that, uh, as it stands, based on current settings, uh, the Electoral Commission is appropriately resourced, but you know, there are always a, a range of uh, things that come up and developments that arise, and uh, we will continue to make the appropriate judgments on the appropriate level of resourcing. Senator Lambie. Have you, um, has either one of the major parties, have you put any thought into enforcement of these rules at all? Uh, thank you. Well, enforcement of these rules is not a matter for political parties. The compliance with these rules is a matter for political parties. I mean, all political parties, all candidates, all relevant actors that are captured by uh, the federal, Commonwealth, well, the Commonwealth Electoral Act, um, need to comply with the law. And uh, compliance with the law is uh, uh, a matter for the Australian Electoral Commission. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just uh, continuing on from the discussion, and thank you for your previous answer, indicating uh, that if, a, uh, if we have a, a dinner function and there are 10 companies that turn up and they pay well above uh, the cost, that the, in effect the margin is reportable, does, that, does, does the uh, donation or contribution get attributed to those who attended the dinner? So if it, uh, in this case I suggested 10 companies turning up, Company A through Company J, is the uh, is the disclosure attributable uh, or the or the uh, margin attributable attributable to each of the companies that attended? Minister. Uh, well, th that depends on the um, you know, that depends on whether it is above or below a relevant threshold. So um, that is not a question that you can uh, answer without information about the specific circumstances. As Senator Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, this question seeks to differentiate between senators and ministers of the Crown. Uh, in your capacity as a minister, or sorry, uh, let me rephrase, um, have you been to any of these fundraising dinners yourself where the ticket or the invite uh, mentions a dinner with the Minister for Finance or Minister Cormann as opposed to Senator Cormann? Um, I participate in. I'm one person, um, and like uh, all of my colleagues, and I would say on both sides of uh, Parliament, uh, who occupy relevant positions, uh, I participate uh, in uh, the um, democratic processes uh, of this Parliament and uh, in the community, including the campaign fundraising events. Senator Patrick. So it's a, it's a quite a specific question in relation to you as the Minister for Finance. Have you attended any dinners uh, that might uh, be fundraisers where the dinner has, uh, uh, has been advertised as a dinner with Minister Cormann or the Finance Minister uh, or the Leader of the Government in the, in the Senate? So in the, your capacity in the executive as opposed to a senator. I'm happy if you take that on notice, Minister. Minister. I, I don't have to take that on notice. Uh, you know, I'm quite happy to confirm that I have attended uh, fundraising events uh, in my capacity as a backbench senator, in my capacity as a shadow minister, as a in my capacity as a minister, in any capacity that I've held as part of the uh, political process, the democratic process, uh, consistent with all of uh, our laws and consistent with all of the arrangements that appropriately apply. Of course, I've attended uh, events that support uh, the democratic process. Senator Patrick. So uh, you answered the first part of the question, that, but the specifics, and I apologise if I didn't articulate this clearly, I'm wondering about dinners that you have attended where they have been advertised as dinners with, uh, the, with the minister, uh, either as the finance minister or as, uh, as Minister Cormann as opposed to simply a dinner uh, where it's promoted as a dinner with Senator Corbyn? Um, uh, th thank, thank you very much, Mr President. I, mean, I, I did answer that question. Uh, I'm one person. Uh, I'm a senator for the great state of Western Australia. I'm also the minister for finance. Uh, I uh, attend events. I, I don't believe that I'm 
uh, ever responsible for sending out invites. Um, I attend events, uh, as I know that everyone, uh, well, anyone who operates, uh, you know, either on the shadow front bench or uh, the government's front bench, or I would suggest uh, even um, you know, senior representatives of the Greens, uh, I suspect, would uh, attend uh, events that are designed to mobilize the required level of support to maximize your chances of being successful at an election. That, that is an entirely unremarkable reality of uh, the democratic process. Senator Patrick. So, Minister, you'll be aware that uh, uh, in the three arms of government, that being the executive, the legislature and the judiciary, under our constitution there is an overlap, and that overlap exists in circumstances where someone is both a member of parliament and a minister. Uh, the, so there's an overlap between the legislature and the executive. I'm interested in, your, uh, uh, in dinners that you have been to where uh, your where, where the dinner, dinner has been advertised uh, as a dinner with a member of the executive as, as opposed to a senator. So it's a reasonable question. I'm differentiating between you. I know you're the same person, but you actually, uh, you actually are being uh, are characterised in two different roles under our constitution, as a senator and differently as a minister. And it's the second that I'm interested in. Minister. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President. Uh, I can confirm again for Senator uh, Patrick that, uh, like uh, every other front bencher on uh, the opposition benches or on the government benches, I participate in campaign fundraising events, uh, and all of us have to do so consistent with uh, all of the relevant legal requirements. And uh, I'm very confident that at all times. I have uh, participated in any electoral or campaign fundraising events in uh, a way that is consistent with the law and consistent with uh, the relevant uh, parts of the ministerial uh, code or a statement of uh, standards. Senator Patrick. So I've just, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciated your comments where you talked about the democratic process and, and people are entitled to come along with, to these dinners and they get to engage with with uh, parliamentarians. Um, I'll put on the record that uh, anyone who wants to talk to me simply has to pick up the phone and uh, arrange a meeting through my diary manager and there's no cost associated with it. I'm, I'm just trying to establish whether there's a price associated with meeting with a minister versus meeting with a senator and the intersection of that with these with this legislation and how it, how it might be treated, uh, whether or not it's treated differently. Yes. Uh, th th thank you very much, um, Chair. I mean, I, I was quite happy to uh, provide good faith, genuine, direct answers to the questions, but I object to the imputation just now. People do not have to pay to get access to me. I mean, people who want to get access to me can get access to me, subject to uh, time limitations. Uh, people don't have to pay to get access to me. But people who want to support including with financial donations, uh, the campaign effort of one or uh, another side of politics are entitled to do so, as long as uh, everyone concerned complies with all of the relevant laws of the land. And nothing in this bill uh, has any bearing on that, incidentally. I mean, this bill, you know, the, the part of the bill that there seems to be a level of uh, discussion about is about strictly separating uh, the um, federal laws which should govern federal elections from state laws, which should govern state elections. It should not be that state laws um, can interfere with the conduct of federal elections. And we, we should and we, we believe we must have nationally consistent federal electoral arrangements. Senator Patrick. So, thank you, Minister. I do appreciate that, uh, in some sense, I'm asking questions that may be better, better uh, uh, suited to when uh, the Greens and uh, Senator Lambie has moved some of her amendments and uh, <coughs> perhaps I'll leave it there and I'll come back to these questions when those uh, amendments are moved because they do go to the very questions that I'm asking. So the question is that the... Um... Sorry, Chair. Oh, Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, Minister, would you agree that allowing property developers to give money to a Queensland state 
branch of a political party, even if it's transferred into a separate federal account. Would you agree that simply allowing that flow of money in fact maintains support and the relationship between that developer and that state party in a way that could potentially influence that state party's policy position? Minister. No, I do not. Um, I absolutely do not. I mean, as a matter of principle, I am of the view that all Australians should be able to participate in the democratic process. And at a federal level, when it comes to federal elections, Australians should be able to participate in the electoral process based on all of the rules and um, the laws and uh, rules uh, at a federal level. And at a state level, it should be governed by state laws. Uh, this legislation ensures that there's strict separation uh, between the two. Uh, if the state uh, parliament in Queensland wants to uh, put in place certain arrangements in terms of how uh, electoral arrangements are put in place and how campaign relations are to be uh, organised, that is a matter for them, and that is the law that applies in Queensland for state elections. Uh, a state parliament should not be able to impose different rules in one jurisdiction uh, when it comes to uh, the conduct of federal elections uh, compared to those that apply in the rest of the country. Minister, do you support the restriction in Queensland on property developers donating to political parties, or do you think they should just be able to continue to donate willy-nilly? Minister? A matter for the State Parliament in Queensland. I am responsible for electoral affairs at a federal level. And uh, that is why we are putting forward a reform proposal through the federal parliament. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. What happens if a donation is given for federal purposes but used for state? Will the donor be liable? Minister. All, all of the relevant state laws and state penalties would apply. I mean, as soon as uh, there is a breach along the lines that uh, Senator Lambie suggests, that would mean uh, it, this is a law of the uh, Commonwealth electoral law, and presumably, if it was by uh, a non-permitted donor at a uh, state level, uh, then that donor would be liable uh, to the penalties applicable under state law. Uh, the only way uh, that um, relevant donations would uh, be protected through federal uh, legislation is if they comply with all of the requirements under the federal law, including the requirement for strict separation. Senator Lambie. Um, so, Minister, I was just wondering if you might be, explain, be able to um, explain to me um, how, how they actually how they call that out. How, does that? how do they get caught for doing that? What is the process that somebody actually catches them out for doing that? Minister. Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, well, I mean, th there are, there's a regular program of uh, uh, returns and audits uh, by the Electoral Commission. Um, and, you know, clearly, I mean, it's, it's the normal and uh, business as usual approach to compliance arrangements. I mean, a combination of uh, risk managed uh, spot audits. Uh, obviously, if somebody uh, is of a view that something untoward has happened, uh, allegations are made and investigated. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the principle here is that this uh, bill, if enacted uh, after passage uh, through the Senate, uh, will ensure that there is strict separation between donations for federal purposes, campaign donations for federal purposes, from uh, donations for state purposes. There can't be any overlap. If there is any overlap at all, then uh, the uh, state uh, provisions would, uh, would be enlivened. Senator Lambie. Oh, I have to say, Minister, I'm loving the tap dancing, so let, let's, let's, let's get straight to the point. How can any law hold a donor liable for the misuse of their donation if they have no control over that? Minister? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, with the greatest of respect, I mean, the point that Senator Lambie makes here applies to every and any law. So, I mean, what you're essentially saying is we should not impose uh, laws and uh, like integrity measures and penalties because uh, you know what you're essentially saying is uh, they don't work anyway well we don't agree we, we believe that the arrangements put in place through this bill uh, are effective will be effective 
the, uh, the operation and the management of our electoral act um, through the Electoral Commission uh, is effective. It has uh, served Australia very well for a very, very long time. We've got a very stable uh, democracy. We are recognized globally as uh, you know, one of the world leaders when it comes to openness and transparency and uh, stable, uh, proper democratic processes. And, and this legislation, once passed, will contribute to that. Senator, Lam uh, Senator Lambie, and then I'll go to you, Senator Waters, after the next question. So, are you suggesting, Minister, that every donor should be held liable for any illegal use of their donation? Minister. Well, uh, I mean, and any, anyone who breaches the law uh, should, of course, be uh, subject to the penalties uh, that come with uh, that breach of the law, of course. I mean, but, you know, I mean, you, you're, you're assuming that everyone will just breach the law. I'm assuming that, uh, you know, overwhelmingly Australians seek to comply with the law. Where that is not the case, of course, that's why the penalties are there, so that they are enforced and imposed in these circumstances. Senator Waters, Senator Lambie has a follow-up question. If we go to her and then I'll come to you. Senator Lambie. I'm just wondering, um, Minister, how many of those donors in the last 10 years have actually been done for any, has, has a donor ever been done? Has any enforcement ever been brought on upon a donor? Because you know you've got these stringent laws and they're so great. Has a donor ever been done? Minister. Well, th thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, uh, I mean, this legislation obviously is only just being introduced. You can't have managed uh, enforcement action in relation to provisions that haven't yet been passed by the Parliament. But in terms of um, arrangements uh, previous uh, to the passage of this bill, uh, the Electoral Commission absolutely uh, enforces uh, compliance with our electoral laws uh, as appropriate. And uh, you know, we have full confidence in the effectiveness uh, of uh, the Electoral Commission to do the job that Australians rely on. Senator Walters. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, in Queensland, who runs the Liberal Party's federal campaigns? Is it your federal Liberal Party or is it your state LNP organisation? Um, so thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ch um, Senator Waters, uh, through you, Chair. Um, well, I mean, the uh, Liberal Party organisation is uh, a national party with uh, state divisions. I think that that is well known and well understood. Senator Waters. Okay, so I, I, I presume by that you mean that your state organisation, at least in part, runs your federal campaigns, but correct me if I've misinterpreted your non-answer. Um, so is it the case that a property developer would still donate to your state LNP, that same state LNP that it couldn't uh, donate to were, the, were at a state election? It's the point about the nexus and the relationship between the donor and the person receiving the donation. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the whole point of this legislation, uh, you know, compared to the one that you previously supported uh, as part of unanimous vote in the um, Senate in November 2018, it further narrows down and further imposes an even more stringent separation. So, I mean, only where uh, combined, campaign donations are provided for the express and sole purpose of uh, federal electoral matter and federal electoral uh, expenditure uh, is uh, that donation covered by the federal electoral laws. Uh, where there is, um, unless that is the case, unless, uh, um, an, unless a campaign donation is exclusively for federal purpose, uh, if, it, if it goes for any other purpose, uh, it will be governed and will continue to be governed by state laws. Senator so, Waters. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so that property developer, they will be donating to the state LNP, though. Is that not correct? Minister. So to, to clarify again what I said before, I mean, if it's untied and if it's not exclusively for federal purposes, then uh, you know, the state law in that circumstance would apply. I mean, you know, for relevant parts, a federal law would apply, but not for this particular aspect of it. That's right. Yes, but the donor, the person, oh, sorry, Chair, thank you for giving me the call, but the donor would be the same. 
but it's the same state party receiving the money and still maintaining that relationship with the property developer, which is meant to be banned in Queensland for state electioneering, but there's still an exchange of money, that relationship is still maintained, and ergo that policy influence would still be exerted over that party. Well, I, I mean, I disagree with the basic premise of this uh, proposition, but uh, the, the point is uh, anyone who is eligible to participate, to exercise their democratic rights, uh, to participate in the electoral process, including by supporting financially their party of choice uh, in Western Australia or in South Australia or in Tasmania or in New South Wales or in Victoria, should have that same right in Queensland. And state law should not interfere with the capacity of an individual Australian to contribute to a federal electoral process. Now, I mean, you might, I mean, I think that that's an entirely unremarkable, uncontroversial uncontro proposition. You might have a view that federal electoral laws should be designed differently, and, and I mean, I've heard you make these arguments before, and that's fine. But, you know, in the end, uh, it, it's federal law that should, uh, that should govern the conduct of federal elections without inappropriate interference of uh, any state law. Senator Waters? Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, we just have a fundamentally different view about where the line should be drawn. And yes, we do think that federal law desperately needs reform. And yes, we do think that uh, donations federally should be, uh, should be restricted and should be properly disclosed. So I, I suspect we're not going to have a meeting of the minds on that issue. Um, but nonetheless, we will persist with moving our amendments to strengthen federal law because um, it sounds to me like the back door is still there, and if you've got that relationship between big donors and a state branch of a political party, it's pretty artificial to say that the mere existence of a separate bank account will somehow quarantine the influence that that donor will have on that branch of the political party. So that, that, um, that legalised corruption still remains, even though it may be in a separate bank account. That influence is still being peddled, and that is exactly why we are seeking to ban donations from listed sectors and to cap donations from everybody else. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Minister? You, no? That, oh, sorry, Senator Lambie. Sorry, Chair. Uh, I'd just, I just like to go back I'd just like to go back to um, whether or not the donors should be held liable or, you know, for any illegal use of their donations. So I'm going to give you an example of the real world here. But if I give you money and tell you it is not to be used for a legal purpose and you buy illegal firearms with it anyway, are you really saying that I'm going to be in breach of the law for your decision to breach the law in the first place? Minister. The, the, um it is incumbent on the party to comply with the law, and if the party does not act consistent with the requirements as proposed in this bill, then it's the party that loses uh, the uh, benefit of that strict separation between federal and state electoral regimes. Um, and, and that is clearly a, a very significant uh, incentive for parties to do the right thing. Uh, because I suspect, you know, whoever the political party, it's an entirely non-partisan statement, I, su I suspect that whoever uh, the relevant party or politician uh, is in this context would not want to find themselves in that situation. I think that there is a very significant inbuilt incentive to uh, strictly comply with the requirements in this legislation. Senator Lambie. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to... I don't seem to be getting where we need to go here. I don't, I don't think this is very clear. So I just... So let me get this right. So if the party misuses a donation, the donor is not to be held liable for that. I thought the opposite was the case. Minister. Well, I mean, a donor that provides a, you know, just going through the hypothetical example, a donor that provides a donation to support a, a federal election or to support a, a party of, you know, his choosing, his or her choosing in the context of a federal campaign effort, has not done anything wrong. It would be, I mean, in the scenario that you, I mean, so I don't know why you would want to impose a penalty on an individual Australian who all they have done is to use their democratic right to participate in the democratic process. 
What you're suggesting is that if the party subsequent to the donation being made does not um, manage that uh, you know, donation in a way that is consistent with our federal uh, and state legislation, what would happen then? Well, if they don't observe the strict separation, then the penalty imposed on that party uh, is uh, that they would lose the benefit of strict separation and they would become subject to uh, state laws, including in the Queensland context, the prohibitions, uh, relevant prohibitions that apply in Queensland. So you can't really blame an individual donor for uh, you know, any alleged or possible mishandling by a political party. I will no further um, speakers. I move that the amendments be agreed to. Those who agree say aye. All those against, clear it carried. It is order. It is being 12.45. I will report progress and we will now move to Senator's statements. Senator McGrath, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We know the year has been filled with challenges that has affected all Australians in so many ways. This virus has disrupted so many parts of our lives in ways that seemed unimaginable just months ago. Sadly, the nature, the very nature of this virus means that it has hit certain people, certain industries and certain businesses harder than others. And one of the hardest hit is also one of the biggest employers in my home state, and that is tourism and hospitality. While travelling around Queensland, I've seen incredible resilience of many small and medium businesses to pivot around coronavirus, to adopt COVID-safe practices to sustain their businesses and to keep their employees on the books, largely in many instances with the support of JobKeeper. And as we turn our mind towards how best to support this sector, we need to consider every measure we can to ensure we aren't providing a handbrake on this critical sector as we rebuild our economy. This rebuild should include consideration of duplicated regulation and impacts of taxes such as the fringe benefits tax. So we must do everything we can to encourage and incentivise Australian businesses to support each other. The Australian Hotels Association and Tourism Accommodation Australia have proposed that the fringe benefits tax on entertainment expenses, for example meals, beverages, accommodation, for all businesses and employees should be sus suspended for the next three years. This initiative would benefit businesses and employees, tradies, builders, hairdressers, for example, to allow an employer to shout their, their, their staff, their, their team members a meal, a few drinks, maybe a weekend away for the, the employee of the month. So I strongly support the FBT being suspended on entertainment expenses for the coming three years. This is about jobs and stopping more businesses going to the wall. This initiative will encourage businesses to reward their staff in the hospitality, hospitality accommodation and tourism sector, which it needs at most. At the same time, they would be supporting retention of over one million jobs. This would be a win for employers and employees alike, at relatively little cost to the government. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, apparently I am a noob, and this is a, a gamer term for a newbie when it comes to video games. And while I might be a noob, I know that Australia, the Australian games industry has proven remarkably resilient through the coronavirus pandemic. The Interactive Games and Entertainment Association found that 44 per cent of game developers reported either stable or increased sales revenue, with 84 per cent saying they were not planning on making any reductions in staff in the immediate future. During the pandemic, many Australians have turned to the games sector as a source of entertainment or mental stimulation. There was a seemingly global shortage of Nintendo switches and electronic shops around Australia were being swamped with, with shoppers. This shows the level of resilience within our video games industry and the potential for Australia to harness this to increase our export revenue. Based in my home state of Queensland are the creators of Fruit Ninja, Half Brick Studios, whose app has received more than one billion downloads a great example of Australian and Queensland innovation. There are also a number of Australian sporting game developers, such as Big Ant Studios, the creators of high-quality titles such as Don Bradman Cricket and Rugby League, Rugby League Live, and True Blue Entertainment, who publish many Australian football video games. 
These games expand on Australia's sporting culture and encourage young people to stay engaged with their favourite sporting codes when they can't play on the field. And while I might be a bit of a noob when it comes to video games, there are a number of policy levers we can utilise to support our games industry more than we currently do. Something Australia should do, and I strongly support, is to introduce a 30 per cent tax offset for video games, to grow a new information-based export industry, attract millions in foreign investment and create thousands of jobs. In many other countries, there are tax incentives for game development. These exist in Canada, where there is a 35 to 40 per cent offset, Singapore, where there is a 40 per cent offset, France, where it's 30 per cent, and the UK, where it's 20 per cent. Australia already has tax offsets for the film, TV, post-production, digital and visual effects sectors, but lacks this same support for domestic game development. Without stronger incentives to invest, our games industry risks getting owned by other countries. Madam Acting Deputy President, shamefully and wickedly we're told there will be in Queensland a hard border closure no matter what. We've seen multiple sad and horrible and cruel stories of families who are struggling to get exemptions to access medical care. No compassion, no common sense from the state government in Queensland. Yet late last night we saw 400 people fly in from Melbourne ahead of an announcement that the AFL Grand Final will be held in Brisbane this year. An announcement I support. But parents who have been begging this state government to allow them to see their own children who have been in boarding schools are now watching the red carpet being rolled out for Eddie Maguire and his friends in the AFL. Media reports suggest these AFL bigwigs and officials won't be staying in government-mandated hotels. They'll be quarantined in an industry hub on the Gold Coast. But if you've had brain surgery and you return to Queensland, that state Labor government makes you stay in a hotel, gives you some Panadol, says you'll be fine. But oh no, if you know someone in George Street You'll be fine. You don't have to stay in, in, a, in a hotel. So surely, if the Queensland state government can work with the AFL to fly CEOs and football personalities from Melbourne for a media announcement, they can work with the families whose children are effectively locked away in boarding schools. Yeah. Yeah. If they can provide exemptions for people who construct boxing rings for Jeff Horn. They can reach out to the Isolated Children's Parents Association and come up with a plan to deal with the children who are locked away in boarding schools. If they can provide medical exemptions for TV celebrities to quarantine in Gold Coast mansions, surely they can provide exemptions for people who have suffered, who have gone through brain surgery. Surely they can provide exemptions for mums who need to go to, to, to maternity hospitals, but oh no, not this state Labor government. Surely they can engage with these boarding schools in the same way to find a solution to this mess that doesn't leave parents separated from their own children or students forced into isolation. Premier Palaszczuk, I, I join with the Isolated Children's Parents Association to, to beg you to show some compassion to these children, to their parents, and give us some consistency, some certainty and some compassion, but most importantly, some common sense when it comes to exemptions for your so-called hard border. Thank you, Senator. We will now go remotely to Senator Brown. Sorry, we can't hear you, Senator Brown. Now? We can hear you now, yes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, I make my first remote virtual contribution to the parliament. In doing so, I'm pleased to speak in support of a strong, robust and vital component of our resources industry in Tasmania, our forestry industry. In particular, I would like to express Labor's ongoing support of the Tasmanian native timber industry. 
an industry which is able to operate within a sustainable and environmentally responsible framework that allows it to coexist with other key industries, such as tourism, contribute to bushfire hazard reduction and firefighting, and form a key part of a comprehensive network of forest estates and reserves that manage and protect key cultural and environmental heritage. Madam Acting Deputy President, the context of my contribution today should be considered against the backdrop of a crash in the broader jobs market and the absolute need for government to focus on creating jobs as its number one priority. I am particularly concerned that in the face of a national collapse in the jobs market, we may see that regional areas are overlooked and forgotten when it comes to developing policies to create new jobs. Sadly, it has been the case with this government that our regions are often forgotten. But our regions are so vital for, for the overall success of our nation. They provide our energy, minerals, food and fibre, and many of the best tourism experiences to be found anywhere in the world. There is much regions across Tasmania have to offer and much that can be done to support good, secure jobs in these regions. Jobs that provide a lively, uh, livelihood for workers and families that they can rely on. Now more than ever, we must remain focused on the need to support existing jobs while also creating new jobs in multiple industries to ensure that the first recession in this nation has experienced in 30 years is as short as possible. Unfortunately, the government has been slow to react to this need and appears far too willing to withdraw support too early and not willing enough to make the timely investments necessary to grow our way out of this recession. Indeed, the government expects 400,000 Australians to lose their jobs between now and Christmas. Yet many months into this pandemic, we are still yet to see any substantive plan to create new jobs. What we need from the government is a plan, a jobs plan. What regional Tasmania needs from the government is a plan to support and grow industries that can supply jobs in regional areas and across key supply chains. The forestry industry can deliver on both of these fronts, whilst also con contributing significantly to a rebound in sustainable, environmentally friendly domestic manufacturing. The forestry industry already makes a significant contribution to Tasmania. It supplies over 3,000 direct jobs in primary and secondary processing and more than 2,500 indirect jobs generated as a result of demand from the forestry industry. These jobs are spread right throughout every corner of the state and in particular throughout our regions. In 2018-19, Tasmanian forests produced more than 1.5 million tonnes of wood Madam Acting Deputy President, at this time when so many jobs have been lost, the last thing we need to be doing is attacking or tearing down our reliable and sustainable industries like the Tasmanian native and plantation forest industries. So it is disappointing that the Bob Brown Foundation has chosen this time to attack the industry through litigation by challenging the validity of the Tasmanian Regional Forest Agreement. The Bob Brown Foundation's action is designed to shut down this important industry which provides an income and livelihood for many thousands of Tasmanians while sustainably providing quality and essential product to the world. Tasmanians, particularly regional Tasmanians, are fed up with these sorts of actions. They don't want this industry shut down. They want us all to work together to grow our forest industry alongside other key industries like agriculture, energy, tourism and hospitality. The workers and families who rely on this industry are tired of these never-ending attacks from an increasingly extreme green movement that is out of touch with the aspirations of most Tasmanians. It is out of touch with the reality of the situation when it comes to conservation in Tasmania. Modern Tasmania's record of conserving areas of natu natural significance is amongst the best in the world. More than half of Tasmania's land mass is protected, the majority managed by the Parks and Wildlife Service. Nearly half of Tasmania's land mass is forested, 3.35 million hectares. 
These forests are conserved, managed and harvested under a system that includes a comprehensive, adequate and representative reserve system. Substantially managed forests outside reserves and the maintenance of a permanent native forest estate. Our forestry industry operates within this robust regulatory framework to strike the right balance between the environmental, economic and social objectives. The Federal Labor Party is prepared to work collaboratively to ensure that the AFA, AFA framework is not undermined by, by the Bob Brown Foundation's latest attack on Tasmania's timber industry. It is an industry Tasmanians should be proud of. Indeed, the vast majority are. From Scottsdale to Geeston, Smithton to Triavanna, New Norfolk to Mowbray, truck drivers to harvesting contractors, small timber mills and specialty timber product producers, to large-scale paper and veneer mills, even the housing industry and our ports. Forestry in Tasmania underpins many towns, regions, families, workers and businesses. Labor is a strong supporter of regional forest agreements. We want to see this framework remain in place so that it can continue to deliver on outcomes across a range of key indicators, including important conservation outcomes. We recognise the critical, critical role this has to play in sustainable future for global manufacturing and construction. It is important Australia plays an active role as a world leader in this field, promoting the sustainable management, harvesting and growth of both our native and plantation forestry industries and promoting the role of wood in manufacturing and construction through investment in research and development and industry partnership. Australia's native forest industry is already amongst the most sustainable in the world. The tree, the, sorry, the industry uses the equivalent of just six trees out of every 10,000 annual. Ultimately, every tree is replaced as harvested areas are regrown and regenerated. Madam Acting Deputy President, Labor took a strong suite of policies to the last election aimed at strengthening and growing our forest industry, creating new jobs and expanding markets. Indeed, our policies at the last election were well received by industry, particularly our commitment at the election to remove the government's water rules so that more trees could be planted, grown and sustain sustainably harvested. Removal of the water rule would represent a win for jobs, industry, sustainable markets, the environment and greenhouse gas abatement. In this way, we demonstrated a real practical commitment to grow our plantation estate by more than one billion trees, a key goal of the industry. However, this sensible evidence-based election policy was at the time met with fierce opposition from the Agriculture Minister, David Littlecrow. He went so far as to declare that removing the water rule would be reckless. Now we know that in recent months the government has been forced to backpedal on its hardline position against, grow, uh, against growing our plantation estate, dangling out the possibility that the, the water rule would be removed for certain areas. But the amount, announcement really amounts more to spin over substance. It requires the agricultural minister to specify and write which reasons, regions would be excluded from the water rule. It is not a national approach and it will not provide the clear policy mechanism needed to grow our plantation estate. The government is long on retreat in its support for the forestry industry, but unfortunately, as with so many things so often, when it comes to delivery, they are left wanting. For example, the promised Forestry Pacific concessional loans announced during the 2019 election still don't exist. They're always there for the photo op, but never there for the follow up. I implore the government to do all it can to not only provide support for the industry, um, rhetoric support for the industry, but to follow through with a policy package aimed squarely at securing its future and creating new jobs, particularly in our region. Labor is committed to listening to our regions and indeed regional policy and in particular regional jobs will be a key focus for Labor up to the next election. These jobs will come in many areas, including aged care, health, tourism, mining, transport, agriculture, aquaculture and renewable energy. But for Tasmania's region, at least, sustainable native forestry as well as growing plantation estates will always be a key source of income. Tasmania's region can rely, rely on Labor to support Tasmanian Regional Forest Agreement and commit to growing Senator, the industry so that it can Senator, continue to create new jobs has and support expired. many families for generations of Thank you, Senator. We will now go remotely to Senator Rice. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I want to start today by talking about a particular concern in the Senate Select Committee on the Administration of Sports Grants, a sports rorts inquiry. It's bad enough that the Liberal and the National parties rorted hundreds of millions of dollars in grants, but it gets worse. We are seeing an increasingly concerning pattern where the Coalition is desperately trying to cover up their rort by hiding the evidence as much as they can. There is a long list of documents that the Morrison government has refused to provide to the inquiry. They redacted key emails that we've requested between officers that were involved in the rorts. They've refused to release the letter that Minister Mackenzie sent to the Prime Minister on the 10th of April 2019, seeking his approval on round three of the program. We haven't seen the advice of requested from the Solicitor General by the Attorney General in relation to the Minister for Sports authority to direct the Australian Sports Commission. And the Minister for Sport has also refused to provide the legal advice that Sport Australia sought about its powers under the Act. And of course, we still haven't seen a copy of the Gaitchen's report that Prime Minister Morrison and his government had tried to use repeatedly to argue that the program wasn't brought. But more concerning still is that we heard evidence recently that the Minister's office is forcing Sports Australia to clear their answers to our inquiry through his office. I mean, we've heard many criticisms in recent days of how the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians and the Minister for Youth and Sport has handled the COVID crisis. I am terrified at the thought that his office might have been more focused on the COVID crisis if they weren't busy covering up for their rorts by micromanaging the input of public servants to our sports inquiry. And additionally, I am concerned that it's the minister approving these questions and withholding crucial evidence when Sports Australia is an independent statutory authority. This is very concerning to us and it's something that we're going to be examining further. So there's a continuing pattern here, Acting Deputy President. They rorted the program and now they are trying to cover it up by withholding documents. But stand, sadly, the rorts don't stop there. Just within sports funding, there are three rorts that we're aware of. There was the original Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program. That was $100 million. Then there's the Female Facilities and Water Safety Stream. That was $150 million. And most recently, we've uncovered the Community Development Grant Sport Stream, $45 million. I mean, totaled together, it comes to a staggeringly high, almost $300 million in sports rorts. And that's before you talk about rorts in other portfolios, like the Collinsville Coal Fire Power Station Grant. Talk about a rort stacked with Liberal and National old mates with no experience for a project that's already dead in the water. The truth is, it's not just sports rorts. The whole Morrison government is a rort. Their marketing is flashy, but behind the scenes, it's a rort. It's been a rort since Tony Abbott first lied about cuts in the 2013 election, and it hasn't stopped. The coalition should come clean, and if they won't, it's up to us to stop them. Madam Acting Deputy President, I now want to move on to something much more uplifting celebrating the amazing trans and gender diverse people in our communities. I want to speak about these powerful and inspirational people because they've been under attack again in recent times. We've seen some pretty nasty rhetoric about transgender and gender diverse people continuing to be spouted by certain media outlets. who seem more invested in stirring up moral panic to sell papers or get clicks than they are in actually reporting any real news. I'm also aware of a pretty disgusting and insulting poll conducted in the ACT by a conservative lobby group in response to the recent bill to prevent gender and sexuality conversion practices. And just this week, we had a very thinly veiled dose of trans and queer phobia served to the Senate in the form of a bill from a certain red-haired crossbencher who shall not be named. And if you don't know the bill that I'm talking about, don't worry, it didn't go anywhere and it isn't even worth the few minutes it would take to do that. Now, look, I could speak for hours about the unbiased claims and the untruths that highlight the harm and the ignorance of these journalists, lobby groups and politicians. 
But you know what they say, don't feed the trolls. Instead, I'd like to spend the rest of my time I have to address the Senate to today attempting to balance things out. So for the rest of my speech, I will highlight the strength, the diversity and the sheer excellence of the trans and gender diverse people and communities in Australia. Trans and gender diverse people have a long and rich history of peer support and mutual aid. In my home state, Seahorse Victoria was founded in 1975 as, as a support and social group for the transgender community. It's the longest running organisation of its type in Australia. Seahorse was a great support for my late wife, Penny Wetton, helping her through her journey of embracing and affirming her gender identity. And I recently spoke at an online Seahorse meeting on Penny's and my journeys, and I was really moved to see that 20 years on from when Penny was an active member, that they are continuing their critical support for transgender Australians. And then there are newer organisations like Y Gender who are creating spaces for community and support for new generations of trans and gender diverse people. Y Gender is run by trans and gender diverse people for trans young people. They run regular social events and discussion groups um, for young, trans and gender diverse young people to talk to each other, feel more connected with their communities and hang out in safe and inclusive spaces. They also create incredible resources for trans young people who want to know more about their rights and for allies to better understand gender diversity. And there are many and varied arts projects that are creating visibility and celebrating trans identity. One example is Campfire Stories, which is a live streamed monthly open mic for queer and trans people to explore and to express themselves. And Campfire Stories is curated by an all trans team that aims to build kinship and collective resilience through self-expression and accessible community entertainment. And the positive impact of initiatives like this cannot be under overstated, and nor can the positive inclusion of trans people in mainstream entertainment. When Georgie Stone pitched her role for the producers of Neighbours, she knew how much it would mean to young people like her if they could see themselves reflected in a trans character on screen. Now Georgie's a regular on the Australian TV soap, not only playing the role of Mackenzie, but also ensuring that the character development stays true to the transgender experience. And then when it comes to a joyful, diverse celebration of gender identities, you really can't go past the stage show Gender Euphoria, which made waves at the Midsummer Festival last year. I attended it with a dear old friend and we were both so moved. In fact, I was in tears for much of the show. It was only a few months after Penny had passed away and to see trans and gender diverse stories being told so powerfully on stage was almost overwhelming and it made me realise just how much I wanted to stay connected to and keep advocating for these powerful, feisty people and communities. And the review written by Andy Connor for The Guardian summarised it so beautifully. As the chorus of voices lifted in the final kaleidoscopic song of gender euphoria, the first main stage all transgender show in Australian history, something rare and vital was communicated. So many trans stories are tragedies, it's easy to miss the triumphs. So much of the world is still so stigmatising and cruel to trans people that it's easy to overlook the joy. More than just relief at having escaped something, the show tells us being trans is also about having found something. Goodbye, gender dysphoria, proclaimed cabaret star Mama Alto. Hello, gender euphoria. And so this is the note that I want to end on. These are the stories I want the Senate to hear today. The stories of triumph, of strength, of joy, of community. So to any trans and gender diverse people listening to this, I want you to know that you are loved. You are seen. I know I can't take away the hurt caused by the words of others, but I can assure you that you'll have a friend and an ally in this parliament for as long as I am here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. The two biggest tax rorts in this country are thanks to none other than Paul Keating, whose reckless neoliberal policies have destroyed Australia's economic sovereignty. 
Now, I could talk all day about just how bad Paul Keating was, first as Treasurer and then as Prime Minister. Who, who could forget the 20 per cent interest rates? Senator Rennick, could I ask uh, you to refer to Mr Keating with his title as former Prime Minister? Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Can I say former Prime Minister Paul Keating? Or just former Prime Minister? Because there's lots of former Prime Ministers. Well, former Prime Minister. Okay. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Who could forget the 20 per cent interest rates or the 11 per cent unemployment? I'd love to discuss with the man himself, but he's been too gutless to reply to my request that we debate his destructive policies. But if we look at Table 1 on the budget papers of the two biggest tax concessions, they are capital gains tax on housing and the concessional taxation of superannuation. Now, who benefits the most from these concessions? I'll tell you who. The wealthy. Now, if you were going to design a tax policy, wouldn't you want to give concessions to low-income tax earners rather than giving tax concessions to the wealthy? You would think you would give it to the low-income tax earners so they would be able to keep working and keep the bread on the table. But for some reason, the Labor Party has seemed to walk away from its base, the working class, as it had, and has instead, for the last 35 years, been more interested in giving tax concessions to the champagne socialists in the inner city cities. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm all for creating wealth. But it needs to be taxed evenly at the margin to create wealth rather, to, that, rather than to accumulate wealth. And by that, I mean every dollar should be taxed at around the same rate, with an exception for low income tax earners who should get a tax free threshold for the cost of living. And at the other end of the scale, for those PAYG earners, you know, the guys who get paid millions to run companies, and by that state, by the state, by the time companies are uh, usually paying their executive millions of dollars, they're usually running the executives are usually running them into the ground rather than growing them. I fail to see why someone can make millions of dollars in capital gains from housing, which is often the case in the wealthiest suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, and pay no tax, while hard working Australians pay twenty cents on their hard earned income above eighteen thousand two hundred. When Keating exempted housing from G, uh, capital gains tax, he gave a tax break to wealthy Australians, an incentive to pump way too much money into housing at the expense of manufacturing. As a result, today, house prices are out of reach for younger Australians and a burden for working Australians whose mortgage repayments are a lead weight in the saddlebag of their weekly income. Not to mention manufacturing, which was gutted under Keating's reckless neoliberal policies. But let's look at the other rort in the news this week, superannuation, because we've got the Labor Party, in particular former Prime Ministers Keating and Rudd, telling us that superannuation is going to provide a decent retirement. Well, I can tell you that's nothing, there's nothing further from the truth, because if you go in and you look at the ASFA superannuation statistics, the median balance for women age 55 to 64 is $118,000. The median balance for men is $183,000. Now, there is no way that you can live for the next 20 years in retirement on that type of balance in your superannuation. You are never going to reduce the reliance on the pension with balances like that. Furthermore, the irony of all this is that former Prime Minister Paul Keating also gave independence to the RBA because he thought that would make a better, uh, there'd be a better process, a bit better decision-making process, that the RBA could somehow manage monetary policy better than politicians. Well, guess what? We've now got interest rates at zero. We've now got interest rates running at zero, record foreign debt and record house prices. So how is it when someone goes to retire with you know, $118,000 uh, in your super, uh, if you're a woman, and $180,000 uh, if you're a man, how are you going to live on 1 or 2 per cent interest on that type of uh, balance? That works out at about $1 or $2,000 a year. You'd be lucky to live for a week with that, let alone an entire year. So this whole concept that superannuation is going to provide a better retirement is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. To have a decent nest egg, you'd actually have to put for low income earners would have to actually put about 50 or 60 per cent of your income into superannuation. 
Now, low-income earners can't afford to put in 9.5 per cent. They need every cent they make today. They need every cent they make today. And even the Henry Tax Review explicitly recommended against lifting the superannuation guarantee because of its punitive impact on lower-income earners, in that wages are foregone when superannuation levy is lifted. And it's not just uh, my opinion that says that. The, the uh, former opposition leader, uh, the Mary for Mary uh, Bong, uh, Bill Shorten, uh, when he was asked, he said it's because it's wages, not profits, that will fund super, super increases in the next few years. Wages are the seedbed of the whole operation. An increase in super is not absolutely not a tax on business. And he further goes on to say in another interview with Neil Mitchell, is that superannuation will be absorbed as a part of people's pay rises. So the hard-working people of Australia don't get to see their income. It just goes straight off to the mates, Labor's mates in the unions so they can clip $40 billion a year in fees on top of the $40 billion in tax concessions, $40 billion a year in fees ripped out of hard-working Australians' pockets. Now, the tragedy in all of this is, despite the fact that we've hardly had a reduction in the number of people on the pension, it's reduced from about 74 per cent to about 70 per cent, pension or part pension. And let's not forget with those numbers that in, in the meantime, like since uh, superannuation was increased, the pension age has been increased from 65 to 67. And who did that? Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. So if you take out, you put those people who should have gone on to the pension at 65 back into those numbers, the number of people on a pension is probably still about 74 per cent. So we're giving $40 billion in tax concessions, $40 billion in fees for nothing. We've still got the same number of people on the pension, except, wait for it, the number of people who now retire with a mortgage has increased from 40 per cent to 70 per cent. So we've got more working Australians on the, on the uh, hock to the banks for interest throughout their entire working life. And they can't even retire with the security of knowing they own their own house. Now, this party was founded by a guy named Robert Menzies, and in his Forgotten People speech, he mentioned the word home no fewer than 23 times. And there is no better form of retirement than your home. And there is no better standard of living than to own your own home, so that you've got the security and peace of mind that every night you can go home to your house, you can go home knowing your children have a bed uh, to sleep in, a roof over their heads and a happy home environment to give them the self-belief, to give them the self-belief that, that they need to be successful in life. Now, What's interesting about this as well is that, you know, touching on the whole Keating legacy, is when he gave independence uh, to the RBA, you know, they've let the foreign banks in. We've now inflated house prices, and now we've got to the point now we've got, you know, very high uh, house prices compared to average incomes. And so, of course, the RBA has come out yesterday, and it was snuck through in the minutes, which no one can read because it's, you know, like watching paint dry. But for those of us who worked in capital markets, we know what to look for. And of course, the RBA has increased the funding facility to private banks for $200 billion. So instead of actually going out there and funding infrastructure, the building of infrastructure that will give Australians jobs, they're continuing to still reward the ADIs, what they call ADIs, Australian Deposit Institutions. Now, that can be any bank that uh, takes deposits here in Australia. So it can be domestic banks or foreign banks. And remember, that the former Prime Minister Paul Keating let in those foreign banks, which just inflated house prices. And I think that's a real shame because right now we need development in infrastructure. We need dams, we need, but we don't necessarily need more power generation. We certainly need more power transmission uh, and lots of transport corridors. And that is a great way to grow uh, the economy and drag us out of the recession. But in concluding, I'd, like to, I'd just like to remind the people that we are supposed to be living in a liberal democracy. Superannuation, there was never a, a pledge by any politician that said we were going to raise superannuation to 12 per cent by 2025. 
Order. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to speak about the importance of investing in our manufacturing industry as we emerge a post-COVID-19 world, and government policy needs to adapt if we're going to take advantage of opportunities presented to us. For the first time in 29 years, Australia is in a recession. This is not a landmark to take lightly. The health, social and economic circumstances of this pandemic will be felt for years to come in my home state already experiencing economic effects of the downturn. Our industries have been devastated by the effects of social isolation and, in particular, retail, restaurants, cafes, pubs and clubs and small businesses across many industries, and they're still hurting. Some organisations and businesses will not survive, and nearly 30,000 Tasmanians are unemployed or underemployed. These figures are devastating to the individuals and their families. There's some 34,392 people on job, job seeker in my home state. Unemployment hasn't reached this level in Tasmania since the 1970s. And then there is the youth unemployment figures of above 15 per cent, expected to go above 20 per cent by Christmas. Tasmanians' overall youth unemployment rate is 15.1 per cent. This figure is distressing to many young Tasmanians concerned they may not be able to get employment in our state now or into the future. Our slogan during the pandemic and post this pandemic should be, and I let us leave no Australian worker behind. No Australian should be forgotten or neglected. While the questions of how did we get here are relatively straightforward, COVID-19 and the lack of this Liberal government's planning for the future is leaving Australians wanting. The solution of how we get out of this economic mess are harder to produce. However, there is at least one solution that is tried, true and perf perfectly rational, revive Australians manufacturing now. Australian manufacturing contribution to national GDP has slumped from 30 per cent in the 1960s to a mere 5.7 per cent in 2018, and we have the lowest level of manufacturing self-sufficiency compared to other developed nations, a statistic no government of any persuasion should be proud of. To add insult to injury, Australian Industry Group's latest performance of manufacturing index indicates that manufacturing has deteriorated to its worst level since the GFC. Sales, production and employment have recorded record month declines in the index's 28-year history, indicating an industry in need of resuscitation. Ironically, COVID-19, for the tragedy it is, could potentially lead Australian manufacturing renaissance. There are a few reasons why COVID-19 19 may lead to this. Firstly, as almost all Australian supply chains depend on imports, this pandemic serves as a fantastic learning opportunity to expose the dangers of over-reliance on global supply chains. It is without a doubt that Australian-made goods are just as good as any import supplies or even better. The main reason for our supply chain outsourcing has been primarily the lower cost. However, running an economy in the eye of a pandemic storm has shown that the guarantee of undisturbed supply from Australian suppliers is increasingly persuasive within the industry groups. If Australia is to cut off from the rest of the world partially or absolutely, can we still rely on our pre-COVID supply chain to the same degree? I say we can't. Secondly, it can create jobs to address Australia's staggering unemployment rate. Under the Liberals' watch, the Australian unemployment rate has skyrocketed to 7.5 per cent, the highest level seen in 22 years. This is also not taking into account that so many Australians and Tasmanians are reliant on the JobKeeper payment. To get Australians back into jobs, these jobs need to be created from somewhere. We need a jobs plan. 
The federal government, state governments and businesses should all collectively be seeking to reset supply chains to source from local manufacturers in a partial extent, if not completely. If this concerted effort was put into this policy, there would be a tremendous opportunity to create jobs, very well-paying jobs, that will see more Australians back in work. Already, the COVID-19 task force has earmarked that approximately 500,000 new jobs can be created in advanced manufacturing if the right policy settings are applied. And thirdly, having a supply chain reset to prioritise Australia will result in greater economic and political sovereignty. China is Australia's largest trade partner. Although international trade often offers more benefits and drawbacks, Australia needs to get the balance right. In May, the Chinese government raised new trade barriers against Australia. They have done this again to a third Australian e export, and they are also signalling that Beijing may be looking to diversify its import of iron ore. This is a result of diplomatic rift, stemming from the Australian government's call for an independent inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. With the Chinese government increasingly willing to flex its economic muscles against Australia, who can't fall in line, Australia needs to achieve greater independence and flexibility on the global stage. Now, fourthly, a revived manufacturing sector can and will drive our economic transformation post-COVID-19. With the Australian dollar weak, there is a real window of opportunity to seize advantage of that to foray into the advanced manufacturing exports. Developed countries like Germany, Japan and South Korea all have world-leading advanced manufacturing export industries, accounting for $740 billion and $417 billion in total output in 2019, respectively. In comparison, Australia's total manufacturing output in 2019 is only $79 billion. We need to rebalance that. With borders remaining shut for the foreseeable future, Australia's reliance on tourism and international education will not be sufficient to buttress for the economy. We need to revive manufacturing as a matter of necessity. My home state of Tasmania can lead this charge. Economist Sol Eslak has earmarked the potential for northern Tasmania through advanced manufacturing and renewable energy, the opportunity to expand manufacturing products interstate and internationally will allow Tasmania to diversify its economic pot, leading to greater resilience and prosperity for all Tasmanians. Projects such as the renewable hydrogen production facility proposed for Bell Bay could become an internationally competitive hydrogen exporting hub. This project would be a major employer and flow on effects to other service providers would be fantastic for our economy. We have already displayed the resilience of our manufacturing sector during this extraordinary crisis. Tasmanian companies like INCAT and Definium Technologies have displayed that they are up to the challenge, adapting to the COVID challenges. They have illustrated ingenuity and capacity to innovate. Hobart-based INCAT has a global reputation and track record of building fast, industry-leading and advanced technology notable ships. Tesla has linked with INCAT with their technological prowess to potentially being sought to build rocket launching pads for American companies. INCAT has also been tipped to play a role in building the new spirit of Tasmania ships. Definium was recently engaged by Victorian company Gigo to manufacture ventilator control systems. These Tasmanian businesses illustrate the capacity of homegrown companies to innovate and exploit opportunities interstate and internationally. We should be so proud because it was with this demonstration of these particular companies that we can lead Australia and we can explore new opportunities both nationally and internationally. We have to do this together. And the message is that we cannot leave anyone 
behind. We have to ensure that there's opportunities in our home state of Tasmania for our young people. We do not want to see when the borders reopen a brain drain from our state. That's the last thing that we need. Manufacturing is an essential part of every country's economy. We have to invest, we have to innovate, and the federal government should be doing whatever they can to support this new development in manufacturing Senator in Polly, this country. Senator your time has expired. Senator Griff. Well, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 2020 has been a devastating year for Australia. Between the bushfires and the pandemic, we have very much been tried and tested. We have had to rise to challenges that we've never had before. For the most part, we have done so successfully. But there have been many mistakes along the way. Mistakes that we need to acknowledge and mistakes that we need to learn from. One such mistake is the importance of preparedness. Arguably, the current lockdown in Victoria could have been avoided if that state had employed more contact tracers before the crisis, or it had scaled up their contact tracing teams faster. The Victorian government could argue that they, um, that they weren't needed before COVID, which is quite a reasonable point. But it also shows the value of preparedness was underrated before the pandemic and that we need to adapt our thinking to be ready for the next crisis, because there will be another crisis. Another example comes from the bushfires that swept the country before the pandemic struck. At the end of last year, and again at the start of this year, I asked ministers in this chamber if we had adequate firefighting aircraft. Both times, both times, I was assured that we did. Well, the immense scope of the bushfires showed that that claim was false. And this too has been borne out by two very recent reports, in fact in the last two weeks. The Royal Commission into Natural Disasters reported that the Commonwealth's approach to procuring firefighting aircraft was very much inadequate and it needs to be reassessed. Similarly, the New South Wales bushfire inquiry found a lack of aircraft hampered firefighting. A lack of aircraft. Including the essential task of extinguishing new fires before they grew and before they spread out of control. As with the Victorian case, I don't necessarily blame the government for this. I don't believe anyone anticipated the scale of the bushfires which confronted us last summer. But we must acknowledge that we had insufficient firefighting assets. And we need to incorporate this lesson into our preparedness for future bushfire seasons. There are signs that the coming summer will not be as bad as last year, which is good news. Much of the fuel that has been building up over the last few years has fortunately now been consumed. Rainfall throughout the winter has reduced what fuel remains on the ground. And there are signs, at least at this point, that a La Nina event may mean a wetter summer, way wetter than we experienced last year. So we may be spared another bushfire crisis, but just may. But I do worry that this will make us complacent. I worry it will provide an excuse for investments in preparedness to be deferred. Both the Royal Commission and the New South Wales Inquiry made the point that fire seasons around the world are growing longer and are far more intense. Northern and southern seasons are converging and they will soon overlap. The current business model for firefighting aircraft involves them being used in places like Canada, Greece and the United States during the northern summer, particularly July and August. Then of course they are transported to the southern countries like Australia during the northern summer. But recently we've seen Californian wildfires persist later into the year. 
and we've seen Australian bushfires start much earlier in the year. This means that firefighting aircraft are increasingly needed in two distant places at exactly the same time. As these aircrafts are typically owned by private entities, they are leased out on contracts. When countries invest more money in preparedness, they will be able to contract for more aircraft and will all be better protected when fires break out. We very much need to think seriously about a strategy for ensuring access to firefighting aircraft in a world where they are increasingly sought after. There are several options available to the government. The first option is to continue with the current model. This model has state agencies contracting their own aircraft and the Commonwealth funding additional shared aircraft through the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. This is the approach that the Royal Commission found to be inadequate. They found it to be inadequate. I share that view. It is clearly not working. The government has committed more money to the NAFC and indexed the funding to provide them with some certainty. That is a good thing. But it's not enough. We need to very seriously consider the alternatives that are available. The second option is the government procure its own aerial firefighting fleet. Now, this would not be a fleet that has flown into Australia when the contract begins, regardless of when we actually need the aircraft. Indeed, it would be a fleet that is owned and based in Australia. A fleet that provides Australians with an assurance that the government actually has the resources it needs to protect Australians in times of need. Obviously, this is an option that I support. I do understand that the capital costs of a firefighting fleet will be substantial, but the costs of the current approach are way more substantial. Those costs are not just borne by the federal budget, but by every individual Australian whose homes and businesses have been lost, sometimes unnecessarily, to bushfires. The third option is one recommended by the New South Wales Inquiry. Now, it suggested the Commonwealth try the, trial the feasibility of retrofitting RAAF C-130 aircraft with modular airborne firefighting systems. Now, this would mean that our existing C-130 aircraft could be converted to firefighting aircraft at relatively short notice. It would provide us with what is called aviation surge capacity, something that was lacking at the last bush bushfire season. Now, when I raised this question yesterday in question time, the minister re responded by saying the RAAF pilots were not qualified or certified to fight bushfires. Now, I don't doubt about uh, doubt the truth of what she says. But so what? Senator Reynolds has spoken highly about the skill and professionalism of RAAF pilots. I am certain that they have the skills and the ability to be trained in piloting firefighting aircraft. And I suspect many of them would welcome the opportunity to serve their country during a time of disaster and contribute to protecting homes and livelihoods, just as they would during times of war and conflict. The challenge of preparedness is that it's hard to tell the difference between efficient expenditure and waste. Paying for insurance can feel like a waste of money until you need it. Spending money on bushfire or pandemic preparedness might have looked like a waste a year ago, but now we all wish that governments had been better prepared. The simple fact is, that we weren't as prepared for 2020 as we could have been. Being prepared wouldn't have stopped the fires. It wouldn't have prevented COVID-19 from reaching Australian shores. But it could have lessened the impact. There is no doubt about that. And we need to learn that lesson. 
And we need to remember in two, three, or maybe four years' time, when a natural disaster hasn't struck and firefighting fleet or a pandemic stockpile starts to look like a waste of money. 2020 has been a year of devastation. There will be other years of devastation. But if we learn the right lessons, the next one doesn't have to look as bad as 2020 has been. Senator Scar. Mr Deputy, Acting Deputy President, uh, before I begin uh, my rep remarks on the, the statement I wanted to cover today, I'd just like to uh, say that I really did enjoy uh, the contributions from uh, Senators Griff, Senator Polly and uh, Senator Rennick. They cover a broad spectrum, but uh, I really did enjoy the contributions uh, that each of them made. And there's one other preliminary point I just want to cover uh, before I uh, go into the substance of my statement. I was just informed that a history teacher of mine uh, from my old school, Ipswich Grammar School, has passed away, Dr John Vollop. Dr John Vollop was an outstanding history, English and German teacher. He put his heart and soul into teaching his students. In my first speech in this place, I talked about the significance and the importance of our early educators. And I think uh, Dr John Vollop's family and friends um, should reflect on that legacy as they mourn his passing. Mr Acting Deputy President, in my first speech in the Senate, I also said that the decisions we make here matter. They have a profound impact on people's lives. We must never forget it. The same applies with respect to decisions made by state governments and state parliaments. We have seen this in recent times with the impact of Queensland's border restrictions. At a press conference held on 18 August 2020, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk was asked about a woman from northern New South Wales who nearly lost her baby after being denied access to health care in Queensland. Premier Palaszczuk said, people living in New South Wales, they have New South Wales hospitals. In Queensland, we have Queensland hospitals for our people. Let me say it again, Mr Acting Deputy President. People living in New South Wales, they have New South Wales hospitals. In Queensland, we have Queensland hospitals for our people. Those comments were met with outrage and disappointment across this country, including in my home state of Queensland, and for good reason. First, they do not reflect the reality of the situation. Thousands of Queenslanders receive treatment in hospitals outside of Queensland every year. Likewise, Thousands of people from New South Wales receive treatment in Queensland hospitals. Their state of origin or place of permanent residency is irrelevant. irrelevant. All that matters is their need for help. Second, the Commonwealth provides billions, that's billions with a B, of dollars to public hospitals every year, money provided for the benefit of all Australians. But more than that, Mr President, much more than that, those words do not reflect who we are as Queenslanders. We are better than that. Those words do not reflect who we are as Queenslanders. The words came back to haunt Premier, Premier Palaszczuk following the tragic case of a lady from northern New South Wales who lost an unborn twin. A decision was made by her health providers in New South Wales that she should travel to Sydney for treatment instead of driving just a few hours to Queensland. Now, I am prepared to accept, I am prepared to accept that perhaps the Premier misspoke on 18 August 2020 when she said, people living in New South Wales, they have New South Wales hospitals. In Queensland, we have Queensland hospitals for our people. I'm prepared to accept that perhaps she misspoke. Perhaps the words did not come out properly. We all make mistakes, especially in the flow of a media interview. Moreover, 
other states are also having issues grappling with these issues. And over the last two weeks, I've heard tragic examples from colleagues in other states. But when faced with the most recent tragedy, the Premier didn't demonstrate any contrition. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk doubled down. For me, for me as a senator representing Queensland, that was truly the low point in this debate about border restrictions. There was no contrition from Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. Senator, there was no Senator, awareness. Senator Scar, could I just uh, remind you of Standing Order 193, subpara 3, about personal reflections, including on members of other parliaments. Uh, your comments have not yet breached that, but are coming close. You have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And if you could excuse my passion for this subject, but Queenslanders are truly outraged, truly outraged at the comments of our Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. There appeared to be no awareness of how cruel the original comments appeared, especially in the context of the most recent tragedy. As reported by the ABC, when reporters asked Premier Palaszczuk whether she regretted her earlier choice of words, she said this, and I'm going to give the full quotation so it cannot be alleged I've taken these words out of context. So the full quotation will be on the record of this place. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk said, no, because these are really difficult decisions and people deserve the best health care. And if they can get the health care, then that is good. If it is an emergency or if we have the expertise, of course we will do that. Now, as I said, Mr Acting Deputy President, I have provided the full context of the Premier's response. I'm not selectively quoting from Premier Palaszczuk because I want her own words to be judged in their entirety. Premier Palaszczuk's words and related commentary from the Queensland Health Minister, Dr Stephen Miles, did not reflect the reality of the situation. In the face of tragedy, when the appalling results of the Queensland Labor government's mismanagement of this issue was laid bare for all of us to see, the Queensland Labor government reverted to what it does best, blame shifting and spin. It must have been the fault of someone else. The New South Wales health authorities had got it all wrong. Of course Queensland would have helped. To that, Mr President, I have three responses. First, if emergency assistance was available in this situation, without a bureaucratic process, why was that not clearly spelled out in the Queensland Government's own health directive? And I have it here. Border Restrictions Health Directive No. 12. There is no reference to emergency health care. In fact, paragraph 35, the provisions relating to health care, all speak of the need to schedule appointments. And since the date of its publication, the Queensland Government has had to set up a new unit and a new hotline, a new hotline to deal with these issues. Second, if there was some informal understanding outside of the health directive, or it went without saying that help would be provided by Queensland, then why were the health authorities in northern New South Wales unaware of it? Surely, surely, in the height of a pandemic, this is a key piece of information. Was there no communication or did the health authorities in New South Wales simply act in accordance with what was the true situation? And third, and above all else, what message, what message did the Queensland Labor Premier think her rhetoric would convey? Words matter. Words matter. Cruel words lacking empathy matter even more. And Premier Palaszczuk's words sent a message that the people of New South Wales should seek assistance from their own hospitals. And when given the chance to demonstrate contrition, any contrition, to clarify, to soften the message, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk said no. As the Leader of the Opposition in Queensland, Ms Deb Frecklington said, this is absolutely tragic. My heart bleeds for the family and everything they have been put through. When it comes to medical emergencies and border exemptions, 
The Premier needs to be more compassionate and consistent, not have one rule for the rich and another rule for everyday Australians. And that, Mr President, reflects the views of millions of my fellow Queenslanders. That, Mr President, that statement by the Leader of the Opposition in Queensland, Ms Deb Frecklington, is a true articulation of our Queensland values. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise today to make comment on the press release that came out this morning from the Council of the Ageing. And I want to speak in some detail about what's in that release, because it should give pause to the warriors on the other side when an August institution like the Council of the Ageing, normally, normally a measured contributor, feels the need to put out a statement of the kind that came out today. Their chief executive, Ian Yates, expressed COTA's deep concern, and I'm quoting here, that the objective work of the expert retirement income review is being politicised before the public has even had a chance to look at it. And this is what Mr Yates said. He said, our retirement income system is too important to all current and future retirees for its future to become a political football. And he went on. Pretty clear message about what he thinks should happen next. He went on to say this. The government has had the report for over a month and should release it without a policy response. The Australian people deserve the chance to see, consider and discuss the review's data and findings. That's all pretty sensible, isn't it? And what could be preventing this? What could it be? that is stopping the Australian people from having a sensible debate of the kind that Mr Yates calls for. Well, he's very clear about this. He says Mr Yates has urged the federal government to haul in hyperactive backbenchers spruiking ideological agendas that are not informed by the review and has urged other political actors to stop arguing their case before they have seen the work of the most important review of the retirement income sector for a generation. It's a pretty clear message, isn't it? Because where is this review? Well, according to the minister, it's sitting on her desk, and it's sitting on Mr Frydenberg's desk, and it's sitting on Mr Sukar's desk. Why can't we see it? According to Minister Hume, because it's 600 pages long and it's taking a little while to go through it. Well, perhaps the rest of us would like the chance to go through it as well. Who could these hyperactive backbenchers be that Coder is so concerned about? Well, could it be a senator in this place? Could it be Senator Bragg? And here he is, he's on his way in. Senator Bragg, he's got a lovely book out. I do note in the media that Senator's entirely entertaining book has sold, I think, a total of 34 copies. Is that right? 34 copies. Obviously, not all of his colleagues interested in purchasing this marvellous book. Two of these copies, one assumes, are the copies in the parliamentary library. But what is Senator Bragg? Well, he's out there undermining the super system before. Perhaps he's seen the retirement income review, but there he is out there arguing to make it voluntary for low-income earners, arguing that it ought to be used to, to buy a home, spruiking, co trailing his coat about a range of reforms, a range of reforms to undermine Australia's world caste system. Mr Falinski, another backbencher out there with an, ide with an agenda that has been described by Mr Yates as an ideological agenda, out there calling for the increase to be abandoned calling for workers to go without the increase to their superannuation, calling for workers to go without the money that will deliver them a secure and comfortable retirement. Now, looking a little closer to home here in the Senate, is it any wonder that Cota despairs about the comments of Senator Rennick? It was only the other day that Senator Rennick, in what could only be described as an ideological contribution, uh, said that we invoked this statement to give me liberty or give me death. 
and invoked the revolutionary spirit in the fight against Marxism and communism. Talked about little red books, talked about conspiracies, which is not unusual for Senator Rennick, an ideological campaign being run right here in the chamber under the nose of the minister who's just walked into the chamber herself. And perhaps it is the minister that Cota is concerned about. Because the minister has the retirement incomes review. She's not willing to share it with us. But she's out there saying that she's ambivalent about a legislated review, a legislated increase to workers' retirement incomes. In the middle of the greatest recession in a century, the minister is refusing to commit to a legislated commitment that would re provide retirement security to millions of Australians' workers. And that ambivalence, that ambivalence could cost a 30-year-old nurse $121,000 by retirement. And that is how the Morrison government seeks to repay the frontline workers, the frontline workers that are working through this pandemic to save lives. This is the same minister, the same minister that bungled the early release scheme, ignoring warnings about fraud, dismissing the warnings from industry experts with knowledge of how superannuation actually works. I think people ought to listen to Cota. I think it is time to abandon the ideological campaign against super. It's time to release the retirement income review because, as Cota says, the, co the consumer organisations, the financial services sector and academic experts have put a huge amount of time and effort into contributing to the review. And they have every right to have their efforts respected by the public release of the review report in a timely fashion so that it can inform public discussion. Order. Senator Wong, questions without notice. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann, and I refer to the national accounts released today. Can the Minister confirm Australia has plunged into the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th 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 thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, today is a very hard day for Australia. And uh, you know, many, many Australians have gone through a very difficult period over the last six or seven months uh, as a result of a once-in-a-century global pandemic. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has hit economies around the world very hard. It has hit the Australian economy very hard, and it has had a devastating impact on, livelihoods of, on the livelihoods of too many, too many Australians. And I'm, I'm disappointed that the flavour of the interjections from the opposition again demonstrates the level of political sneering that, quite frankly, comple completely. I mean, the, the Labour Party again tries to suggest that there's no context to what is happening here. We, we are where we are as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic. This we have to Order die enter into the COVID-19 recession. Left. That is, that is a very Senator sad Keneally. day for Australia, but that is the reality of it. And I know that the Labor Party doesn't want to hear this. As bad as things are, as bad as things are for Australia, we went into this period in a stronger position than others. We have gone through this period in a stronger position than others. And the impact on our economy Order, uh, is, is much less severe than what it has been in other parts of the world. The United Kingdom has experienced a contraction of more than 20 per cent in one quarter. More than 20 per cent. Order, Senator Again, Ayers. it's the sort of inconvenient truth that the uh, Labour Party is not interested in. The Labour Party just wants to come into this, into this chamber, uh, pursue a biased political strategy, using, using this tragedy which is caused by an external event that is beyond our control as a way to score party political points. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be absolutely Order. ashamed of yourself. The Australian people can see what you're doing. We know why we're here. The Australian people know why we're here. And we know what Order. we need to Senator do to continue Coleman, to guide Australia the out of this has crisis. Inspired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. National accounts released today show that the economy has contracted by 7 per cent. Can the minister confirm this is the worst quarterly result since records began, plunging Australia into the first recession in three decades and ending 29 years of continuous economic growth? Senator Cormann. Uh, yes. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. With the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago and the worst quarterly contraction since records began, can the minister explain why the government has no plan for jobs and no plan for economic recovery? 
Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. That is a ridiculous proposition, and I completely Order. and utterly reject the Senator, premise of the Senators question. Senators Watt and Keneally. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question. As soon as this Order. crisis hit, as soon as this crisis hit, our government not only made decisions to protect the health of our fellow Australians, we also made decisions to support the economy, to support jobs. We have provided unprecedented, unprecedented levels of crisis level fiscal support into the economy, uh, trying, trying to uh, save as many businesses as possible, making sure that as many businesses as possible survive through this period, that as many jobs as possible are saved through this period, and indeed to ensure that as many Australians as possible remain connected to their employer. And of course we are making decisions to encourage businesses to invest in their future success uh, through our uh, tax Order. savings. And, and, Senator and indeed, Watt, uh, through, Senator our, through our skills agenda, and indeed, uh, you know, Senator, Senator Cash is, of course, a very uh, effective minister pursuing our skills and training agenda. Order. Uh, through our, through Senator our, Cormann, our time for the answer prices. has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the minister further update the Senate on the economic challenges facing Australia? as a result of the global coronavirus pandemic. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the national accounts released today uh, show what Australians already knew. Our economy has been hit hard, very hard, by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Australian economy contracted by 7 per cent in the June quarter, uh, which is uh, indeed the largest quarterly fall in real GDP on record since records were kept. This was driven by large drops in household consumption, dwelling investment and business investment. Mr. President, the largest contributors to the decline in consumption were hotels, cafes and restaurants, which were down 56.1 per cent, and transport services, which were down 85.9 per cent, a staggering 85.9 per cent. But Mr. President, the numbers today show that Australia is performing comparatively well when compared to other countries around the world facing precisely the same challenge. The IMF, uh, is, the IMF is expecting that 157 economies will contract this year with unprecedented falls in many. COVID-19 has been a wrecking ball through the global economy. The impact in the June quarter has been staggering, with GDP falling by 20.4% in the UK, 13.8% in France, 11.5% in Canada and 9.1 per cent in the United States. Mr. President, the decisions our government made prior Order. to this crisis improved our budget Order. position by more than $250 billion over the 10 years to 22-23. That put Watt. us on a better, more sustainable fiscal trajectory for the future as we went into this crisis. It has enabled us to provide Order record levels left. of crisis-level support into the economy, to business and to working families. If we had not done what we have done in our first six years in government, we would have had less fiscal capacity to respond, and our economy would have been less resilient, Order and today our economy would have been weaker. Left. It is because we repaired neighbours' mess in our first six left. years in government that Australia is in a better position today than we Order, otherwise would Senator have been. Cormann. Order on my left. Order. I will call Senator Brockman when I can hear him. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. You, Mr. President, Minister, can you inform the Senate how the government's historic level of support is helping Australians on our road to economic recovery? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for that question. Uh, Mr. President, as I've said, we came into this uh, crisis in a stronger, more resilient position as a result of the budget repair work done by our government during our first six years in government. That allowed us to commit to $314 billion worth of support for the Australian economy, nearly 16 per cent of GDP, nearly 16 per cent of GDP. According to Treasury, that support has helped save 700,000 jobs, 700,000 jobs. Watt. The unemployment rate would have been around Senator 5 per cent higher than it is today. Senator Birmingham, Senator Birmingham and Senator Watt, before I call Senator Wong, I will insist on both of you being quiet. Senator Wong, on a point of order. He did. I heard what he called him. I'd ask him to withdraw. I, I'm afraid I, I did not. There was so much. There was order, Senator Wong, please. There was complete disorder across the chamber. I was struggling to hear Senator Cormann. Um, order. I'm going to ask you, Senator McGrath, to withdraw that. 
Um, well, uh, uh, well Senator. Um, 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 I did not hear it. I can't attest to it. Um, what is conventional in these opportunities is if a senator wishes to withdraw a comment, they may, but I cannot order a withdrawal for something I did not hear. I'm going to ask Senator McGrath to withdraw the comment he made. I, I, I heard that one. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oh, no, sorry, President. Senator Birmingham is seeking Pre a call. Sorry. Uh, President, I stand by the question asking which planet Senator Watt's been on all year, but if I said that, I withdraw it. Thank you. Senator Cormann, please continue. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr. President. Yeah, I've got to say that's a very good uh, point by Senator Birmingham, that question that is just raised. Because, I mean, and, but Senator Watt is not. He's certainly not uh, Robinson Crusoe, because everyone on that uh, island that is called the Labor Party these days uh, is in complete denial of what is actually happening on planet Earth. I mean, here, here, is, here is a message from Order, planet Senator Earth. Corman, Senator Corman, time for the answer has expired. I'll call Senator Brockman when there's silence. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the minister for that answer. Minister, can you inform the Senate how the government is giving employers the flexibility they need to keep workers employed while they fight back from this economic shock? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much. And this is, of course, another important part of our plan for, uh, to protect jobs during this pandemic. Mr President, the temporary JobKeeper provisions in the Fair Work Act have provided essential flexibility that has been vital for struggling businesses to survive the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and keep their employees in jobs. It allows employers receiving the wage subsidy to make key changes to their operations. These include adjusted employee work hours, uh, altering duties or the location of work. Uh, while this support will be essential for businesses that remain eligible for JobKeeper, greater workforce, uh, workplace flexibility will also be vitally important for many businesses that no longer qualify for JobKeeper post-September. This will allow those businesses to keep as many of their employees as possible as they continue to recover from the worst of the crisis. And of course, again, the Labor Party is not interested in everything that is being done to protect jobs. They just want to pursue biased political uh, attacks uh, Order. From, from a different Senator planet. Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann, today the national accounts confirm that we're in the deepest recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago. We've recorded the worst quarterly contraction of 7 per cent since records began. Isn't this the worst time for the Prime Minister to be cutting job keeper, cutting job seeker? cutting wages and freezing the pension. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator Gallagher is uh, mixing up a whole range of different things here. Let, let me just Order. say, Senator when, it comes, when, it comes, when, it, when it comes to, when it comes to the uh, pension, the pension will continue to rise in line with inflation. In line with inflation. In line with inflation. We have, not, we have not made any decisions whatsoever. We have not made any decisions whatsoever to change the uh, indexation arrangements for the pension. And I think that that question, the way you're framing it, and the way you seek to scare vulnerable Australians, is very dishonest indeed. When it comes to job people, of course we need to tr uh, phase out of this uh, historically unprecedented transitional crisis level support arrangements. That is what none other than Mr Albanese used to say in May, June, July. I mean, he was on the record saying we've got to phase out this uh, historically unprecedented level of support. He's right, because we need, we, need to allow, we need to allow the economy to adjust so that it can get into the new normal and start growing again from the new baseline. That is what we need to do, Mr President. Quite frankly, we were hit with a crisis. We needed to pause and put in place all of the appropriate support mechanisms. But now, moving forward, we've got to allow the economy to transition out of the crisis uh, into the new normal. And for uh, those businesses which have the opportunity to be successful, viable and profitable into the future, to have the best possible opportunity to, to succeed, that is why we are pursuing, again, our pro-growth agenda, which the Australian people voted for before the last election. That is why we're providing Order tax incentives left. to business uh, to encourage them to invest more in their future success so that growing businesses will hire more Australians. That's why we're pursuing an ambitious free trade agenda, giving our exporting businesses better access to markets around the world, lower prices, lower electricity prices, better skills and training, uh, and indeed less regulation, uh, faster approvals uh, for our projects uh, so, that we, so that we can ensure we get more projects and more jobs off the ground. I mean, these are all the things that we are doing and will continue to do uh, to create more jobs Order, and better Senator opportunities. Cormann. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. 
The national accounts show that the household spending levels collapsed in the June quarter, demonstrating their lack of confidence in the economy. Why is the government reducing support to households now at a time when they clearly require it? Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much. So in one of my earlier answers, I pointed oh, out Senator that what? consumption levels had dropped, in particular in cafes, restaurants, travel. Now, a message to, from planet Earth again. You know, governments around Australia impose restrictions. Restaurants were not allowed to open. Like restaurants were not allowed to open. Cafes were not allowed to open. Planes were not allowed to fly. Like, I mean, what do you expect would happen in that context? What do you expect would happen in that Order. context? Like, I mean, Order. I mean, like, I, I honestly, I mean, on even on planet Mars, people would understand that. I think even on planet Mars, they would understand that when you have a global pandemic Senator that Watts. requires restrictions and which which uh, prohibits restaurants from opening, cafes from opening, planes to fly, well then Senator that will Gallagher. have a, an impact on the consumption in relation to those areas. I mean, of course that. I mean, that is absolutely. Order. Uh, logical. The only people that don't seem to understand the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic is the Australian Labor Party. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a order, Senator Wong. I'd like to hear Senator Gallagher. I do question. have a, a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Won't the government's decision this week to cut JobKeeper, cut JobSeeker, cut wages, freeze the pension? make the re worst recession in almost a century even deeper and even longer than it needs to be. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. So, I mean, we now have Senator Gallagher criticising legislation she voted for. Legislation she voted for. Like, I mean, so, so, so here, here order. we are. Senator, order. Senator Keneally, Senator Wong's on his feet on a point of order. Mr President, I know this minister doesn't want to answer the question. He has continued to talk about the opposition. Order. Can I hear the point of order? You're reducing well, it, Dan. We, 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 the, the senator asked a question about the minister's decision this week. He wants to talk about Senator Gallagher and her voting record. There's plenty of other opportunities for him to do so. But he was asked a direct question on this, and I ask him to return to the question. Um, uh, order. Um, order. Oh, we, won't, we won't get through many questions if this keeps up. Okay. Order. I mean, this is time that the opposition tradi This is. We'll just sit here and waste time. I'll rule. I don't think this is. You know, we're on broadcast. I don't think this is a particularly good example for the Senate. Order. On the point of order, the question was very broad. The minister was eight seconds in. Uh, the point raised by Senator Wong and interjections supporting Senator Wong um, were matters for debate. It, they, in my view, I cannot rule the minister being um, the minister is being directly relevant, particularly as he was eight seconds in. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We stand by the legislation that we put to the Senate and which the Labor Party supported. Order. And we absolutely and we absolutely stand by the decisions that we have made. And, I mean, Order. Senator, Senator Wong is actually, actually not interested in answers. She's just interested Order. in Senator disorderly Wong. interjecting. Senator Wong, Mr. please. I, I need to be able to hear Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, we will continue to implement our plan for the strongest possible economic and jobs recovery. The strongest possible economic and jobs Order. recovery. And, and phasing, out, phasing out the uh, level of JobKeeper wage subsidy. Uh, as the economy recovers, over a, you know, essentially at the end of a 12-month period of historically unprecedented support is part of that. We need to allow businesses to adjust. We need to allow the economy to adjust so that we can maximise the strength of the recovery uh, on the other side. Senator Faruqi, order. Order. Can I please hear Senator Faruqi? Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Education. Minister, happy Early Childhood Educators Day, but perhaps not so happy for the educators. The United Workers Union has come to Parliament today to meet with the Education Minister and deliver a petition of more than 30,000 signatures. The petition calls for the federal government to provide a wage guarantee to workers in early childhood education and care throughout COVID-19. 
The union says that the employment guarantee provided by the government doesn't prevent part-time staff and casuals from facing drastic cuts in hours. The vast majority of the sector is part-time or casual. They are among the lowest paid workers in Australia. Why won't the government commit to a wage guarantee for our critical early childhood educators and carers? The Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. And, uh, and I do acknowledge that uh, early childhood education providers, uh, carers, uh, educators uh, across the country uh, provide uh, an essential and very important service to many, many families uh, and an important and essential educational opportunity and benefit uh, to many young Australians. Uh, my own children uh, received outstanding care and early childhood education uh, from wonderful carers, and I'm sure that is the case for many others uh, in this chamber. Uh, and we acknowledge their hard work, uh, the care they provide, uh, and the foundational start that they give uh, to young Australians in terms of their education and well-being. Uh, it's why our government has been pleased to expand opportunity and access uh, for families to be able to reach early childhood education and care services, and that we see record numbers of children and families accessing those services uh, as we entered the pandemic uh, this year. Uh, we value the work of those carers uh, who, of course, have uh, their wages determined through standard industrial relations processes, uh, as indeed uh, do uh, all Australians as part of the uh, award system there. Uh, but increasingly, we have pleasingly seen the number of children accessing the valuable care services there grow, increasing some 1.8 per cent last year to uh, 1,339,970 uh, over that period of time. The number of families increasing as well. Uh, and that growth is a testament to the fact that uh, under our government pre-pandemic, uh, our childhood education reforms had provided uh, for uh, families to be able to access uh, care uh, with support from the government for those who needed uh, the most hours of support, getting the most amount of hours subsidised care, uh, for those earning the least, uh, getting the greatest rate of subsidy under our reforms, uh, and that helped drive more families Order. into Senator a system Birmingham. to receive such care. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, we are seeing growing enthusiastic support across our community for universally available early learning. Just this week, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner identified an overhaul of childcare as a key priority for women's equality. And research from the ANU and Grattan Institute has shown the huge benefits of greater public investment in early learning. When will the government admit that the current system is broken and commit to fee-free, well-funded early learning for all families? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, we won't, uh, we won't admit that because we don't agree that's the case. In fact, uh, our belief is that our reforms have strengthened uh, the current system. Uh, our reforms saw investment grow, uh, investment forecast to be around $9 billion a year in relation uh, to the Australian government's support for funding early childhood education and care services, growing to $10 billion a year over the next few years. And this is a significant rate of growth in expenditure in these areas. Uh, and in the growth of expenditure, what we have done is make sure that we target that expenditure so that, as I said before, under the reforms our government enacted, Families who can least afford care receive the greatest level of subsidy and support to access that care. Indeed, the most vulnerable families receive an entire subsidy. All fees are paid and covered in those circumstances. And those working the longest hours receive the greatest entitlement to subsidy, whilst guaranteed hours are there for children in relation to their preschool access. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Mr President, Minister, the Thrive by Five campaign for universal access to early learning launched this week with everyone from Michelle O'Neill and Jay Wetherill to Julie Bishop and Nicola Forrest saying universal early learning is a great idea. Why is the government dragging its heels and refusing again and again to commit to making our childcare system universally accessible? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, our childcare system is universally accessible. Uh, it is universally accessible on a range of levels. Firstly, in terms of the provision uh, of preschool opportunity uh, for children, where our government has continuously worked with the states and territories uh, to ensure that there is universal access and right to attend preschool services, 
And not only that, but we continue to try to work with the states and territories to better benchmark attendance at those preschool services. Far too often, far too often the reports we get back are about enrolment in preschool, but fail to address the gap in attendance, where often the most vulnerable children who will most benefit from attendance are the ones least likely to be attending. Uh, and the work that our government has sought to do has been to engage states and territories to try to ensure the funding we provide for the delivery of those preschool services gets to the children who need it most uh, and delivers them the support that they deserve in terms of being at childcare, being at preschool and getting that Order. educational Senator opportunity Birmingham. that they will benefit Senator from. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's record economic response of over $300 billion to the COVID-19 pandemic is keeping small businesses in business and their employees in work through the economic effects of the pandemic? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McGrath for the question. And, Mr. President, as the uh, Minister of Finance has stated, uh, COVID-19, a global pandemic, has had a devastating impact uh, on not only the global economy but, of course, the Australian economy. When a government has to shut down parts of the economy, uh, it is going to have a detrimental effect, and we know that it has had a devastating effect on many small and family businesses around Australia. But that is why the government took decisive action and continues to take decisive action to respond to both the health aspects of the pandemic but of course the economic aspects and in terms of our support for small and family businesses uh, they are the engine room of the Australian economy. Uh, they support, in particular, rural and regional economies around Australia. And that is why we are investing a record stimulus of in excess of $300 billion into the economy to ensure Senator that uh, we can support them. Mr. President, when Senator you Watt. look at the support that is actually flowing through order. to small Senator, businesses. Senator Cormann, yeah, on the point of order. Uh, th might be what I was much. about to say. Like, um, interjections are always disorderly, even more so when uh, there is total disregard uh, to uh, interventions by the president. I'm going to revert to my rule of asking people to count slowly to 10 after they're called to order, um, particularly those who have been particularly voluble today. Senator Watt. Senator Cash to continue. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And Order. Senator Watt. Um, well, if someone has been as voluble as Senator Watt, they probably need to learn a little bit of patience. I've, I've called him out more than anyone else today. I will call those to my right to order in a minute. But well, Goose and Gander is also, when I've called Senator Watt more than a dozen times in 25 minutes, uh, he can bite his tongue. People shouldn't bait those who are known to have short fuses either. But please, if I call you to order, at least show some respect to the chair and your colleagues by not continuing it immediately. Order across the chamber. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And the economic support is flowing through to small and family business around Australia. Uh, in terms of the JobKeeper payment, uh, we know that it is supporting around 3.5 million Australians to maintain that really important connection with their employer. Uh, and certainly, yesterday, legislation passed this place that will ensure that that support now continues through until March next year. In terms of the cash flow boost, that is also flowing through to small and family businesses around Australia. They are now accessing over $24 billion in a Assistance, and that's over 785,000 businesses. That important money flowing through back to them. In terms of the apprentice wage subsidy, it's now supporting at this time over 51,200 employers, mostly small businesses around Australia, to retain almost 90,000 apprentices and trainees. Small and family businesses, they are the backbone of the Australian economy, and the Morrison government Order. will continue to support them. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. How has the government's strong record of supporting small business created the conditions for economic recovery on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, uh on the government side of the chamber, on the coalition side of the chamber, we understand that putting in place 
policies that will support small and family businesses to prosper, grow, to create more jobs uh, for Australians is essential for a strong economy. And we've had a record of that since we were elected to government, in particular, though, fast tracking tax relief for small and family uh, businesses around Australia, because we know that it's their money. The more that we can give back to them, uh, the more that they can invest back into their businesses and create more jobs for Australians. Uh, but of course, ensuring small businesses are paid on time through a range of initiatives, but in particular, including the government's own payment policies. Cutting red tape for small business. Red tape uh, is a blocker in terms of job creation, and we are absolutely committed to cutting red tape where we can, uh, but also investing in mental health resources for small businesses are uh, so important given the devastating impact of COVID-19 on the Order. economy. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. How will the government's job maker plan support small businesses to create jobs and support their communities as the economy recovers from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr. President, the Morrison government understands uh, small and family businesses the backbone of the Australian economy. We understand that we need to, and we have put in place policies that will enable them to prosper, grow, and create more jobs for Australians. And in terms of our plan for economic recovery to get Australia and Australians through COVID-19, uh, every minister, every department, uh, they are working to put job creation at the centre of everything we do. We will continue to build on the measures that we have already implemented to help the economy and ensure that small businesses are able to create jobs. And as the Minister for Finance has stated, this includes undertaking important skills reform, ensuring that Australians are skilled uh, in areas of the economy that are creating jobs, the important industrial relations reform that the Minister for Finance uh, referred to, removing unnecessary red tape through deregulation, and of course, streamlining project approvals. Order. A key Senator factor Cash, time in job for the creation. Expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Cormann. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott gets two taxpayer-funded staff members, a driver, an office, a private vehicle, free travel and a pension worth over $300,000 a year. Mr Abbott has accepted a role advancing the interests of a foreign nation. This is a strong probability that Mr Abbott will be employed to assist the UK negotiate trade deals that may not necessarily benefit Australia's sovereign interest. Is the Prime Minister really going to allow Australian taxpayers to pay him, pay for his office, pay for his travel, pay for his staff and pay for his car while he's working against the interests of the same Australian taxpayers that are covering his bills? <laughs> The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Lambie for that question. I'm somewhat disappointed that a Labor senator felt it appropriate to say that that was a good question, because in Australia we have a, a great tradition in a non-partisan fashion to treat our former Prime Ministers with respect from both, from both sides of politics, from both sides of politics, Order. and the and the and the work expenses available to former prime ministers, be they Order Labour on my or left. Liberal, are precisely the same and organised in an entirely non-partisan fashion. Order on my left. I'm fashion. having trouble hearing. Let me, Senator let me, Coleman, can you please resume your seat? Senator, this this is no reflection on Senator Coleman. I can't hear what he's saying. Really. When I say I can't hear a minister answering a question, the retort to the chair is he should answer the question. I'm asking to be able to hear the minister answer the question. He does not have a small, a, a quiet voice, and I can't hear it. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr. President. And you know, despite my voice, I don't think any of my colleagues uh, are falling asleep as I'm answering this question today. But, Mr. Mr. President. Um, we, we treat our former prime ministers with respect, with courtesy and respect. The uh, work expense arrangements for all of them are the same. I believe that all of them, uh, all of them pursue, all of them pursue uh, alternative um, uh, co opportunities to contribute internationally and domestically. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, I, I, I don't believe the information that uh, Sir Lambie has that uh, Mr. Abbott is uh, uh, paid for. Uh, work that he uh, is uh, conducting to facilitate international trade. Uh, I don't believe he's paid for that role. Uh, I, I don't think it is appropriate uh, to make the sorts of reflections that were supported by a, a Labor senator in this chamber, disappointingly, uh, in relation to any of our former prime ministers. 
Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Whether he was paid or not, I was kicked out of the Senate in 2017 under Section 44 for dual citizenship. The thinking has always been that dual citizens have dual, alliance, dual allegiance to Australia and to another country. If another country was paying me to promote, promote their interests, potentially over the interests of Australia, would that be considered a dual allegiance? And if so, would I, like Mr Abbott, still be entitled to an annual salary from the taxpayer? Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr President. Firstly, uh, Mr Abbott is no longer a member of uh, the uh, Australian Parliament, so the constitutional arrangements around eligibility for federal members of parliament do not apply to Mr uh, Abbott. Uh, Mr Abbott, like any uh, former uh, member of parliament, any former prime minister under the old uh, parliamentary pension arrangements, uh, you know, obviously uh, qualifies for the arrangements that have been in place for all on the same basis. I think it's entirely inappropriate to make uh, the suggestions that are being uh, made here. Uh, I, I, I think it is, I think it is uh, deeply personal and inappropriate. And uh, Senator Wong, no, well, Senator Wong, uh, quite frankly, everyone after their leave is entitled to pursue other career opportunities, and the and the retirement order, income Senator arrangements Coleman, are the same for Senator all. Lambie, on a point of order, Senator Lambie. Yeah, um, my point of order is, could you please? Uh, what I'm asking you is, do you not do you not think that? Um, that gives him a dual allegiance. We are paying him, yet he's, he may be going S into Lambie, trade please. to come against Senator the Lambie, taxpayer. I've allowed you to restate part of the question, but that was not a point of order. I think the, I think the, minister, I think the minister is being directly relevant to the question as asked. Even, there's a chance to debate it later. Senator Cormann. Thank you. I answered the question directly. I mean, the analogy that Senator Lambie sought to make with uh, her circumstance uh, when uh, she found herself in breach of constitutional eligibility requirements is not there because Mr uh, Abbott is no longer a member of the Australian Parliament. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What would the Prime Minister like to say to the thousands of veterans whose compensation claims that have been denied in the courts every year, each mounting to far less than $700,000 a year we're paying a former Prime Minister to work against Australia's national interest, have to say? Senator Corbyn. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed that Senator Lambie chooses to uh, pick on one former Prime Minister. The arrangements are the same for uh, all of our current former Prime Ministers, except the most recent ones. And, um, and, and anyone who has. Well, I mean, Senator Wong, if you are suggesting that we should change retirement income arrangements retrospectively, then please say so and move a piece of legislation along those lines. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister outline how the recent agreement between the United States Defence Department and the Australian company Linus to supply critical minerals from its Mount Weld mine in Western Australia will benefit Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Canavan for his question. Of course, uh, a consistent advocate for Australia's resources industry, as the entire chamber knows. Linus is uh, an Australian-listed company and a great Aussie success and export success story. It is a key component of the global rare earth supply chain and, I understand, supplies around 13 per cent uh, of global rare earth element production. Uh, Linus owns and operates a rare earths mine in Mount World, West WA. Uh, an ore from Mount World is shipped and processed at Linus's advanced materials plant in Malaysia. On 27 July 2020, Linus announced that the US Department of Defence and Linus had signed a contract for phase one work to deliver a US-based heavy rare earths processing facility. But this, I'm pleased to say, Mr President, uh, is not Linus's only facility development. Linus is also investing around $500 million to build a processing plant in Kalgoorlie to use Mount Weld ore. Linus is committed to using a residential workforce instead of FIFO workers, grading about 500 jobs in the construction phase and about 100 permanent roles. Linus is a proven record in the processing of rare earth elements, and this is an important milestone in delivering more diversified global supply of heavy rare earths. Critical minerals featured again in the recent Osmin consultations held by my colleagues in Washington. This highlighted the importance of work Australia and the US are progressing to diversify critical mineral supply chains. The current COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted potential issues associated with concentrated supply chains, but we know that Australia is well placed to lead the diversification of critical 
mineral supply chains across the globe, as we are the leading producer of some of the world's most sought-after critical minerals, including rare earths, lithium, zirconium and titanium. These are critical minerals found in our phones, laptops, advanced technological products and, of course, across defence industries as well. That's why we're so committed to working Order, with Senator our partners Birmingham. to help diversify that expired. supply. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, why is it important for our mining and manufacturing sectors uh, to deliver uh, diverse export markets? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Australia's resource industry is, uh, is world-leading. The world needs our raw materials and mining, and we have been a proud, consistent and reliable supplier of such minerals right across the world in terms of support uh, for growth of others. Australia is the world's largest producer of iron ore, of metallurgical coal, of LNG, of bauxite and the second largest producer of gold and thermal coal. Australia also has extensive resources of nickel, copper and zinc, metals which will be the key for the future economy. We are increasingly looking and working with companies like Linus in the value adding to our resources. Our mining engineering technology and services industry is world leading, exporting itself around $27 billion worth of Australian know-how and expertise to support resources projects across the globe. Now, Australia has many robust trading partners. We export our resources to many of the world's major economies, meeting their demands, their needs, but in doing so creating jobs and opportunities for Order. Australians Senator and Australian Birmingham. businesses to grow. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, how, will, Minister, how will expanding our minerals exports to nations like the United States help secure long-term, well-paying jobs in regional Australia uh, on our road to economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the resources industry is one of the most important industries for regional communities. Regional communities right across Australian states, including, of course, Senator Canavan's great home state of Queensland. But whether it's from Karratha to Mackay or Mount Isa across Queensland or right across the country, the resources sector underpins good jobs, reliable jobs, high-paying jobs for families, particularly those living in regional areas, and it creates economies and communities that provide further job opportunities right across regional Australia. It is, of course, also, uh, I am pleased to say as Trade Minister, uh, our leading export sector in terms of the contribution it makes generating income wealth for our nation, as I was saying before, not just in the extraction of resources, increasingly in areas of processing and in the use of Australian skills, know-how and capabilities that we see now assisting projects around the world and again generating more high-paying job opportunities for Australians, which Order. will be Senator ever Birmingham. more important in our Senator, economic recovery. We're going to the screen now. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is also to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for Resources. Senator Birmingham, last week the New South Wales Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Falinski, called on the House to oppose oil and gas drilling off the coast of Sydney and oppose the renewal of the petroleum exploration permit PEP 11 licence. Does the, is the federal government aware of the reasons the member of McKellar doesn't want to see new oil and gas exploration off the New South Wales coastline? And do your, does your government agree with Mr Falinski? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for the question. Uh, I did not uh, see Senator Fli uh, Mr Falinski's comments. He's welcome to the Senate uh, if he wishes, but he does a fine job in his electorate uh, already. Um, I did not see Mr Falinski's uh, uh, comments. Uh, so I'll take, uh, take on notice any details in relation to that that might be necessary to add. Uh, but what I would, uh, would make uh, the point of uh, is that we have well-established approvals processes in relation to oil and gas exploration, uh, where that is, uh, is offshore, uh, working through uh, NOPSEMA, uh, an agency that, uh, that has had its expertise and credibility demonstrated time and again, uh, most recently, in fact, uh, by work that Australia's chief scientist did following the last election. Uh, to, uh, to review NOPSEMA uh, in terms of their approvals processes uh, and to ensure that the way in which uh, they assess or environmental risks and other factors uh, occurs in a most thorough manner. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. The permit holders of PEP 11, Asset Energy and Bounty Oil and Gas, 
want to go straight from seismic testing to drilling, a change of permit that would require and skip community consultation. Given the New South Wales Liberal Government also opposes any extension to PEP 11 and the ultimate decision rests with the Federal Minister, will your government listen to your federal and state colleagues rather than a few oil and gas interests and step in to protect the New South Wales coastline from a potentially deadly oil spill and a divisive Order. industrial Senator Wilson, well, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I can say that what our government will do uh, is not listen to a few interests be they on any side of any one debate, but that we will apply the law fully, thoroughly, rigorously, as it's intended to be. Uh, we will let our independent agencies who operate under laws passed through this parliament undertake the assessments of any applications for permits, changes in permits or otherwise uh, be conducted uh, without any political interference, uh, but on the basis of the merits uh, of those cases including, of course, the thorough and proper environmental consideration that will be given to any such applications or requests. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, there's little to no scientific research on the impacts of oil and gas exploration, especially seismic testing, on our oceans and fisheries. The limited research we do have suggests significant risks with caution to be applied. Minister, do you appreciate why commercial fishing bodies and stakeholders right around the country, from Ningaloo in Western Australia to the Great Australian Bight to King Island off Tasmania and to the Otway Basin, are up in arms over new offshore oil and gas exploration Order, acreage? Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, I suspect Senator Wish Wilson uh, exaggerates somewhat uh, what he describes as, uh, as those who are up in arms. Uh, but I again restate as I did in the primary question in the first supplementary, uh, that when it comes to any applications for uh, seismic testing, uh, offshore drilling, uh, any such activities, uh, they go through a very thorough assessment process. And that assessment process is designed uh, to ensure uh, that scientific evidence is heeded, uh, that safeguards are met, and indeed involves opportunities for communities, stakeholders or others to have their say as part of that assessment process and to present evidence to those assessments. That's precisely what, to what will occur in the case of any of the types of hypothetical circumstances that Senator Wish Wilson uh, raises. Uh, it will be done properly in a way that balances those interests, assesses the evidence, but also provides an opportunity still for job creation to occur in Australia where projects Order. meet the Senator appropriate Birmingham. safeguards. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. Yep, we're good to go. All right. My question is for the Minister for Order Aged Care. Order on my right. Hang on. I'm going to stop the clock. I, don't, I was taking notes and I don't know what happened there, but I'm going to. We're going to start again so I can hear the question. Order on my right. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Former Prime Minister Abbott says elderly people with COVID-19 should be left to die, quote, while nature takes its course. Why hasn't the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians already condemned this heartless remark by this former Liberal Prime Minister? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I had not heard that comment made by former Minister, Minister Prime Minister. Order. But, Mr. President, uh, I do not agree with that. I do not agree with that. I, I, I do not agree with that statement, Mr. President. I simply do not agree with it. And, Mr. President, the government's actions demonstrate the, that our desire to ensure all of our actions demonstrate our desire to ensure that all senior Australians. COVID positive or not, COVID positive or not, are treated with respect and get the care that they deserve. Exactly. Mr. President, there is no way I think anyone in this chamber, on either side, Mr. President, would agree with those comments of former Prime Minister um, Abbott. Uh, absolutely, do not agree, uh, and and I would and I would condemn the comments, Mr. President, because uh, that's not what I believe. Uh, I don't think that's what anyone in the in the chamber believes, Mr. President. And uh, our desire is to ensure that 
all senior Australians, all our planning, all our work has been to ensure that all senior Australians uh, get the care that they deserve and they need, uh, regardless of the COVID-19 circumstances, Mr President. Uh, so I, I simply do not agree with the statements of the former, former Prime Minister. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Mr President, last month the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, said the view that elderly people should be offered up to COVID-19 is, and I quote, an absolutely amoral, hideous thought. Does the minister agree that Tony Abbott's prepared remarks in a speech last night are amoral and hideous? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I just condemned the remarks of the former Prime Minister with respect to Australians who have COVID-19, senior Australians or any Australian who has COVID-19. I do not agree with the remarks that were made last night. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. I note the minister's condemnation of Prime, former Prime Minister Abbott's remarks. Does the minister's dismissal of deaths as a, of, by neglect as a function of the aged care system reflect his view that elderly Australians should be offered up to COVID-19 and left to die while nature takes its course? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is really quite offensive that Senator Keneally continues to misrepresent the remarks that I've made in the chamber. I have, never, I have never done that. I have never dismissed any of the deaths. I have never dismissed any of the deaths, Mr. President. Uh, I have consistently offered my condolences to every family who has lost a family member with respect to uh, COVID-19, Mr. President, and the misrepresentation of my comments by the opposition on a number of occasions is dishonest, Mr. President, and, and it's offensive. Uh, all of the efforts of the government, all of the efforts of the government right through this pandemic have been focused on providing support to senior Australians through the COVID-19 outbreak. We continue to do that. We continue to do that, Mr. President. Uh, and, and I find the comments and the suggestion of Senator Keneally quite offensive. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister outline the government's support to vulnerable Australians whose return to Australia has been impacted by COVID-19? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for his question. Uh, we're certainly aware, Mr. President, that many Australians are facing hardship overseas uh, because of the global travel restrictions resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Many Australians have been able to return, more than 379,000 since the government advised Australians to reconsider their need to travel overseas. However, about 30,000 people are registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as being overseas, and of those, about 20,000 have expressed a wish to return. The government, through its network of DFAT consular staff, has been helping those Australians with a focus on people who are most vulnerable because they have no means to support themselves or perhaps have medical conditions. Today, the government has indicated that we will provide further support through an expanded hardship program, which will build on our existing Traveller Emergency Loans program. These are one-off loans which will be available to cover emergency living costs <coughs> until a person is able to return. Loans will also be available to help with the cost of airline tickets to return to Australia. Loans will be made to the most vulnerable Australians, and applicants will need to meet strict eligibility requirements, including, for instance, being able to show that they have attempted to return to Australia. This financial assistance is available to Australians, much like the traveller emergency loans, as a last resort. Uh, for further information, Mr. President, we of course continue to encourage people to visit smarttraveller.gov.com.au. Uh, Mr. President, we do understand that uh, many Australians have found themselves in difficult circumstances resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, travel restrictions globally, as I said. The program we are announcing today will alleviate some of this hardship. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise what steps the government has taken to protect the health of the Australian community, including those Australians overseas? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his supplementary question. The government did act early uh, to slow the spread of COVID-19 in, in Australia by recognising this 
as a pandemic and restricting entry to the country. Without these measures, taken based on clear health advice, the pandemic would have hit our communities much harder. Around 4,000 Australians continue to return each week. The states and the territories incoming passenger caps remain in place through the national cabinet process to protect the Australian community, though, as the Prime Minister has advised, they are uh, being regularly reviewed. The situation in Victoria has illustrated how dangerous a compromised quarantine system can be. Today's national accounts data also underscore the fact that, as well as the tragic loss of life, the economic damage is unparalleled in our recent history. We acknowledge that domestic caps are making it harder for people to return, but we do ask that Australians understand that there is a balance Order. which Senator has to be Payne. struck in Senator these circumstances. Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate what further support and guidance the government is giving to Australians overseas and their families? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think it is important to note that this is a global pandemic which is far from over. There is no guarantee about when international travel, for, travel, for example, will return to some form of normalcy. DFAT continues to work with airlines and other governments to assist Australians in returning, but it is going to be some time before flights are available. And in that context, we encourage Australians seeking to return to stay in close contact with their airlines their travel agents to confirm plans as they are uh, able to do so. For those who are unable to obtain flights, we continue to encourage them to ensure they have arrangements in place to allow for a possible extended stay. The support announced by the government today is designed to help the most vulnerable Australians overseas to maintain those arrangements. Australians overseas are also able to follow the advice of local authorities, of course, and continue to monitor the government's advice on smart traveller. Order. Senator Payne. Senator Green. President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Australians are living through the worst recession since the Great Depression almost a century ago. Today's national accounts show household spending has collapsed and we have a record high unemployment, with one million Australians out of work and 400,000 more expected to lose their job by Christmas. Isn't this the worst time to be cutting back support? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Green uh, for her question. Well, quite clearly today, the, the figures that, that we received um, indicate the devastating impact that the COVID pandemic has had on Australia, on our economy, but most particularly on the lives and livelihoods of many Australians. Uh, and that is why this government has put in place an unprecedented package of supports for Australians. Um, $314 billion have been put into the economy to make sure, uh, to make sure that Australians have got a cushion by which to, to support them through this, uh, this uh, un unprecedented um, uh, pandemic that has hit the entire world but has also impacted Australia. But what we did say at, uh, at the time this pandemic first hit, back in March, and everybody here was in the chamber at the time, was that we needed to put in supports to assist Australians from one side of this pandemic to the other. Clearly, we are not through that pandemic yet. But we all agreed at the time that we would put in place supports, and in my area of social services, those supports related uh, to the coronavirus supplement. Um, we made a decision in July. We announced to people in July that we were going to extend that support past the end of September, because we recognise that Australians are still doing it tough. But, but across much of the economy, we are starting to see the green shoots of our economies opening up. We are starting to see we are starting to see jobs occur, and it is the responsibility of a, a responsible government to make sure that we manage the balance between providing increased levels and, of, of support to support people in a shallow job market, but at the same time recognising we have to put the incentives back in place so people start engaging with the job market so that they can start getting themselves back into the job market. Order. And in addition to that, we also provided assistance through the, in, for, uh, the income free Order, area. Senator Rustin. <coughs> time for the answers expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In, Order. in March, 
the Senate gave the minister extraordinary powers to increase support to those on support payments. What is the economic impact of the minister's refusal to use her extraordinary powers to give the one million Australians without, without work the support that they need? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and I would point out to Senator Green that um, I have actually used my powers. There is a, uh, an instrument uh, laid in this place at the moment to extend the coronavirus supplement from the end of September till the end of December, recognising that the jobs market is still very shallow. But we, in addition, we do want people to start re-engaging with the, the jobs market because we understand we understand um, that people who are um, in, in have any form of income in addition to their unemployment benefit are more likely to come off, uh, off payment. Um, but I find it really quite extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's almost like um, you, know, you guys want order. to have an each way Senator, bet. Senator Rustin, Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, the question was asking the minister what the economic impact of her refusing to use her powers is, and she hasn't addressed that point. Um, well, the minister has been addressing the use of the powers, she is, and that was directly relevant. I'm listening to what the minister is saying, and I, I consider it to be relevant to the question, um, referring to both the powers and the economic impact, which phrase is used in it. Senator Rustin. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, as I was saying, you know, it's almost like those opposite want to have an each-way bet. I mean, in one instance, you're telling us that we need to extend things, and the other side, you're telling us to transition out of it. Um, so, I mean, clearly, those on the other side really don't actually know what you Order. want. Senator. Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. President. Um, after, after the point of order there was raised, the minister then went to a commentary on the Labor Party. They're in government. They ask the questions. And they, they answer the questions. I'd ask you to, to ask the minister to return to the question. It would be easier if there were no interjections and ministers did not take them. That would be easier. Um, the minister has five seconds left. I'll encourage her to be re directly relevant and there to be no interjections to provide her with bait otherwise. Thank you very much. I have used my powers. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Why is the minister not only refusing to act, but also cutting back support from the economy and the jobs market, making it even harder for the one million Australians out of work right now to find jobs and to put food on their table? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said to the answer to the primary question that I received from Senator, Senator Green, um, everybody in this chamber was in the chamber in March when we made a decision to put in place a supplement called the Coronavirus Supplement for a period of six months. That period of six months expires on the 24th of September this year. The decision of this government, the government of which I am the Social Services Minister, made a decision which he announced in the July economic financial update was that the decision of this government was to extend the supplement past the September deadline until December and at the same time put in place an increased uh, income-free area which allowed people to earn an additional $300 before any of their payments were cut back. Order. In effect, we have said we are transitioning people back into the economy, but we recognise the job market is shallow and for that reason we have extended the supplement for a further three months at the same time as putting an income-free area Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, I uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, and I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cormann to the question asked by Senator Wong. Uh, and I thank the Senate. So, well, today we've had the national accounts um, released. And what they've shown is we have the deepest recession since the Great Depression. We've got the worst quarterly contraction since records began 60 years ago. Household spending has collapsed. Business investment, already in decline since 2018, tanked. A million Australians unemployed, 400,000 people expected to lose their jobs by Christmas, 1.6 million Australians receiving income support through Job, Keep, job Seeker or Youth Allowance, about 3.5 million Australian workers on JobKeeper, record levels of debt, deficits for a decade. And what's this government's response to this disastrous set of numbers released today? Numbers which behind them tell the distressing stories 
of businesses lost, jobs lost, households under enormous stress. And what is the government's response? Where is their plan for economic recovery? Where is their plan for jobs? We've known for some time the Treasurer is very quick to go out and tell everybody how bad the economy is, how terrible the impact of COVID-19 has been, but he's not as quick to get out and tell us what the plan is in recovery. And that's what people want to hear. They know the economy's um, suffered. They know jobs have been lost. Each one of us knows someone who's lost their job, who's struggled to make ends meet. We all understand that. The more relevant thing for the government to be focusing on is what are they doing. And the only thing they've been clear about in the last since July, uh, when they updated the uh, economic update, the only thing they've been clear about is a plan to cut economic support, to cut JobKeeper, to cut JobSeeker, to cut wages, to cut super, to freeze the pension. They're all decisions that this government's taken. So we know what they're prepared to cut, what they're prepared to withdraw. It's less clear to us about what they're going to do to drive economic growth, to drive jobs growth, to support businesses that are under pressure in the recovery stage. And that's what we are looking for, and that's why we asked our questions today. That's why we want to know, is this the right time for the government to be withdrawing the support that's been provided in the last six months? And it's not just Labor. The Reserve Bank Governor has made it clear on many occasions that fiscal policy will remain an extremely important element of any economic recovery. And he has warned against withdrawing fiscal support too soon, because the consequences of that will be a longer and deeper recession and the unemployment queues will uh, grow longer than they should have or needed to grow if the government gets this wrong. And that's the point that Labor is making. And that's why we are asking the government, what is your plan for jobs? How are you going to grow jobs and grow the economy? Um, because that is what Australians expect of their government. That's what they elect them to do. Not to tell them how bad everything is and how it's not their fault. It's all everybody else's fault, the state's fault, or we're better than uh, every other country. Well, when you do those international comparisons, I think it's pretty cold comfort, frankly, for the million people who have uh, joined the unemployment queues, or the 1.6 million who are surviving fortnight to fortnight on Job Seeker or Youth Allowance. I don't think they really make the international comparison. They want to know what the plan is for jobs. And we know this government puts a lot of emphasis on the spin. There's a lot less uh, emphasis placed on the substance. So we have announcement after announcement, job maker, job trainer, home builder. And then when you drill down into those programs, programs announced 10 weeks ago, three months ago. What do you find out? You find out, well, there's under job maker, no idea how many jobs it will create. The employment department didn't know what it was, other than they weren't in charge of it. Job trainer, don't really know what the skills priority list. I think they may have released something today, but 10 weeks ago or when it was announced, they didn't know. They had to wait for that work to be done. And home builder, sup supposed to drive the construction industry, no, nothing spent, no applications approved. Well, we want more than spin. We want substance and we want a jobs plan from Thank this you, government. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Sussilja. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, and, you know, when we think back to the last election, uh, and we, I, I recall in the, in the week uh, before the election, I remember, I remember the Labor Party put out uh, their picture. Yeah, no, it's a good one. I've, I've got the picture. I've got the picture. It's a good one. It's in my office, and you're in it. Senator Wong. Senator Wong was in the picture. Uh, Mr Bowen was in the picture. Mr Shorten was in the picture. Mr Chalmers. And what they said is, Order. we're ready. They said, we're ready. And you Order. know, I think, I think about that election when I see what the Labor Party goes on about in opposition and the way they behave, and I think about the reasons for that. And there's a lot written about it, about how their economic plan, the wrecking ball they wanted to take to the Australian economy 
with their higher taxes plan. Uh, was, it, was it part of that? Yeah, it was. But you know what it goes to? And the line of questioning that we saw in question time today, which we're debating now, the questions uh, that they have put in and the answers that were given to those questions, the line of questioning fundamentally goes to the disdain that the Australian Labor Party has for the Australian people. They have absolute disdain for the Australian people. We saw it with the claims that you could raise taxes by $387 billion, and that would have no impact. That would have no impact. You'd just be able to get this magic money tree and distribute it wherever you liked, and that would have no impact on the economy. And now we see it in question time today and in the attacks that the Labor Party are launching, where they show such disdain for the Australian people and they think that they won't notice that when they attack us as we face this economic downturn uh, and they ignore what is going on around the world and what is going on in Australia in terms of this thing called COVID-19, coronavirus, and the hit and the wrecking ball that that has been for the world economy. And, and so we have you know, Labor senators interjecting uh, about this. They, 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 they seem to think that the Australian people are, are too dim-witted to, to notice uh, that there are these things going on and that governments around the world are seeking to deal with it. And this Australian government, this coalition government, has put forward policies uh, right throughout to shield Australians from the worst of the economic impact. Now, can we, can we stop any of the economic impact? No, unfortunately we can't. That's why days like today, when we see those figures out there and we see a number put on, on the challenge and the suffering that so many Australians are going through as we deal with this health crisis and we deal with this economic crisis, when we put a number on it on days like today, they are tough days because we are thinking about those people who have lost their jobs. We are thinking about, well, you know, again, again, we get these ridiculous, ridiculous interjections. Uh, but the Labor Party would like us to pretend that, that this is all happening in a vacuum, that the, that the drop in GDP that has been announced Order. today that we take seriously, that we've been working Senator so Pratt. hard. Order. And as, as Minister Cormann pointed out, you know, when, when you have states and territories and in most cases uh, doing a good job, doing a pretty good job in most cases, uh, seeking to deal with the health crisis and shutting things down and saying you can't move here and you can't move there and this business can't open. Well, you know what? That has a serious impact on economic activity. But the other lie that the Labor Party seeks to perpetuate and thinks the Australian people are too stupid to notice is that somehow we went into this uh, with an economy that wasn't doing well. That's not what the RBA governor had to say. He was forecasting economic growth of 3 per cent and more going into 2020 and 2021. He was forecasting unemployment to drop below 5 per cent. So that was our starting point. That was the starting point that the Liberal National Government brought the country to. The other starting point we had was a balanced budget. Having, delivered, having, having inherited a $48 billion deficit from the Labor Party, we balanced the budget, which of course has given us more fiscal firepower to be able to support Australians with things like JobKeeper, with things like JobSeeker, providing balance sheet support. Can you imagine if the deficits that had been run up under the Labor Party had continued, as they would have? 40 and 50 billion dollar deficits that were there so we balanced the budget we were strengthening our economy unemployment was headed below 5% and now we are dealing with this challenge together as a nation and we will deal with it we will come through this because we will we will make the kind of changes we will be nimble as as an economy and as a, as a government and a country that will help people get back into work that will assist them with the skills they need that will cut the red tape that gets in their way we will get out of this together but we're not going to be lectured to from the labor party living thank in a you, fantasy senator land Cicelja, pretending your the crisis time has doesn't expired. exist senator watt thank you madam acting deputy president well let's just start with a few facts we we'll make a nice change from what we just heard from senator Cicelja. The facts are that today we learned Order. that Australia is facing its worst recession in nearly 100 years, the worst recession our country has faced since the Great Depression. We have seen the worst quarterly contraction of our company since records Order. began. If there's one thing that this government has set a record for, it's for setting new records about its poor economic management, even before this crisis hit. We saw the worst wage growth that this country had ever seen, the worst wage growth since records began. 
And today we see the worst contraction in the economy in any one quarter since records began. It's the first recession in 30 years, 30 years, when growth started under a Labor government. Got the economy moving, got the economy growing, got people into jobs under a Labor government, and it's all been brought to an end by a coalition government starving the economy and starving the Australian people of support that is desperately needed. Now, I might just point out that the government is very keen, as it wants to do, to, to flick responsibility for what's gone on here. It points to the COVID, COVID pandemic, and of course, that, of, course, of course that is a factor in this economy. But I didn't see anyone in the government benches running those kind of excuses when Australia faced the GFC. All around the world after the GFC, the, econ the global economy went into free fall. All developed economies went into recession for years, except for one, Australia. Australia was the only world economy that did not go into recession after the GFC, and that was because of the policies that were brought in place by the Labor government of the day. And this government could take a few lessons from that Labor government about how you deal with external economic shocks and protect your own population from the harm that they can cause. Just as we saw a Labor government take an expansionary approach to the economy after the GFC, we need this government to take an expansionary approach to the economy after the COVID crisis. And unfortunately, we are seeing the opposite. Now, all of these facts and figures have human consequences. It's not just about percentages and records and things like that. It's about the human consequences. All around Australia, we're seeing families losing jobs, unable to pay bills. We're seeing businesses that have been developed over decades collapsing. And we're seeing Centrelink queues the like of which we have not seen since the Great Depression. These are the human consequences of this government's failure to properly protect Australians from the COVID epidemic and its economic consequences. What's even worse is that rather than protecting the Australian people, this government's policy decisions are actually making things worse. They are making this recession be deeper and last longer than it needs to, and they are holding the recovery back. I mean, we just heard this nonsense from Senator Rustin that we're now seeing green shoots in the economy. On the day we plunge into the first recession we've had in 30 years, that's, great. that's green shoots? I'd hate to see a dry lawn if that's green shoots. This economy is in free fall under this government, and they're making it worse from their own decisions. They excluded casuals from receiving JobKeeper. They excluded all sorts of other people from receiving JobKeeper. They've set up a system where people are having to raid their own superannuation funds just to stay afloat because not enough support is being provided by this government. And now, at the time, the same week that we hear, we're seeing the worst recession in Australia for 100 years. They plunge on with their, their plan to cut JobKeeper, to cut JobSeeker, to freeze the pension and to cut the planned superannuation increases. So their own policies are making this worse and are holding back the recovery. What the government should be doing is coming out with some kind of a jobs plan. I mean, I was challenging the government through question time as to where their jobs plan is. It's a blank sheet of paper. It doesn't have a website. It's www.nojobsplan.com. Thank you, Senator Watt. Get Your on time with it. has expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I, there are a number of uh, matters which separate one side of the chamber from the other. The most critical uh, at this moment seems to be that on this side of the chamber, most, if not all, of our members can manage to stay awake for the entire course of parliament. But, of course, we know that's not true on the flip side of parliament because we've seen Senator Carr nod off, but it seems to me that there are many, many more who may well be 
Senator Wong, I know that this doesn't relate to you. Um, we're, we're talking about Senator Carr's napping off yesterday, but he's been asleep for longer than we think, as obviously has Senator Watt. Because uh, um, what we Senator have, Senator Antic, what, what... please resume your seat, Senator Polly. Yes, uh, Deputy President, I draw your attention to the issue before the chair, and draw the good senator to the topic at hand. It's not one to run a commentary on other senators. Thank you, uh, Senator Polly. I am listening carefully, and I'm waiting for Senator Antic to um, take note of the. Uh, questions and answers from Senator Cormann. You, Madam Acting Deputy President, we are now uh, something in the order of 25 seconds in, so not an unreasonable prelude because the point I was going to make uh, was that you would have to almost be asleep for the better part of 12 months to not know that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and obviously that, that propensity to, to doze off has infected this side of the chamber because um, we all know on this side of the chamber that COVID-19 uh, has indeed been an uh, unprecedented event in our lifetime. It has been a wrecking ball through the economy. And in fact, we heard earlier from um, uh, Senator Watt that uh, there were concerns about the suggestion that we were now seeing green shoots. Well, let me take you to the words of the RBA governor, who said in relation to the situation Australia finds itself in um, yesterday, as difficult as this is, the downturn is not as severe as earlier expected, and a recovery is now underway in most of Australia. Now, we know this side of the chamber loves evidence-based politics. We hear it all the time, evidence-based policy, evidence-based politics. This is the RBA governor saying this. Thing. So we, we know this is a difficult time. We on this side of the chamber know this is a difficult period. We have seen COVID-19 do what no other incident has done in our lifetime. And the IMF is actually expecting 157 economies to contract this year, and many uh, would be unprecedented falls. So the impact in the June quarter of GDP across the globe has been staggering. No other way of putting it, staggering. So let's take through some, some more evidence-based uh, uh, assessments here for the other side. 20.4 per cent GDP fall in the United Kingdom. 13.8 per cent in France, 11.5 per cent in Canada, 10.1 per cent in uh, uh, sorry 9.1 per cent in the United States. Th these are ostensibly the biggest economies in the world. Th the situation in Australia needs to be read as per the facts show, and the RBA governor's comments are very very relevant. And while the market is expecting falls less than what we've seen overseas. The national accounts will confirm uh, what Australians already know, that the economy has been hit hard. That is very, very, very clear. And we can't rule out, of course, the impact of uh, the uh, effect of the Victorian stage four lockdowns. This has been an enormous drain on the economy, of course, coming from the Labor-run state of Victoria. And as part of our economic plan, the Morrison government is providing unprecedented support. The suggestion that there has been no support or that JobKeeper is being wound down unnecessarily is an absolute nonsense. It's a, it's a Labor-run furphy. The, business, the, the 30, $314 billion in support to keep businesses and Australian businesses in jobs. And, uh, we, can, we can run through some of those. Our jobs plan is, without question, uh, sound and fundamental. We have the economic support packages. Well, I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to give Senator O'Neill some more evidence. I'm going Order. to give her some more evidence because we know she, being a Labor senator, loves evidence-based policy. Our economic support package of $305 billion represents. Fifth, no question. She's she's awake. That's good. 15.3% uh, of annual GDP. Now let's take it through. We need to break these down because some people are asleep at the wheel in this chamber. $101.3 billion for JobKeeper, Madam Acting Deputy President. $101.3 billion. $31.9 billion for cash flow boost for business. Senator O'Neill. $16.8 billion for income support for individuals, including the $550 fortnightly coronavirus supplement. $9.4 billion for two rounds of the uh, stimulus payments. Um, then there's the Skills and Apprentices pro uh, Apprenticeship Program with the national new, new National Skills Commission, which we've, we've spoke about at length in here. This is going to help young job keepers to better understand the skills needed of employers 
I mean, this government really. What, what, what more can this government do? This is wait, what, once again for those who Order. are awake on the opposite side of the chamber, which Senator O'Neill very clearly is. Order. Must, Senator Carr's gone off for a nap, I think. Um, in the meantime, we are going through the continual list of continual list uh, of thank achievements. Thank you, Senator Antic. Your um, time has expired, and may I remind you of the words uh, of the president earlier in the week about not referring at this particular time to senators who are not in the chamber because we have so many senators paired and using the video link. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Well, that, that uh, contribution to our debate after question time was an embarrassment for a government that has no plan. The only plans that were referenced there at all was the announcement schedule, where the government goes out and makes an announcement day after day, but Australians are starting to wake up to this government. They are desperate to hear. They are desperate to hear that the government have a plan because they know it's affecting their life. But there is no plan. I rise, like my colleagues, to take note of answers made by the Minister for Finance regarding this truly, truly terrible day for the Australian people impacted by what's going on in our economy. Now, as was forecast in recent days, the Australian economy has headed into a recession for the first time in nearly three decades. The jobs figures are more diabolical than even I feared, with another 400,000 Australians predicted to lose their jobs by Christmas. This is indeed, as Senator Watt said, the worst recession in nearly 100 years. And memories and images that echo those of the Great Depression are acquiring a 2020 makeover in the lives of our citizenry right now. So many Australians, far too many Australians, including my own children and their friends, have in their sights now a recession. They have no idea what it's like—30 years of growth constructed by great policy making by Labor leaders, kicked off with Hawke and Keating. But right now we are witnessing, our children are witnessing, the long, long queues outside Centrelink right across this country. They're driving down Main Street seeing small businesses shuttered right across the country. They're coming to know and see the Australians who they believed would always have a job, not have a job, businesses disappearing overnight. Today it's been confirmed that the GDP, the gross domestic product of this country, has collapsed by 7 per cent through the June quarter. That figure of a 7 per cent decline in the wealth of our nation is unheard of since the Great Depression, over 90 years ago. The pandemic has indeed caused a steep drop in private household expenditure, and that has had massive economic impacts. And I will go to what Senator um, Cormann said that was of incredible concern to me. He said, yes, the private household expenditure has dropped. He said people have stopped going out to restaurants, they're not going to cafes, as if that's all that's wrong with the economy. If that's all that Senator Cormann thinks is wrong with the economy, where we have a 7 per cent contraction in GDP, then we're in for some bumpy times. But I tell you what he gave away today was he predicted what the next steps in the government's response were going to be. Watch out for these words, adjust, new normal and a new baseline, because that's what Senator Cormann said today, that this is the new world. We're going to have to adjust to a new kind of Australia. And when he says that you need to adjust, he's saying to my children and their friends and people who have lost their jobs, the million of Australians who've lost their jobs, the 400,000 people who are set to lose their jobs before Christmas, what he's saying is get used to it. Get used to it. The Liberal National Party, the government of Australia, the one that goes out and tells you they're all about jobs and growth, well, they've got a new normal coming your way. They herald it today. Get ready for the adjustment. Get ready for the new normal. 
get ready for the new baseline, where you, people you care about in your family, are unemployed for a long time. And just to get you ready for that, we had Senator Rustin indicating that even though she has the powers, she's been given those powers by delegation, by legislation that went through this chamber and the other place earlier this year, she's been given powers to set the amount of money that is going to give, be given to Australians. She gave no hope, no heart, no succour to the troubled, the troubled world of Australians Thank you, Senator who are trying to balance time has their expired. books. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the response by Minister Birmingham to my question on early childhood education. And after that, Senator Wish Wilson will take note of the response to Minister Birmingham's um, quest, uh, question to PP11 and offshore drilling. Um, today is Early Childhood Educators Day, but I don't think it's that happy a day for the educators. The United Workers Union, representing early childhood educators, came to Parliament today to meet with the Education Minister and deliver to the Education Minister a petition signed by more than 30,000 people. The petition calls for the federal government to provide a wage guarantee to workers in early childhood education and care through COVID-19. The union says that the employment guarantee provided by the government doesn't prevent part-time staff and casuals from facing drastic cuts in hours. The vast majority of the sector is part-time or casual. There is no safety net. The government must commit to a wage guarantee for our critical early childhood educators and carers. Just this week, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, identified an overhaul of early learning as a key priority to supporting Australian women and for gender equality. Recent research from the ANU Menzies Centre for Health Governance and the Grattan Institute has also revealed the huge social and economic benefits of public investment to slash the cost of early learning, particularly for women. But after a brief reprieve with free childcare, most families are now back to paying expensive fees in the middle of a pandemic and a recession when people are doing it incredibly tough. The government is dragging its heels and refusing to commit to making our childcare system universally accessible. What we need is free early learning for every child and every family. What we need is proper funding so that educators can be fairly compensated for the essential work that they do. I urge this government to make sure that early childhood and education is universally accessible to every single family and that it is fee free. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Australia truly is a nation girthed by sea. Most of our people, most of our populations live on or near our coastlines. Australians love our beaches. We love our coastlines. It's such an important part of our culture. And Australians know that this government is out of touch if they continue to push ahead with risky offshore oil and gas drilling. Now, I asked Senator Birmingham why the member for McKellar, Mr Falinski, moved a motion in the House last week opposing offshore oil and gas drilling off the central coast in New South Wales. The reason he opposed is the PEP 11 licence renewal. The reason he moved that motion is because thousands of people in his electorate are rising up and getting in touch with him and saying, this is just madness. In a time of a climate emergency, why are you risking our oceans? Why are you releasing new acreage? Why are you letting a few profit-driven put our lifestyle at risk? We don't want to see seismic testing off our coastlines. We don't want to see oil and gas drilling. We don't want to see controversial, divisive industrial development when we go to the beach. And it's not just off Central Coast in New South Wales. We've seen tens of thousands of people right around the country before the last election paddle out at oceans and beaches around this country to say no to new drilling in the Great Australian Bight. And I asked 
Senator Birmingham also about the fishing industry. Well, he might think that I'm exaggerating when I tell him that the fishing industry in this country is up in arms about new acreage being issued for seismic testing and oil and gas drilling. But let me tell you what we discovered in our last hearing at our Senate inquiry into risky seismic testing. We heard that Tasmanian fishermen, commercial fishermen, were so desperate to stop this oil and gas drilling and this seismic testing in their productive fishery that they were prepared to blockade seismic boats. They were prepared to put their own fishing boats and their own bodies on the line. Now, Senator Birmingham, that sounds pretty desperate to me. We've had submissions from your home state from the tuna fishery. We've had submissions from the West Australian fishing industry, and we've heard evidence from the Victorian fishing industry already that they do not want to see more seismic testing in their fisheries. They're not happy with the process. They're not happy this is going ahead. Uh, you will be in for a rude shock if you don't listen to the Australian people on this most critical of issues. Order. Senator Wish Wilson, um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Ferravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for today, proposing the disallowance of the Competition and Consumer Industry Codes Dairy Regulations 2019. Senator Hanson Young. Mr President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move 1. That the Senate notes Adelaide Oval is a world-class stadium. South Australia has a long and passionate history as an AFL-loving state. Port Adelaide is currently at the top of the AFL ladder. Adelaide Crows fans were robbed in the inaugural AFLW Grand Final in 2017, which was held at the Gold Coast. South Australia has been COVID-free for months. Queenslanders have little appreciation for the support for the sport of AFL, and the AFL Grand Final should have been given to South Australia. I'm a Queenslander, Senator Hanson Young. Um, Senator Dunningham. Mr. President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, uh, I shall move that provisions of paragraphs five to eight of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills as set out in the list circulated in the chamber allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table the statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. I'll move in this case to government business motion number one. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Dunningham. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bill and move that this bill be ma uh, may proceed rather without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Senator Dunham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Government. Sorry, quite right. We went into notices of motion without doing to with um without doing postponements. So I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll call the clerk to notify of postponements. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill for today to the 3rd of September, and business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young for today to the 3rd of September. Committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 10 on today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now return to the discovery of formal business. I jumped the gun there and I'll come to 769 in the name of Senator Bragg. Is someone in a... Senator Dean um, Smith. Path. On behalf of Senator Bragg, I ask that general business notice of motion number 769 relating to the Sydney Harbour foreshore be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion. Senator Urquhart. Mr President, I seek leave to move an amendment. Is leave granted? 
leave is granted. Senator I move Ac the amendment as circulated in the chamber in the name of Senator McAllister. Um, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say. Oh, Senator. Oh, no, I'll do it after the amendment. The question is the, uh, that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher, you are seeking the call. Will you? Oh, okay. Okay. The question then is the motion. The question is the motion, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come, Senator O'Neill, to your matter? Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. And I ask the general business notice of motion number 770, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator O'Neill. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to franchising and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator O'Neill. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for the first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. For an act to amend the law relating to franchising and for related purposes. Senator O'Neill. President, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator O'Neill. I table an explanatory man memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McCarthy, number 771. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I inform the chamber that Senator Shikoni will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 771 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator McMahon. I need to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Morrison government is committed to helping the agricultural and horticultural industries in Australia to thrive. We are assisting growers to access the workers they need and ensuring the essential food supply sectors of the Australian economy are supported. In addition to employment services, the government supports targeted agricultural workforce programs such as the Seasonal Worker Program, Pacific Labor Scheme and Harvest Trail Services. A trial to bring up to 170 seasonal workers to Australia has been announced to assist with upcoming harvests in the Northern Territory. The cap of 170 workers was set by the Northern Territory government. We look forward to working with the government of Vanuatu on the trial. The question is the motion number 771 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young, number 772. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend uh, general business notice of motion number 7722, standing in my name. Um, it, it's, it has been circulated. The is amendment. leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask it, that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The ABC does an excellent job transmitting information to Australian communities during emergencies. The ABC, along with the entire media industry, plays a vital role in making sure the community is provided with timely and accurate news particularly in relation to nationally significant matters such as COVID-19 and the recent bushfires, something so vitally important in the regions. The ABC continues to be exempt from the government-wide efficiency dividend, and the ABC continues to receive secure funding over $1 billion a year over the triennium, rising each and every year. Senator Hanson Young. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is not granted. Leave is not granted. I understand the understanding is that the movers of motions are not given leave to make short statements. Um, the question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young as amendment to be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The results of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The matter is therefore negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions. Uh, could I come to 773 in the name of Senator Stirl? I assume that might be you, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 773 be taken as a formal Is motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The domestic retail sale of many Australian farm products is concentrated among a small number of businesses. Um, the ACCC has been tasked with taking a broad look at bargaining power imbalances throughout the supply chains including in the relationships between farmers, processors and major retailers. It's disappointing that Labor's economic policy continues to be drawn straight from One Nation's playbook. Intervention on prices would have a range of unintended consequences for our agricultural industries, including dairy. What is more effective is competition and a well-operating market. This allows farmers and other parts of the supply chain to shop around for the best price for the product that they supply. The question is that motion number 773 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we come to 774, please? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I inform the Chamber that Senators Polly Sheldon and Griff will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 774 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short leave statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The Australian Government acknowledges the significant contributions of Australians working in aged care during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have provided targeted support to the workforce during this time, including a retention bonus for care workers, grants to assist workers needing to work on single sites and additional funding for staffing needs. New staffing and funding models are currently being explored by the Royal Commission and work is progressing in the Department of Health about what the best model will be. The government will not preempt the findings of the Royal Commission. It's important to get the aged care model right. The question is that motion number 774 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 774 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell if the nose. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 22. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rennick, could I come to your matter number 775? Seven, seven, no. Notice of motion 775 relating to the new daily be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rennick. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. There's only one voice, Senator Rennick, looking at the whips. Um, order. Order. Urge. Senators to show some respect to their colleagues. It's not particularly be not 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 particularly becoming, quite frankly. Um, really? Um, can we move to 777 in the name of Senator Seward? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 777 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government is providing enhanced support to the Australian community through a three month extension of the coronavirus supplement to the 31st of December 2020. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Um, Labor um, won't be supporting this motion, and we note that the Greens have moved motions like this over the last fortnight and have used them to campaign against the Labor Party. My suggestion is, my suggestion, Order, Senator my suggestion is that the Greens and the Australian Labor Party work together to hold this government to account to increase a permanent rate to New Start and use the powers that the parliament has given them to determine the adequate rate of the coronavirus supplement. I think that would be a much better thing to do than get a short little buzz on Twitter by campaigning against your progressive 
uh, like you know, politics, the side of progressive Order, politics. But, um, but we think it's up to the government to determine the rate. We think the rate should be permanently increased, and we think the government needs to determine what the coronavirus supplement should be. Don't let them off the hook. Order. Senators McKimmett, Senator McKimmett, Senator Seawood, Senator Seawood, I called during question time for people to at least heed the chair. This is clearly what happens when people don't go home for the weekend. I put the motion that, that 777, motion 777 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop at the bells. The question is that motion 777 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 4, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Gallagher, number 778, in your name. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 778 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, to the contrary. Oh, sorry. Was someone on the TV seeking the call? Senator Roberts. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Senator Roberts, seeking leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I seek leave to make a short statement. Yes. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation will support this motion. A century ago, Australia had the world's highest per capita income. COVID exposed our slide-down rankings in terms of manufacturing and agriculture that gutted our economic sovereignty, economic independence, and security. Labor and Liberal Nationals think we need to get back to where we were in February this year. One Nation, though, has always called for a plan to provide an economic environment that drives Australian investment for Australian employers and Australian jobs, lasting, sustainable, secure jobs. A plan for investment in infrastructure to restore our productive capacity, 
dams for reliable water, coal-fired power stations to cut $1,300 from annual household electricity costs, household costs, Australian-owned transport, a plan for comprehensive tax reform to stop giving unfair advantage to foreign multinationals avoiding company tax, a plan for ex exist, ex exiting international agreements handicapping industry. Australians have the talent and deserve a plan. Question is, motion number 77, is someone else seeking the call on the screen? No. Okay. The question is that <laughs> it does, so the question is that motion 778 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 778 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 21. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator McMahon, could we come to your matter number 779? I'll give you a moment to go to a seat. You can use any seat. Senator McMahon. I ask that general business notice of motion number 779 relating to the Beedaloo Basin be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McMahon. I move the motion, standing in my name and in the names of Senators Mackenzie, Canavan, Davey and Macdonald. Senator Waters, I understand you're seeking leave to make a short statement? Yes, thank leave you, President. Leave is granted the for one minute. Thanks very much. Today's motion is brought to us on behalf of gas giants Santos and Origin who have collectively donated far more to the Liberals, the Nationals and Labor than they've ever paid in tax. If we allow fracking in the Beedaloo Basin, not only would it be some of the most expensive gas in a country full of expensive gas, but Australia may as well tear up the Paris Climate Agreement. This project would increase Australia's pollution by a whopping 6%. And even more if we measured actual leakages of toxic methane from gas fields in this country. Fracked gas is as dirty as coal. While COVID has driven Australia's emissions down to the lowest level in 22 years, gas pollution has risen to its highest ever level. Traditional owners, farmers, conservation groups and the Greens oppose these fracking plans in the strongest possible Order. terms. Senator of Waters, time dysfunction. for the statement has expired. Just looking at the screen, no one else is seeking the call. The question is that motion number 779 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. I, I've called it for the ayes. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie, sorry, Senator Seward. I just have the Greens objection noted, please. So done. Now, Senator Lambie, if you are uh, the Labor Party would also like the, the opposition's opposition to the motion recorded. Senator Lambie, business of the Senate matter number two, did you want this dealt with in this section or to fall to the debate later? I'll call Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. I um, just seek to postpone it until next day's sitting. So you need leave to uh, postpone. Uh, is leave granted? Leave. leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Lambie. That, looking at the clerk, concludes the discovery of formal business. So um, I'll ask senators who don't wish to remain for the next item to quietly leave the chamber.
I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 19 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Chisholm. Senator the Hon. Scott Ryan, President of Senate Parliament House, Canberra. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The government's failure to deliver on a plan for jobs and economic recovery while more than a million Australians are currently unemployed and a further 400,000 Australians will lose their jobs by Christmas. Yours sincerely, Anthony Chisholm. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This matter, goes before us, this matter before us goes to the core of government and leadership, that matter being government's failure to deliver on a plan for jobs and economic recovery while more than a million Australians are currently unemployed and a further 400,000 Australians will lose their jobs by Christmas. As of today, we had the news that Australia is officially in its first recession for almost 30 years, with the June quarter GDP numbers showing the economy went backwards by 7 per cent, the worst fall on record. That's more than three times the previous biggest fall of 2 per cent in 1974. The scale of this downturn is vast when compared to Australia's last official recession, where the economy shrank 1.3 and 0.1 per cent over two consecutive quarters. This is the single biggest immediate challenge that the Morrison government faces. The Australian people expect leadership on this matter, and they have not seen it to date. In fact, they have seen the opposite. In my home state of Tasmania, unemployment is disturbingly high. More than 50,000 Tasmanians looking for work or more hours, and Tasmania has lost 15,500 jobs since February. 6,700 of them are full-time jobs. Youth unemployment is frightening, and a deeply worrying number of mature age workers are also out of work or searching for many more hours. And because of the nature of this recession and the sectors that have been hardest hit, we have seen a disproportionate number of women thrown into unemployment. Deloitte Access Economics Business Outlook reports indicate Tasmania's economic situation is set to get worse before it improves. The report said Tasmania's earlier boom was driven largely by the international education and tourism sectors, and Tasmania was deeply exposed to the impacts of coronavirus-related travel and operating restrictions. And as JobKeeper payments are reduced, we will see the full force of that impact. Deloitte expects unemployment to rise in Tasmania to 8.6% in 2021. That means tens of thousands of Tasmanians unemployed and struggling, looking for a way forward, a way forward that government should be showing them. But what have we seen from this government? Instead of a jobs plan, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg want to wind back JobKeeper, cut super and freeze the pension. This recession will be deeper and unemployment queues will be longer because the Morrison government is leaving too many people behind. The trouble is we're dealing with a government struggling with its own ideological base, a government that is facing a backlash from its own backbench for spending the money that is keeping so many people in jobs. They were dragged kicking and screaming into providing wage subsidies through JobKeeper, and now they are like rabbits in the headlights. And all they can talk about is dropping the rate of JobKeeper and then phasing it out. It is inevitable that this recession will be deeper and unemployment queues will be longer because the Morrison government is just leaving those people behind. We have seen ACOS warning of a social and economic cat uh, cat catastrophe once most COVID-19 government supports are actually then removed. And that process will start later this month. Tens of thousands of businesses with their workforce sustained on JobKeeper are looking to the government for the next steps. 
On the west coast of Tasmania, 41 per cent of businesses applied for JobKeeper support. In Burnie, 39.4 applied, and in Devonport, 40.1 per cent. And on the east coast of Tasmania, over 51 per cent applied, over half. That's how very serious the situation is. Last night I spoke in this place about the impact of the COVID crisis on northwest Tasmania. I spoke about the viable businesses that cannot recover until tourism and travel restart and borders reopen, like the car hire company on King Island or the magnificent <coughs> Cape Wickham golf course on the northern tip of that island. They represent just one sector, sector that needs a plan. All, all cutting job people will do for employers of businesses like those is make it even harder to pay their bills and buy food. And without a plan for jobs, that money being stripped out of local economies will be disastrous. There are many businesses in a similar situation on King Island, hundreds like that in northwest Tasmania and tens of thousands in our country, absolutely viable and waiting for coronavirus restrictions to ease. But it will take a plan for them to truly spring to life again. All of this happening against a backdrop of increasing inequality presided over by this government, the Morrison government. Before COVID hit, according to research released by ACOS and the University of New South Wales today, the incomes of those in the top 20 per cent were six times higher than those in the bottom 20 per cent. This is worse than in 2015-16, when the ratio was five times. So just a tip for those struggling for ideas opposite. Your plan needs to address this growing inequality. It needs to have a focus on long-term secure jobs with decent wages. But instead of working on this plan, Prime Minister Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg want to wind back JobKeeper, cut super and freeze the pension. This government is busy shirking its duties. It's so busy avoiding accountability in this area still dreaming of some kind of magical snapback to the way things were, hoping they'll wake up and this has all been a terrible dream. Well, I have news. This is not a bad dream. It is the new reality for Australia, and hundreds of thousands of Australians are terribly, terribly frightened that they have no future, that they won't find work, that their businesses won't be able to recover and that their kids will never have a decent, secure job. They need to know you have a plan, a plan for jobs, a plan that protects and boosts vital bus viable businesses and their employees, a plan that helps people in less viable businesses refocus and innovate, a plan to retrain and reskill, a plan that shakes up grasping and falling job service provider networks, a plan that turns Centrelink into a safe place where the skilled staff who suffered under this government's policy and punishment ethic can now show their real skills in helping people navigate the system and pointing them in the direction of opportunities and support. A plan that works with school leavers, TAFE and university graduates to identify work opportunities and move towards them. A plan for arts and entertainment. A plan for the university sector that doesn't involve making university degrees unaffordable, a plan for mature age workers who have joined the unemployment queues in their thousands to support them back into work, and a plan for women and a plan for young workers, a plan to help people who have drained their superannuation counts rebuild their retirement savings, a plan that is developed sector by sector, taking into account the subtlety and needs of each one, a plan for tourism a plan for hospitality, a plan for manufacturing, a plan for communications, a plan for energy, a plan for early childhood education and a plan for aged care, for skills and education and a plan for primary industry. Let's see that plan for jobs and industry from this government before the toe-cutters get to work on JobKeeper. This government is at the crossroads now. You can have a vision for healing this company for developing real jobs and addressing inequality, or you can continue on with your pathetic, pathetic ragtag, piecemeal band-aid approach, bickering amongst yourselves about ideology and watch this recession 
this new reality deepen and worsen and go on for longer than it needs to. I say to the members opposite, you have so much work to do. It's time you got on with it. And I said last night in this place to this dysfunctional gathering on the other side, you have shown the country that you are spectacularly good at breaking things. You've already broke Centrelink and you absolutely broke aged care. You have punished the unemployed, lumbered with them illegal debts, disrespected them, kept them in abject poverty, and now our economy is broken. And people's hearts and lives are breaking as they face years without work and the poverty that ensues. As others face the demise of businesses, they have dedicated their working lives to building. And as they face their children joining unemployment queues and facing despair, it's well past time for you, the Morrison government, to demonstrate to the Australian people that you are up to the job, you are capable of fixing it, and that you have a plan for the future of Australia, a well thought out plan that encaptures and picks up all the people along the way. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. S Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, <clears throat> Madam Acting Deputy President, we have uh, seen today, seen today confirmed what we really all knew, that uh, the, the global pandemic that has smashed the world economy has not left Australia untouched. Uh, uh, our economic uh, situation uh, is uh, almost as dire as it has ever been, uh, thanks to this uh, global pandemic, which has shut down international travel, uh, which has uh, called for the need for serious restrictions on uh, Australian businesses. And of course, that is going to lead to a significant economic decline. And, and very unfortunately, uh, some people who uh, have lost their jobs. Uh, very, very many people have lost their jobs in the last few months uh, in this country uh, because of this pandemic. Now, all sides of politics here, all, all were uh, calling uh, for a level of restrictions. In fact, the, uh, the calls for restrictions and lockdowns were probably louder coming from the other side of the chamber. And it seems to me today that those making complaints about the economic situation don't seem to be linking it back or referring back to the fact that they were very loud in calling for, for a lockdown, calling for restrictions to be placed on Australian businesses, calling for restaurants to close, uh, for tourism to shut down. Well, uh, guys, the, it's pretty clear that when you shut down businesses, when you make people locked down in their own homes, there are going to be people who lose jobs. There are going to be businesses that are put out, uh, back, uh, go out the back door. Uh, and unfortunately, that has been the consequence of what we have had to do. Now, it does make it important that we uh, work hard. Today's figures show very clearly it's very important that we work hard and cooperatively across all of Australia uh, to reopen our economy as soon as we can, because the best way of getting people back into a job is to get back uh, to, the, to, to an open economy as soon as we can. So I very much hope later this week that premiers drop all this ridiculous political state of origin they seem to be playing and work together uh, to get those jobs going back. That's the most desperate thing we need. In the long term, in the long term how are we going to create jobs uh, here in this country? Uh, how are we going to try to rekindle our labour markets to, to, to grow and people to get back into work? Well, it's pretty clear it's going to have to come through the private sector. That's where the jobs have been lost. There hasn't been jobs lost in the, in the public sector. And there's only a limited amount that the public sector can employ at any one time. It's going to have to come from uh, providing confidence uh, for, to private businesses in this country uh, to reinvest uh, in the economy, to re-employ people, to grow their businesses. That's what we're going to need. And we're going to need the confidence uh, uh, in businesses to make those hiring decisions. And how are we going to do that? Well, to give businesses, if you want to give businesses confidence to do those sort of things, you make it easier for them to do business. It's not rocket science. We make it easier for people to do business. They will do more business, they will employ more people, and we'll be able to get back on our feet sooner rather than later. So it's a pretty simple recipe. We should be uh, focusing on things like lowering taxes. We should be focusing on things like getting rid of red tape on businesses so they can employ people and set up businesses, and we should be investing in infrastructure that can help grow our economy and provide returns. Now, on every one of those fronts, on every one of those fronts, the Australian Labor Party the last few years has been an absolute barrier to achieving those aims and ends. An absolute barrier. 
And so let's just remind people of all the history of the past few years uh, that pre the coronavirus, what did the Australian government wanted to do? We wanted to lower taxes. We wanted to lower uh, company taxes. We wanted to lower personal income taxes. And the Labor Party has opposed various measures of those right through the last few years. In fact, they opposed the company tax measures completely. Didn't want to make, didn't want to put lower taxes on businesses. And now they come to this place and say we should create jobs. Well, well if we had lowered taxes, we'd be in a much better position to create jobs. But the Labor Party opposed that. And on personal income taxes, they've, been, they've opposed various, uh, various forms, very various measures that were put in place to lower personal income taxes as well. So maybe, maybe we'll see the Labor Party reconsider its position on these things, on taxes, but I didn't hear any of that from the previous contribution. didn't hear one mention of the word tax in that previous contribution. And so if you're not going to lower taxes, how are you going to create jobs? The other way we could make business be easier in this country is to lower red tape, get rid of regulation. Another thing I didn't hear uh, from Senator Urquhart, are we going to, is the Australian Labor Party now going to support efforts to take off regulation off the backs of Australian businesses and unlock their potential and hope for the Australian economy. Because again, over the past few years, the Australian Labor Party has consistently opposed in this place though with these attempts. There's a test right now on the notice paper. Right now there's a test for the Australian Labor Party. We want to, we want to make it easier for projects to be approved in this country. We want, we want to make it uh, simpler and easier uh, for those who want to invest in this country. Uh, to achieve approval under our environmental laws uh, here in Canberra and at the state level. In fact, it's the exact reforms or very similar reforms to what we put in this place after the 2013 election. After the 2013 election, we were elected on a platform to establish a one-stop shop so that environmental approvals in this country could just be done at one level and there's not the duplication and potentially delay that occurs uh, for people who just want to create jobs in this nation. We were elected with that mandate. And what did the Australian Labor Party do? After the 2013 election, they teamed up with their mates in the Greens. It's basically a Greens Labor Party in this place now. They're basically in coalition with each other. The Greens Labor Party joined together to oppose that, re that regular re reduction in regulation. And we have seen environmental approval times blow out over the past five years. The Productivity Commission report released earlier this year, actually right after the coronavirus started, showed that, uh, that it was taking around two years to get approval for a major project. It's now over three. It's now over a thousand days to get something approved. So we're going to come back. We're going to come back and try and get that reduction red tape. And I haven't seen yet. I haven't heard what the Australian Labor Party's position is. I don't believe they've completely rejected it yet. So let's hope. Let's hope in this post environment, where the Labor Party comes in with MPIs, with matters of public importance here on the notice paper, saying they want to create jobs and they want a jobs plan. Well, here you go, guys. Here's a plan. Here's a plan to cut red tape, increase, uh, uh, decrease the time it takes to get things approved, create jobs. Are you going to approve it? Are you going to, provide, are you going to agree to it? We don't know yet. We don't know. And the Labor Party's also opposed, even in the last couple of weeks, investments in infrastructure. We saw this week the Labor Party stand up and try and stop investments in coal-fired power here in this country. Another election commitment that was made by the, the federal government last year, the Labor Party trying to knock it off, trying to knock off that investment that's being uh, put forward by a traditional owner company in North Queensland. Labor Party again teaming up with the Greens, teaming up with their mates in the Greens, trying to knock that off. And the Labor Party has also been opposed to dams being built in this country as well. That's a real key thing we can do as a nation to create jobs, unlock our water resources, uh, invest in our agricultural capacities and create jobs in farming again. Again, that's something that the Labor Party has been opposed to. And look, I did hear the one thing I heard from uh, Senator Urquhart that I I did agree with is, is uh, let's get back to manufacturing. It was a brief mention. It was very brief about uh, let's have a plan for manufacturing. We do need that. We desperately need that. But that is not going to happen unless we reduce energy prices. So we need the Australian Labor Party to break. We need them to listen to, to, to Mr Fitzgibbons in their side, uh, listen to those that have common sense about energy because they're divided over things like coal and gas. And if we're not going to use our natural resources like coal and gas, we will not get back to making things. The US is getting back to making things. They're doing it. They're bringing jobs back to the United States. How are they doing it? Because they're using their natural resources. They're unlocking their gas resources of the Permian Basin in Texas, and that is driving their country ahead. But the Labor Party hasn't quite worked out yet whether they're going to support that plan that we've got to get manufacturing going again. I've been working with my Nationals colleagues as well to do more uh, to, to rekindle our manufacturing industries, I think. A number of us think we should do more. Uh, we should look. Uh, to take greater countervailing action against countries that abuse the international trading system, including the People's Republic of China, who are currently subsidising 
the export of pesticides from their country. We need to look into that so we save uh, the new farm factory in Melbourne. We should be looking uh, to set up a, a development bank again in this country to help support manufacturing uh, industries, and we should be looking to provide investment allowances and lower taxes for those who expend and invest in manufacturing in this country. Those are all forward-thinking things that we should be looking at. And I hope the Australian Labor Party brings forward those sort of practical ideas that leave their leave their, their partnership with the Greens at the door, because all I heard there before in terms of what they think should be done, the only real cogent thing I heard from Senator Urquhart in her contribution was that we need to keep JobKeeper going. And, and the support we provided through, through JobKeeper has been absolutely essential, but it is not a long-term plan for jobs. Uh, it cannot be sustained for much longer at the cost of roughly $10 billion a month in recent months. It is not a plan to keep jobs on life support forever. You cannot keep someone on life support forever. We need to look beyond that and we need the Labor Party to look seriously. Are they going to be, and is the Australian people going to believe that the Labor Party, who are at lockstep with the Labor Environmental Activist Network that's founded by Senator McAllister over there, are they going to team up with us to lower taxes, lower regulation, invest in nation building infrastructure like dams? Well, I don't believe it and I don't think the Australian people believe it either. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to the debate on the government's failure to, find a, uh, to deliver a plan for jobs and economic recovery. While more than a million Australians are currently unemployed and a further 400,000 Australians will lose their jobs by Christmas, um, they sort of have a plan. That is to trash the environment, trash universities and students' chances of going to university and um, while they're fostering a fossil fuel gas-led so-called recovery, which of course it won't. That is not a plan. That is the road to disaster for both people and our planet. While the government seems to be willing to stop at nothing in order to achieve that, we are deeply concerned that they are condemning Australians to live in poverty come September. What will life look like for the millions of Australians after the rate of coronavirus supplement is cut by $300 a fortnight at the end of September and then no plan for what happens after December? People don't know what happens after December. It could go to $40 a day after December. An additional, sorry, an additional 740,000 people are going to be pushed into poverty come the end of September, because once that $300 is cut from the coronavirus supplement, it takes that payment below the poverty line. The poverty rates for people on JobSeeker and Youth Allowance will return to 23 per cent. 1.1 million children will be living in households where their income support payments are cut. More than 400,000 Victorians will have their income support payments reduced. People will be pushed into rental stress and default on their mortgages. And what does that do to our economy? I'll tell you what, it sends it into a nosedive. When you take that money out of our economy, you're into a nosedive. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, today's national accounts are devastating news for Australians and for the Australian economy. Uh, Senator Canavan said, uh, there are no great surprises there, but they are indeed uh, very bad news. A 7 per cent fall in economic activity, the biggest on record, the biggest contraction since the Great Depression. A million people unemployed now, circa one and a half million people unemployed by Christmas. So record unemployment now, getting much worse by the time we get to Christmas. Likely unemployment circa 10 per cent and no prospects of a real recovery until 2022. Uh, that's the picture outlined uh, and I want to give a clear outline of uh, my view and the Labor view that reflects our priorities, our values. And I, I think that the government's response reflects their priorities and their values. Firstly, the economy, the Australian economy, was in deep trouble in 2019. Profound structural weaknesses uh, neglected by this government, glossed over by this government. Uh, no growth in wages, falling, 
productivity, uh, anemic levels of growth, a hollowing out of the labour market so there were no good jobs left anymore, just casual jobs being produced in the economy, and a decline in Australia's capacity to make things, and a decline in our export complexity. And this, the response of the government at the beginning of this year, slow and uncertain, that has made things much, much worse today than they should be. The government's focus at the beginning of the stimulus package that they were dragged to, kicking and screaming. I know that the Prime Minister said today in question time, I didn't hesitate to implement JobKeeper and JobSeeker. He said, I didn't hesitate. Well, the, what he said was that he was reported as saying, I'm not going to have a bar of it. Uh, they were still desperately trying to keep their back in black surplus promise. Uh, there is a big gap between what the government says they did in March and what they actually did, because I was here making the argument, along with my Labor colleagues, for a fair income stimulus package, for a wage subsidy package that would keep Australian workers and their businesses connected. And I remember the howls of derision and the outright rejection that came from the other side of this parliament. And the jobs crisis is being made much, much worse now and will be much, much worse than it should be because there is no jobs plan from this government. And we know what the impact of long-term unemployment is, particularly in our regions and our suburbs. And people over the other side may not feel it and they may not see it and they may not be able to empathise with the impact of long-term unemployment, but on this side of the chamber we do. Now, the government's management of this economic crisis looks an awful lot like their management of the aged care system. The political strategy, at least, is identical. We all know that the coronavirus pandemic will have a very significant effect on global growth. The World Bank says a contraction of around about 5.2 per cent. But the government there today, Senator Cormann, blame the pandemic, blame the states, blame anybody else but themselves, minimise the role of government, minimise the responsibility of government, possibly because they can't imagine government having a role in dealing with this crisis. Duck accountability, avoid parliament. Uh, that's been a key feature of this government's political response this year. Avoid the parliament, run from accountability in the parliament, and then make a series of announcements with no delivery. You can take the marketing manager out of Tourism Australia, but you will never take the marketing bias out of this Prime Minister. Now, there are big challenges coming with the coronavirus pandemic. The, the, the wave of infections in Victoria illustrates that we are all vulnerable. All parts of Australia are vulnerable. Now, the crisis in Victoria has occasioned a whole lot of cheap point scoring from the other side of this chamber. There are senators on the other side of the chamber, Mr Acting Deputy President, who are for open borders one week and closed borders the next, uh, who are decrying public health uh, requirements one day, demanding them the next. This hyper-politicisation of the crisis is a key feature of why this government is unable to deal with, unable to manage, unable to find a plan for the Australian economy and for Australian jobs. It's pretty straightforward. Follow the health advice, roll your sleeves up, do some work, develop a credible plan that can lift the Australian economy out of the torpor 
that it's in. And, Mr. and Senator Canavan over the other side really did set out, I think, the government's position. Cut taxes, cut wages, cut red tape, which he means, I think, just remove environmental protections, cut services like their 2014, 2015, 2016 budgets all did, particularly in aged care funding. Uh, these are the people who have adopted, as the, tre the Treasurer said, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher as their role models. Now contrast that with what the Australian government did in 2008, 2009, when the global economy contracted by nearly 3 per cent because of the global financial crisis. Strong early action, going households, going hard, going early, delivering confidence, and the Australian economy did not contract over that period. Now, what are Australian families to make of this? No prospect of recovery with this government until 2022. Families who can't keep their heads above water now, job keeper, job seeker being cut, the prospect of looming unemployment, when will they have a government that's in their corner that backs them, that backs Thank Australians you, and is capable of doing the right thing? Give the call to Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you so much, Senator Ayres. I haven't had a chuckle like that for a while. And to be honest, the fact that you could deliver that with a straight face uh, was really quite extraordinary. So this week and last week, I've responded to some pretty ridiculous accusations from Labor. Labor has consistently made claims about the Morrison government that are not only blatantly hypocritical, they are blatantly false, uh, and as like we just heard from Senator Ayres, it's sometimes even a little bit entertaining. But the absolute gall demonstrated by Labor in this parliament today is as unprecedented as the times we now face as a country. The bumbling, stumbling, inadequately woeful opposition whose handling of this crisis in Labor-led states is destroying businesses and is directly contributing to job losses. Now, we know Labor is not about job creation. They're not about the private sector. They're all about making sure that the socialists left within their party are being looked after, the magic pudding that somehow will just keep giving and giving and giving. Not about supporting workers, not about supporting economic growth and job creation. But yet all they can do is, ma is accuse the Morrison government of not doing enough to maintain jobs in this country. They should be ashamed of themselves supporting strategies that of not supporting strategies that do that support Australian workers. No wonder even the unions are walking away from Labor. And Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, why wouldn't Labor be getting desperate? Why wouldn't they want to distract the Australian public from their mishandling of, of this crisis under pressure? It takes real leadership to prevail. So they want to talk about jobs. Awesome. Let's talk about jobs. There have been no relaxation of restrictions in Queensland where tourism and hospitality businesses are going to the wall. Now, I probably should in, you know, make sure that I do cover off that restrictions are being relaxed in Queensland if you're a footballer. Restrictions are relaxed if you're Danny Minogue or a celebrity. And restrictions are relaxed if you're working on some TV show that's currently a hotspot or you're Eddie Maguire. Of course they're relaxed because you know, we know Labor love to suck up to their celebrities as, as much as they possibly can. So of course we're talking about everyday Australians. We're talking about for people that live on the New South Wales border that are so deeply impacted by these restrictions. The fact that 80 per cent of tourism to the Gold Coast is generated from Victoria and New South Wales, yet Premier Palaszczuk, in a bid to protect her own job, is destroying the jobs of all of those hospitality and tourism workers on the Gold Coast. 
So let's have a look at some of the other figures because perhaps they're not fully understood by those opposite. So tourism and hospitality, it actually drives and is one of the most labour-intensive sectors and therefore creates more jobs. Again, guys, for your benefit, it creates more jobs in the private sector, more than any other sector, uh, for every dollar spent. And so what happened in April of this year when it comes to overnight spending, how much money was spent in the hospitality and tourism sector in April 2020 compared to April uh, 2019? We saw that the spend was 91 per cent down. Only 9 per cent of the previous year what was spent in April occurred in 2020. Now, as we started to see restrictions relax, things did improve a little bit. Things came back ever so slightly, but so that they were only down in May 82 per cent. But then we get Premier Palaszczuk who's now blocked it all off and shutting down this industry and absolutely refusing to support what would have been considered probably a pretty big uh, part of the economy in Queensland, I would have thought. You know, the, the whole expression, beautiful one day, perfect the next, whereas it's beautiful one day, paradise lost the next. Certainly for all those small business owners in the tourism and hospitality sectors. So the issue is also not just for those in the tourism and hospitality sector. It's not just the hotels and it's not just the restaurants. Tourism sector is bigger than that. It's also about the travel agents, the petrol stations, the road houses. It's also about the shops in airports and all of those businesses that are so desperately impacted by the closure of the hospitality and tourism industry. But so why is it? Why would these restrictions be so tight? In areas where there are no COVID infections, some businesses are closed, some are boarded up, workers are at home, and as each week passes, they are less likely to have a job to return to. We should be all working together to ensure that our nation is able to stop the virus and maintain jobs. I realise that might be like walking and chewing gum for the opposite side, something they're probably not uh, looking at one of their top 10 skill sets, but it uh, be worth giving it a go at some point. But of course, the best that Labor premiers can do is stubbornly maintain a series of poor positions, purely designed for political gain, definitely not about preserving jobs. And in that dictatorship of the Republic of Palaszczuk, she won't even let the sick and dying go to her hospitals, hospitals for Queenslanders. Wonder if she's thinking about giving any of that federal money that's been spent on those, those hospitals that are for all Australians. But of course, she would prefer to see the death of an unborn twin that possibly risk her career. What chance do the tourism operators have? The hotels, the restaurants, the bars, and the store, opens, uh, uh, store owners and other businesses now have in this great tourism state. Businesses along the coast and in regional areas, zero trade. No tourists, no business, no jobs to return to. But now we learn that she's even refusing to talk to the New South Wales Premier. And I will come to Premier Dan Andrews and what's happening in Victoria and why ultimately I think the second wave there is uh, fundamentally responsible for a big drop in our economic downturn. But, you know, Anastasia Palaszczuk is not going to let Dan outdo her. Premier Andrews is working constructively with Premier Berejiklian, increasing the exclusion zone around the borders, ensuring that health treatment is accessible and ensuring that teachers and kids at school who live two or three k's from a border are able to cross over and attend school and participate in a learning environment. Not our friend Anastasia won't even talk to the Premier of New South Wales. A little bit frightening considering you consider the success that New South Wales is having when it's uh, looking at contact tracing. Be a pretty good idea, I would say, for Premier Palaszczuk to pick up the phone to Gladys. But I will come back to Victoria, and it is Premier Andrews, uh, who's certainly uh, doing his best to emanate mousy tongue at the moment, handling of this pandemic that's costing our nation billions every week and putting the future and likelihood of its workers on the line. So competent leaders don't just manage the pandemic. It's a delicate balancing act requiring intelligent and measured decision-making. 
Decision making needs to be focused on problem areas that they occur so that Australian lives and jobs are protected. So Premier Andrews failed to focus on the importance when quarantining Australians returning from overseas in a hotel in Melbourne. And sadly, poor management and poor leadership has cost Victoria a great deal. The number of lives that have been lost is now tragically documented daily. The lack of measured focus has cost Victorians a great deal. And in fact, today, I've been contacted by the Restaurants and Catering Association, incredibly concerned with the restrictions that the Victorian government is seeking to impose on businesses there. I mean, the discussion around allowing only outdoor dining. I mean, Premier Andrews, come on, it's Melbourne. You don't quite have the harbour of Sydney nor the fabulous weather. Who's going to want to sit outside? You are destroying business, Premier Andrews, and you need to apologise for Victorians for the way that you have handled this. There's a word called sorry. You might want to use it at some point. <sighs> Labor's destroying jobs in the country. They're mishandling the health crisis we now face, and they should not be suggesting that this government's failing to protect Australians. Caring about Australians should come first. Australian businesses and jobs have taken absolute precedence under our incredibly competent leaders, Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Treasurer Joff Frydenberg. And both of them are doing their utmost to rebuild our economy while working in tandem with our incredibly competent and steady Health Minister Greg Hunt as he works to bring COVID patient numbers under control and save Australian lives. Thank God for their leadership to counteract the incompetence of Labor's state performers who are now directly contributing Hughes, to the decline of jobs in this Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, Senator Chisholm proposes that we discuss the government's failure on jobs and economic recovery. Well, I'm not sure this government has actually failed, given these unprecedented times. Certainly there have been mistakes and missteps. But I don't believe we can lay the blame for this recession solely on the feet of this government. No country affected by COVID-19 has escaped recession. But Australia has done comparatively well, outperforming most other developed countries in the last quarter. Nonetheless, we are in recession. And state and federal governments must work together rather than attack each other, which is a very commonplace activity particularly in recent weeks. The path back to growth starts with reopening domestic borders and keeping them open. And many speakers have already actually said exactly the same thing. I accept that the lockdowns were necessary in the early stages. They were almost, in fact, they were critical in the early stages to ensure the pandemic was uh, not going to spread to the extent that it did in other countries. But as other cases, or as cases decline, state governments need to unlock their economies. They need to let businesses operate, let them serve customers, let them hire staff and scale up their operations. To get back to growth, we need to mobilise our population. We need to get people out of their homes and doing the ordinary, going for coffee, taking holidays, visiting local shops and regaining the confidence to spend the money they have been frightened into hoarding. Once that happens, we will have a clear review of the economy. We will be able to see which industries are in trouble and where support may be appropriate. So I call on all states to open up so we can rebuild the economy and our collective resilience. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President, uh, well, this year has been tough, tough for those who've lost their jobs, tough for the businesses that have closed, tough for our essential workers. And this government is not delivering for those who are doing it tough. It is too focused on the press releases and it is not focused on the details. We need to get this recovery right, a recovery that focuses on rebuilding good, secure jobs, a recovery that works for all Australians. And we need the plan for this recovery right now. Why? Why right now? Because a million Australians are unemployed, because 1.5 million Australians can't find enough work, and because another 400,000 Australians are predicted to lose their jobs by Christmas. That is a lot of people relying on this government, the Morrison government, to deliver a plan for jobs 
now. And let's talk about today. Today, the national accounts have recorded Australia's biggest ever fall in GDP, and we are in the worst recession in almost 100 years, a recession that will be deeper uh, and it will be longer if the government decides to leave people behind. So what is the Prime Minister's plan for Australians who've lost their jobs, who fear losing their jobs, who are leaving school in just a few months' time and are looking to this government for some hope for their future? Is it a plan to boost manufacturing? No. Is it a plan for big nation-building infrastructure? No. Is it a plan to create more secure jobs? No. No. It's a plan to cut people's incomes and support. To cut people's incomes and support. A plan to cut JobKeeper and JobSeeker while people are still struggling and while they are looking for some hope from this government. Australia is in the worst recession since the Great Depression, but this still isn't enough for the government to deliver a jobs plan. Australians need the government's help to get back on their feet. They need a plan for jobs, not a plan to cut their income. And we've all heard the stories. The employer, a small factory who had 200 applications for one job in 48 hours. And we've seen the stats. There's at least 13 job hunters per job vacancy right now. But earlier this week, the government insisted that people need to re-engage with the workforce. You can only re-engage with the workforce when there are jobs there to re-engage with. So the Prime Minister needs to stop with the slogans and deliver a real plan, a plan that delivers what this government promises, because he is pretty big on announcements. I'll give him that. But he is small when it comes to delivery. This government has promised $314 billion in support to Australians. Sounds good, right? But the government has delivered a quarter of this. A quarter. And how about their plan to support small business? $40 billion promised. Also sounds pretty good. How much of that has been delivered? Do you want to take a guess? 5 per cent. 5 per cent. What is the government waiting for? What are you waiting for? We are in the worst recession in 100 years. We have a million people unemployed and 1.5 million people unemployed, underemployed. What are you waiting for? Now would be a good time to deliver what you've promised. Now would be the right time to make good on all of your string of announcements that you've put forward, because these failures to deliver are costing jobs now. And let me say, because it seems that you need to hear it on the government benches, is that a real jobs plan does not include bashing the Victorian Premier, Dan Andrews, into easing restrictions too early. Victorians see straight through this. They're doing it really tough right now. But they know, we know, that the current restrictions are what's needed to keep the COVID numbers down. And we don't want it to be for nothing. So beating up on the Victorian Premier to open up, despite the health advice, is not a jobs plan. It's a distraction. You know it's a distraction, and you know that it is a dangerous distraction. I'll tell you what Victorians actually want. They want a real plan from the Morrison government for jobs. That's what they want. They want backup and support from the Morrison government. So here's some ideas. How about rebuilding and revitalising Australian manufacturing? How about getting started on some big transformative infrastructure projects, projects that will actually improve people's lives and deliver jobs? And how about reversing the decline in job security that you have presided over for the last seven years of your government? Seven years of insecure work under this government. And no plan from you, no plan prior to the pandemic, let alone now, to rebuild secure jobs in this country. No plan to get wages moving, even prior to the pandemic. And what the pandemic has shown is that it's too often our most essential workers who are actually in the most insecure work. And we've relied on them in this pandemic to get us through. 
And what they need is much more than our thanks. They need to see change. Today is Early Childhood Educators Day, and we need to celebrate the amazing work that they've done. These essential workers have been there for families throughout this crisis, but the government hasn't been there for them. They cut them off JobKeeper three days before they said they wouldn't be cutting anyone off JobKeeper. Early childhood educators are the people that you decided to cut off JobKeeper. And then you did nothing to secure their jobs during Victoria's stage four lockdown. One Victorian educator, Kerry, put it best, referring to the Prime Minister. She said, he treats us with contempt and shows us no respect. And I know that many aged care workers feel the same. They've faced appalling conditions and their calls have been ignored. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I thank Senator Walsh for her contribution. For once in this sitting fortnight, once a Labor senator has actually mentioned the name Dan Andrews. That is the Premier of Victoria. Now, why have they been hiding from mentioning this up until now? Well, I can tell you why. 19,000 cases of COVID, 500 odd deaths in Victoria. That is why Premier Dan Andrews has failed Victorians and crushed the economy. Now, how did he do this, you ask me? How did he do this? I know Senator Derez is very keen to learn all about this because his great state, New South Wales, and Senator Keneally's great state in, uh, of New South Wales have managed to avoid this. They did this. Uh, yes, Senator Keneally. I would just draw to your attention that it is not appropriate under the standing orders to refer to senators who are in or out of the chamber uh, in your remarks. Withdraw. Happily withdraw. Thank so you, no Mayor. need to, to, to mention my good friends across the chamber, other than to say that they've been absolutely silent on the devastation that Premier Andrews has wrought in Victoria. How did he do it? He failed to lock down quarantine. Now, when you have a pandemic, there's four things that you can do. You can keep it out of your, your community, and you do that through quarantine. You can make sure, if it's in the community, that you can test for it and trace it. He's failed to do that. You can lock it down. Now, that's the one trick that he's found. The one trick pony, Premier Andrews, that's all he's been able to do is lock down Victoria and crush jobs. Every day I get phone calls from businesses that have lost their livelihoods, that have managed to get through stage three, and managed to get through stage three nearly six months of lockdown, but then stage four comes on. We're at five weeks of stage four now, with a week to go, and still no plan to get Victoria out of it. You guys are carrying on about a plan. Well, what about a plan to get Victoria and start jobs again, to get those restaurants open, to get coffees going again, to get businesses, retail businesses open again? We hear nothing of that. So, this government believes in supporting business. We believe in building Australia's capability for the future, and this government believes in removing red tape so that businesses, especially those small businesses that have been crushed by Premier Andrews in the state of Victoria, can grow and create jobs. And you ask about our plans. Well, over $300 billion of economic support package has kept this economy alive. When you compare it to all the economies across the, the world, Ours comes out one of the best. JobKeeper and JobSeeker, over $118 billion. Support, cash flow support for small businesses, $32 billion. Skills and apprenticeships programs, $2.8 billion. Infrastructure building, including $680 million for home builder grants. So there is plenty in that. And then you look back into my first week in parliament, where we delivered $167 billion in tax cuts. We've seen how that supported business. Where was Labor on those? Well, they finally came over this side to vote for it after being dragged kicking and screaming there. This shows that we're moving ahead with building a stronger Australia. This is the biggest investment in emergency economic relief by any Australian government and represents approximately 15 per cent of Australia's GDP. 
Even today in this place, the government is trying to move legislation to ensure that big business follows government's lead in paying suppliers on time or paying interest if they don't. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, unlike Labor's past with their failed and deadly pink bat scheme, their rorted school hall spending, this government is focusing on what will build more jobs and a more prosperous Australia. Unlike Labor's past, the coalition is committed to making small businesses' lives easier because we understand that they are the lifeblood of the economy. Now, Labor occasionally discovers small business exists when it's politically, politically expedient to do so, but at the last election, Labor did not offer small businesses any policies to access more finance, nothing about cutting red tape, nothing about improvement paying ta payment times or reducing taxes. In fact, the only thing Labor offered small business at the election were more taxes, more costs and less business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, most people will know me in, in this chamber as someone who is quite expert at getting access to documents that the government doesn't really want you to see. And so I'm going to have to call Senator Chisholm out and say that uh, he's wrong that the government doesn't have a plan because I managed to get hold of it. And it's here. And uh, it's even got a plan B. There's nothing written on it. But nonetheless, that's, that's their plan. Look, seriously, I think that uh, I, I think the government I think the government has done a reasonable job working its way through COVID. I'm not going to take uh, anything away. There are mistakes and and there are areas where we can do better. But that's a management function. It's not a leadership function. We do need a plan laid out that basically tells us how the government intends to move forward over the next five to ten years, because that's what it's going to take to re to recover from. Uh, what's happened to us. Uh, Senator Van stood up and gave uh, examples of spending money. Anyone can spend money. much harder to spend money wisely and in a targeted manner uh, that seeks to do the very thing that Senator Chisholm uh, suggests, and that is to have a plan to create a, a number of jobs. I wanna, I'd like to see something that comes out and says that we are going to uh, direct local uh, government money uh, locally for a local uh, economic benefit. So we should be using our procurement budget. We should be uh, assisting companies with R&D so they can generate IP, uh, not just to build things here, but to export. We should be uh, uh, building up our manufacturing base, not just for uh, jobs, but also for resilience, because that's something we've learnt out of COVID, that we, 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 f we fell short in that area. And uh, we also need to be doing value add, not just exporting our rocks. There's multinational tax avoidance, another way to get money into this country. Lots of things we can do. Please put out the plan, a coherent plan, so we can see what you're going to do. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This government doesn't care about workers. They don't care about the economy. They don't care about protecting the planet for future generations. Their vision for the future is one of low wages, of job insecurity, and of profits over people. They want to use the COVID-19 crisis to enrich their corporate donors and fight culture wars and not much else. Rather than creating the jobs of the future, they are pushing a so-called gas-fired recovery, a totally backwards idea brought to you by the government's mates in the gas industry. This will supercharge carbon emissions, worsen the climate crisis. It will subsidize projects that decimate nature, Aboriginal heritage sites, and farmland. Expanding the fossil fuel industry won't create the jobs we need to build a better world. If you lot need some help coming up with ideas to create decent, meaningful, well-paid jobs, the Greens can help. Our Invest to Recover package will deliver around one million jobs, look after the well-being of everyone in the community and our environment, and set us up for a fair, sustainable future. These jobs will be about building new sustainable social homes, slashing public housing waiting lists, easing pressure on renters, and improving housing affordability. As an engineer, I know that we can revive Australian manufacturing and chart a course to become a renewables powerhouse we could create a caring economy and a creative society. The pandemic has 
knocked us sideways, for sure, but it has also opened up a window to imagine and build a world that is better, that is fairer, that is more equal. Let's not waste this chance. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I believe we now have Senator Roberts via the video link. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I agree that the federal government is not serving the people in managing COVID-19. Neither is the Queensland Labor government. Solid plans require data as their basis. A core issue in Australian politics at federal and state government level is fe government fear of using data. Having been in business and responsible for the safety, lives and livelihoods of hundreds of people working in hostile and hazardous underground environments, I always got the data. Objective data, accurate data, reliable data. People's lives and livelihoods deserve nothing less. When data is missing, governments rely on taking care of donors, relying on opinions, aiming for emotional marketing slogans and headlines. They rely on fooling people, not serving people. Take, for example, energy and climate policy. Climate tossed the last six prime ministers. Climate is splitting labour. Real Labour MPs like Senators Gallagher, Stirl and Farrell are trying to protect blue-collar workers from the likes of New Labour's Mark Butler, Tanya Plibercek, Anthony Albanese, Senators McAllister and Watt, hell-bent on virtue signalling and stopping leakage of votes to the Greens while forsaking workers. John Howard recently admitted the Liberal Party has descended into tribalism. Would-be Greens like Trent Zimmerman and his fellow socialists, who Bronwyn Bishop said last year grew into a large group under Malcolm Turnbull. They're battling true Liberals like Craig Kelly, Senators Rennick, Pierre Vanti Wells and Erica Betts. Then we have the split personality nationals like Barnaby Joyce and Senator Canavan, known to be sceptical on climate, yet when in Cabinet, spruiking that we need to cut carbon dioxide. Prime Minister Turnbull showered $400 million on wind turbines in New England to get Mr Joyce elected in 2016. That's why Liberal Labor nationals governments fail to make a coherent plan on any issue. They need to get back to solid data and aim to serve the people. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The time for the discussion has expired. I'm advised that there are no documents for consideration today, so we shall proceed to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the interim report of the Select Committee on Financial Technology and Regulatory Technology together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And Thank I you, Senator Bragg. To continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Bragg. I'm pleased to be chairing this inquiry. So, just one minute, sorry, Senator Bragg. Sorry. Um, S Senator Bragg, you didn't need to seek leave to continue your remarks. You can just. Uh, Apologies start speaking for Thank 10 you. minutes. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be chairing this inquiry, which is about facilitating increased competition and innovation in Australia's financial sector and beyond. While Australia officially slips into its first recession in 30 years, it is clear that we need more jobs. But we must embrace technology to be globally competitive and create these jobs. The committee was established in September last year, and following an extensive round of public submissions and hearings in January and February, the committee was due to table its interim report in March. However, COVID-19 intervened and the committee decided to reopen submissions and take further evidence at hearings in the middle part of this year before finalising this interim report. In total, the inquiry has now received more than 200 submissions from a broad range of stakeholders and held 10 public hearings. Following this substantial interim report, the committee will consider further matters relevant to its terms of reference and present a final report in April 2021. Put simply, this inquiry is about more jobs and more choice. That is the dividend of these sectors growing. Technology should not be feared. The computer age has delivered enormous growth in jobs. Technology is a jobs creator, not a jobs killer. Fintech or financial technology is commonly defined as organisations combining innovative business models and technology to enable, enhance and disrupt financial services. Australia has a vibrant and growing fintech sector with a significant number of startups and scale-ups, as well as several established unicorns that clearly show the incredible potential of this sector. RegTech, or regulatory technology, is the use of new technology to undertake regulatory monitoring, reporting and compliance functions. To review and organise the material presented to the committee through the inquiry, 
The committee has chosen to view it through five buckets tax, regulation, access to capital, skills, talent and culture. The committee also receives particular evidence relating to the impact of COVID-19 and technology enablers that have risen to prominence during the crisis. The committee has made 32 recommendations. On to COVID-19. It is clear that from the evidence received, COVID-19 has had a material impact on the fintech sector. But as the pandemic has shown, adaptability and technology underpins the jobs of today, let alone tomorrow. While some businesses, especially well-established fintechs, have ridden the wave and experienced significant growth during this period, many newer companies have struggled with a loss of capital and faltering customer acquisition. The sector has received significant support from a number of government initiatives, including JobKeeper. The committee has made several recommendations to retain, sorry, in relation to these technology enablers, such as allowing electronic company meetings and communications, allowing for electronic signing and witnessing of documents, continuing the rollout of telehealth services on a permanent basis, and the utilisation of electronic prescriptions. The committee also identified accelerating progress on the Australian government's digital identity reforms as a key opportunity. On a taxation, the committee heard that a competitive tax framework will assist fintechs and regtechs. The operation of the research and development tax incentive was raised by many participants. And due to the uncertainty around the eligibility of software development for the program and the concern about audits, the committee has made recommendations that there should be additional clarity in these areas, whilst noting that the further legislative changes to the tax incentive are currently under re review by the Economics Legislation Committee. The report also calls for the Council of Federal Financial Relations to simplify payroll tax across Australia. On to regulation. Looking at the way competition in financial services is regulated, it is abundantly clear that the current approach is fragmented and unclear, with the ACCC, ASIC, APRA and the RBA all playing roles. Witnesses viewed this fragmentation as a risk and saw the need for Australia's financial regulators to collectively provide greater focus on promoting competition and innovation in the financial system. If Australia has any chance of competing with the likes of Singapore and the UK. The committee's recommendations in this area are to provide the Council of Financial Regulators with a competition mandate and ensure that it regularly reports on competitive dynamics, and also to require Council of Financial Regulators to consider and report on Australia's competitive position. The committee also supports self-regulation where innovative products emerge, whilst ensuring strong consumer protection. We have used the example of buy now, pay later products as a positive, innovative development which should be supported by a system of co-regulation. We were not convinced that the way to promote innovation in Australia was to force new ideas into old frameworks designed for something altogether different. An important regulatory reform that is underway to encourage more competition is the consumer data right. The committee considers that a single standalone body is required to manage this reform, particularly as it is rolled out into other sectors in the economy. The CDR is too important to be managed by a wing in the ACCC. On to capital. Evidence received showed the critical role of capital in facilitating the growth of fintech and regtech businesses. The committee has recommended that the Early Stage Venture Capital Limited Partnerships Program and the Early Stage Innovation Company Tax Incentive be reformed. The committee heard that these programs require tweaking in order to reach their full potential and be globally competitive. The committee also recommended that the remaining Johnson review recommendations from 2009 be implemented if we have, have a serious prospect of beating Singapore in winning business from the ailing Hong Kong, we must enact these reforms as soon as possible. On to skills, talent and culture, the committee made recommendations across these areas. The committee recommended that the government work with industry to ensure the reskilling of workers affected by economic change and ensure the availability and accessibility of micro-credentials for those seeking to join the fintech and regtech sectors. It should also explore the option of including eligible outplacement training under the FBT exemption for eligible startups. The package of recommendations brings together many loose ends and turns them into a package. The committee will continue to engage with the sector as it moves into the next phase of the inquiry. Just like our fintechs, the government should be iterative and responsive 
as we undertake our work as a parliament. A positive disposition is the one thing that is required to be successful in this space. But the next thing is to have a plan to be competitive. The plan to be competitive in fintech is the same plan that Australia requires to be competitive in technology and across the board. The fundamental need to be competitive is the same as it was before the pandemic. The need for reform is now more acute because we are in a recession and comp competing globally for new investment and new people. We have the brains, we have the skills. All we need to do is to unlock our technology prowess by breaking down some barriers. I wish to thank the other members on the committee for their interest, engagement and collegiate approach and note that the vast majority of recommendations in this report are bipartisan. I particularly want to thank the Deputy Chair and fellow Millennial Senator Marielle Smith and committee members Senator Paul Scar, Senator Susan MacDonald and Senator Jess Walsh for their support in the compilation of the report. I also wanted to thank the committee secretary, Lynn Beverley, for her commitment and guidance over the past year and to acknowledge the father of fintech in Australia, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who has been a champion for fintech since his days as Treasurer when he set the ball rolling in this space. The PM established the consumer data right, opened the fintech bridge with the UK and led the reforms on the early stage innovation companies as part of the National Innovation and Science Agenda. The government is full of fintech supporters, I should, I should say. The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, and Australia's first fintech minister, Jane Hume. They are a great team and I'm proud to serve alongside them. I hope these recommendations will be adopted by the executive government and I look forward to presenting the committee's final report in April. Senator Bragg, do you now seek leave to continue your remarks? Uh, yes. Wonderful. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith. Uh, just one moment, Senator Smith. I don't think you're on loud yet. Try again, perhaps. It wasn't now. a very millennial thing to do, was it? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Smith. The tabling of this interim report provides our parliament with an update on our committee's work in relation to its inquiry into the financial technology and regulatory technology sectors. Mm -hmm. The aim of our inquiry was to identify the challenges and barriers Australian fintechs and redtechs are trying to overcome in attempting to grow their enterprises and their respective industries. It's been a brilliant experience being part of this committee and I want to start my remarks by thanking the Chair, Senator Bragg, and also Senators Walsh, Scar and MacDonald for their keen participation in the hearings and the deliberations of our committee. I also want to thank the committee secretariat, particularly Lynn Beverley and CJ Sotel, who have been instrumental in ensuring the inquiry's processes have run as smoothly as possible during these unprecedented times. Whilst we weren't able to reach agreement on absolutely everything in this report, we did all come into this process in good faith, and I'm pleased that there was so much that we could agree on within the interim report. That said, I do need to address some of the issues where there were discrepancies in our opinions, and I'll get to those shortly. Throughout our hearings, we heard from many fintechs and regtechs about the innovative products they've brought to market in Australia, as well as the challenges and opportunities facing this sector going forward. I was especially pleased to hear from fintechs in my home state of South Australia, having been an advocate for the further development of this sector and the jobs it could bring to Adelaide. The inquiry identified many challenges that Australian fintechs and regtechs are confronting, which have only exacerbated during this pandemic. These challenges aren't insurmountable for the sector, but they do require action from our government. And whilst there has been significant focus on regulatory settings that require modernising to keep up with the pace of exciting regulatory and financial products, there are many other challenges ahead. Evidence to this inquiry has brought to light many of the issues that traditionally plage the startup sector, including an access, a lack of access to capital as well as access to skills. Notwithstanding these challenges, according to KPMG, the fintech sector in Australia is already worth about $1 billion. But I am certain that much greater growth is possible here as well as in the reg tech industry. And with that growth comes growth in jobs, if the government can get these settings right. As we know, the economic crisis caused by the pandemic has been difficult for all businesses and their workers. But there have been particular challenges for fintechs and reg techs, many of which are at the pre-revenue stage of development. The committee resolved to alter its reporting date, as Senator Bragg has said, and shift its focus so that the interim report table today would cover off on some pandemic-related topics, as well as look at the other evidence which was provided to our inquiry. 
The pandemic, it must be said, has also brought up different opportunities for the use of innovative technologies, and some of the recommendations in our interim report reflect these developments. There was bipartisan support for the universalisation of telehealth and e-prescriptions, as well as options to have video conferencing at annual general meetings under the Corporations Act. It should be noted that we couldn't agree on whether companies should be compelled to provide a hybrid model to allow both an in-person and a virtual AGM meeting. It's my strong view that individual shareholders who wish to opt in to in-person services should be able to do this. This is important for issues related to the digital divide, and it's important to ensure the fair participation of older, regional and rural shareholders or shareholders with disability. Throughout the inquiries proceedings to date, I've been mindful of the need always to balance the desire to encourage growth in our fintech and regtech sector, whilst protecting the interests of Australian consumers. Of course, Labor wants to see these industries flourish in Australia, but it is crucial to ensure that innovation and growth does not come at the expense of consumer outcomes. That principle has been Labor Senator's guiding approach to this inquiry. And while it was conducted in a collegial and effective manner with most recommendations receiving bipartisan support, there were some recommendations that either required further clarification or simply could not be supported in this regard. We have indicated this in our dissenting report because it is our firm belief that consumers must not be left behind. In particular, the government has a responsibility to ensure the financial literacy needs of everyday Australians are keeping up with the availability of more financial products. Evidence to the inquiry has suggested that there aren't many of these types of education programs currently in place in our community. This only serves to further disenfranchise vulnerable groups of Australians, and it will only widen further the digital divide which exists within our community with respect to those who have access to and an understanding of technology and those who don't. Labor senators acknowledge that innovation in the financial technology space is an exciting development for the Australian economy including for consumers. However, its true potential will only be realised if their availability results in a narrowing of the digital divide. Now, the Prime Minister and this government claim to be ch champions in this space, but what this inquiry has shown is that there is plenty of work ahead for the government to do if the fintech and regtech sectors are to reach their true potential. The implementation of many of the recommendations in this report would provide a good starting point. So there is plenty of work ahead and there's plenty of work ahead for our committee as well. I'm afraid I probably won't be around for the next part of, of the research project for, for this committee as I leave on maternity leave in a number of weeks, but I wish the rest of my committee members well. I wish the chair well in the further development of this work, and I wish the Labor senators on this committee well. This is such an important sector. The FinTech and RegTech sector offer incredible opportunity to Australia, and they offer incredible opportunity in Adelaide and in South Australia, which is of the highest importance to me. So I hope together as a parliament, we can do what we can to make sure that this sector flourishes, to make sure that we see more jobs grow from it, but also to ensure that those people who may not be able to keep up with this technology, those who may face disadvantage through the access of it, or who find that the, the increased choice or the lesser choice which may emerge from some of these technologies are looked after, that consumer outcomes are looked after, and that as we are looking to support this sector, as we are looking to support growth and opportunity, we are also looking to ensure that no Australians are left behind. All of that said, despite our obvious policy differences among some areas, I think members of the fintech sector and the regtech sector can all be assured that in members of our committee, you have found champions in the parliament and in the Senate. And I hope that gives you comfort that there are plenty of people in this building who understand what it is that your sector presents in terms of opportunity to our economy and to consumers, and that we're looking to make sure that your sector can develop in a way which is beneficial to the majority of Australians, and particularly those Australians who stand to benefit from better consumer outcomes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? My remarks have concluded. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Senator uh, is. Uh, I seek. Uh, I, I present Scrutiny Digest 11 of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. Thank. You. Uh, apologies, Senator Ayres. Um, I think we have to put the question on the uh, Select Committee on Financial Technology and Regulatory Technology Interim Report.
report. Um, so the question is that the Senate take note of the committee report, interim report. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call Senator Ayres. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present Scrutiny Digest 11 of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. Thank you. Do you uh, move to take note of that report? And, and seek leave to continue my right. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Ferravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 10 of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I rise to speak. Um, I rise to speak uh, to the tabling of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 10 of 2020. In particular, I wish to draw the Senate's attention to three instruments in Chapter 1 of the Monitor which raise significant technical scrutiny concerns. The first instrument is the Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standards Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 Regulations 2020. This instrument implements several temporary changes to performance standards for the delivery of letters and temporarily exempts Australia Post from its retail outlet obligations. The changes aim to respond to the challenges faced by Australia Post during the COVID-19 pandemic. It appears to the committee that the changes made by the instrument have the potential to affect a broad range of people and entities, including users of Australia Post services and Australia Post employees. Despite this, the explanatory statement to the instrument states that only Australia Post itself was consulted in the development of the instrument. After seeking advice from the minister about this matter, the committee understands that the instrument is due to be reviewed later this year and that the review will, be included, will include consultation with a range of different stakeholders about the impact and proposed duration of the measures. Given the significance of the measures and the broad scope of people and entities likely to be affected by them, the committee has asked to be provided with updates on the progress of future consultation. The committee has also resolved to give a notice of motion to disallow the instrument on 6 October 2020, with a view to reconsidering the notice once the committee is satisfied that appropriate consultation has been undertaken. The second instrument I wish to highlight is the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Deferral of Sunsetting Income Management and Cashless Welfare Arrangements Determination 2020. This instrument defers the sunsetting of primary legislation to extend the end date for the cashless debit card trial in all existing sites and income management in the Cape York region for a further six months until 31 December 2020. The committee would ordinarily expect such a significant measure to be included in primary legislation rather than delegated legislation consistent with previous extensions to the cashless welfare arrangements. In this instance, the explanatory statement to the instrument stated that delegated legislation was necessary to provide certainty to scheme participants, noting that Parliament was unable to consider the bill to extend the end dates as sittings were deferred in response to COVID-19. Noting that Parliament has now resumed a regular sitting pattern, it was unclear to the committee why it was necessary to continue to address this matter in delegated legislation. On 31 August 2020, the committee lodged a notice of motion to disallow the instrument for consideration and debate in the Senate on 3 September 2020, should the bill not be listed for debate before that time. The minister has since provided the committee with a more detailed justification as to why the bill could not be listed for debate in the Senate by 3 September and has reiterated that the government intends to bring the bill on for consideration as early as is practical. In light of the minister's advice, the committee has resolved to initially postpone the consideration of its notice of motion until 8 October 2020, pending an update from the minister as to the government's progress towards the scheduling of the bill for debate in the Senate. The final instrument I draw to the Senate's attention is the Competition and Consumer Industry Codes Dairy Regulations 2019. 
The committee has been particularly concerned about section 11 of the instrument, which imposes significant civil penalties on farmers and processors for failing to act in good faith. This term is undefined in the written law. As a technical scrutiny matter, the committee strongly considers that civil and criminal penalty provisions should be drafted with sufficient clarity to enable persons and entities to understand their obligations and the consequences of non-compliance. Since December 2019, Senate Standing Order 23-3 has required the committee to scrutinise delegated legislation to determine whether its drafting is defective or unclear. In considering this instrument, the committee has become aware of several other examples of similarly drafted provisions in both delegated and primary legislation. These examples raise broader, systemic concerns about the pursuit of regulatory flexibility via the imposition of broadly drafted good faith provisions at the expense of legal clarity and certainty. As section 11 of the instrument is just one example of this much broader and complex issue, the committee considers that the disallowance of that section in isolation would do little to address the systemic issues. Accordingly, the committee considers that this issue would be more appropriately addressed by a broader inquiry into the drafting of good faith obligations in Commonwealth legislation and consideration by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. I am pleased to report that following extensive correspondence, the Attorney General now agrees that the drafting of good faith obligations in Commonwealth legislation indeed raises complex and systemic issues which warrant further inquiry. In light of the Attorney General's undertaking to this effect, the committee has resolved to withdraw its notice of motion to disallow the Dairy Code and instead pursue this significant scrutiny matter by liaising with the Attorney General about the terms of reference for an inquiry into the drafting of good faith obligations in Commonwealth legislation and requesting the ACCC consider this issue as part of its ongoing inquiry into bargaining power in supply chains for perishable products. I thank the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and, en and Emergency, the Treasurer and the Attorney-General for their assistance in this matter. With these comments, I commend the committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 10 of 2020 to the Senate. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, th thank you, Senator Fairvanti Wells. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Or, thank you. The question is that the Senate take note of the committee report. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Seawatt. Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, I present the third interim report of the Community Affairs Reference Committee on Centrelink's compliance program and documents presented to the committee, and I move um, that the um, and I, I move to, to um, uh, talk to I, I, I move to take note of uh, the report. Um, today, the Community Affairs Reference Committee is tabling its third interim report for the inquiry into Centrelink's compliance program. This program informs the Senate. Uh, sorry, this report inf informs the Senate about the several claims for public interest immunity received from the Minister for Government Services. To date, the committee has received two claims of public interest immunity relating to legal advice sought and received by the Commonwealth regarding the um, so-called uh, the, the colloquially known program of the Robo Debt Program and one claim of public interest immunity relating to an executive minute which was cited in a report into RoboDebt by the Commonwealth Ombudsman. I'll deal with the first public interest um, immunity claim in relation to legal advice first. In the first interim report, the committee reported its resolution that the, the minister's claim did not sufficiently justify withholding information requested by the committee. The committee concluded that the information it was seeking is vital to the conduct of this inquiry as it goes to the legal foundation of the program and its administration. The first interim report recommended that the minister representing the Minister for Government Services provide answers to a series of questions placed on notice relating to legal advice relating to the um, Centrelink um, income compliance program. However, all responses to the questions on notice related to legal advice 
um, from Services Australia on the day on that day continued to rely on the rejected public interest immunity claim. The committee wrote to the minister seeking clarification of whether it was the intention to provide answers to the questions on notice, which continued to rely upon the rejected claim. Unfortunately, the committee did not receive a response to this letter. The minister's failure to respond to the request for clarification was a blatant disregard for both the committee's decision and the resolution of the Senate. As a result, the committee recommends that, that the Senate adopt the following resolution that's contained in the report, and that the Senate requires the minister representing the Minister for Government Services to attend the Senate at the conclusion of question time on 6 October 2020 to provide an explanation of the government's continued reliance on the rejected claim of public interest immunity in answers to questions on notice. Um, the second public interest immunity claim in relation to legal advice I'll, I'll uh, now address. At the committee's public hearing on 31 July 2020, the, S the Secretary of the Department of S Social Services tabled a further claim of public interest immunity from the minister relating to questions about legal advice and the, and the robo-debt program. This claim makes no reference to the first rejected claim, even though it largely deals with the same material. The claim covers all legal advice provided by internal or external lawyers to ministers, departments or agencies in relation to the Centrelink um, Income Compliance Program or in connection to the class action. The minister notes in his letter that it that if the matters are made public, this could result in undue prejudice to the Commonwealth and loss of confidentiality of interactions between lawyers and uh, government clients. However, the committee continues to hold the view that the requested information is vital evidence for the inquiry into, into this program. As a result, the committee resolved that it did not accept this further claim of public interest immunity. The committee maintains that it is ultimately in the public interest for the Commonwealth Government to be transparent about legal advice it received in relation to this program. The committee acknowledges the public sensitivities of materials related to legal proceedings and is willing to accept material in camera regarding the legal issues surrounding the program. The majority of questions on notice have been regarding circumstances of legal advice regarding to the Centrelink Income Compliance Program and not regarding the specific content of that legal advice. The committee fails to understand why information relating to circumstances of legal advice, such as dates, provide, provide, was provided, dates advice was provided, cannot be provided to the committee in uh, public, let alone in camera. As a result, the committee recommends that the Senate adopt the, the, resol uh, the resolution um, that's contained in the report requiring the production of documents. That may be, and that these be laid on the table by the minister, representing the minister for government services, no later than the, than 12 p.m. on the 6th of October 2020. Either revise responses to all questions relating to legal advice and the program, or a letter confirming that responses will be provided to the committee in camera. I'll now move to the claim in relation to an executive minute. On 13 August 2020, the committee received a new claim of public interest immunity from the minister in relation to a request for the executive minute um, to the Minister for Social Services. The minister claims revealing this information could or would be reasonably expected to disclose the deliberation of, cabin of Cabinet. The committee is concerned that this blanket statement provided by the minister fails to establish whether the executive minute was actually uh, would actually disclose the deliberations or describe any genuine risk of public harm in its disclosure. The committee is of the view that the executive minute would not, in and of itself, reveal cabinet deliberations. In fact, it was apparently provided to the Commonwealth Ombudsman for the purpose of a review without resulting in a claim of immunity. This document is another item of evidence the committee believes is important for its inquiry. The committee is therefore of the view that this document should be provided in camera if the perceived harm can only result from its publication. As a result, the committee recommends that the Senate adopt the following resolution um, as contained and, and as it is contained in our report that I'm tabling, requiring the production of the documents, that they be laid on the table by the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services no later than 12 p.m. on the 6th of October 2020, either a copy of the executive minute or a letter confirming that this executive minute will be provided in camera to this committee. The government cannot hide in 
behind these unsubstantiated claims for public interest, interest immunity. It is holding up this inquiry into Centrelink, and that, I think, is obvious to the people that are paying very close attention to this inquiry. I look forward to the minister's responses to these resolutions on the 6th of October as we work to uncover um, what uh, is, did happen um, in the instigation of the program that is, that is known as RoboDebt. Thank you, Senator Seward. Um, just before you take your seat, could I please clarify that you are moving that the recommendations Should be yes, adopted I am by the Senate? That it be adopted by the Senate. And are yes. you therefore seeking leave to be in continuance and taking note of the report? I'm taking note of. I, I obviously made comment on the report, but I do uh, ask that the Senate adopt the resolutions. The question is then, I believe, that the recommendations in the uh, report be adopted. Just one moment. I put the question that the recommendations in the report, um, the Community Affairs References Committee third interim report into Centrelink's compliance program be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is, uh, the motion moved by Senator Seward to adopt the recommendations of the report. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart Teller for the ayes and Senator Davey Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 22. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, I understand there were still some speakers on the original motion to take note, so with the concurrence of the Senate we will resume that and I will call Senator O'Neill. And uh, I rise to speak to the second interim report, and I'm very pleased to see that the Senate has supported the recommendations of the report that the government's private interest immunity claim be rejected. And there is very, very good argument about why it should be rejected that was put on the record by uh, Senator uh, Seawitch just then. But in essence, why we should uh, support the recommendations of this report is because this government is permanently addicted to covering up, to hiding the truth from Australians, to a litany of announcements and failures of delivery, and in this instance, with regard to robo-debt, a gross failure of fair and decent government of this nation. This program, the robo-debt program, was responsible for the destruction of lives responsible for untold financial and emotional anguish and the systematic harassment of some of the most vulnerable members of the Australian community. And for what? To prop up Scott Morrison's bo budget bottom line to sell a few kitschy back in black mugs. That's how cynical this government is. This report that's been tabled this afternoon and whose recommendations have been adopted here in the Senate is the third report of the Income Compliance Inquiry. It's regarding the public interest immunity claims that the government has trotted out. Another few examples of this government's war on transparency and accountability. These public interest immunity claims, uh, as presented previously in letters from the minister, are a repeat of the pattern that we see. Conceal, repeat. Conceal, repeat. Conceal, repeat. That is all this minister knows. Minister Stuart Robert argued previously and again in recent days that there would be specific harm to the public interest if legal advice that he had used to establish the robo-debt was made public. The great harm that's been done to the Australian public has been done by its own government, pushing onto them hundreds of thousands of Australians debts that were unlawfully raised by their own government. An attack on the citizens of this country by this Liberal National Party government. 
the claim that it is against the interests of the public of Australia to know what the government knew when they designed and concocted and inflicted this terrible scheme on Australia, that claim is a sham. Nearly half a million debts were sent out. Nearly a billion dollars in payments were refunded due to legally insufficient grounds for the program. And this government continues to say that the advice at the heart at the very heart of this omnishambles is not in the public interest. Well, that claim and the cheek of it is just outrageous. As more Australians than ever are using Services Australia, as we head into a deep recession for the first time in a generation under this Liberal National Party government, we need to restore confidence in the department and the minister more than at any other time in living memory. The report of this inquiry, tabled yesterday, it complements the tabling of the report this afternoon. And yesterday's table showed that robo debt had grievously undermined Australia's trust in government services. And that trust will only be further undermined by the government's continuing lack of accountability. This report wisely recommends that this paper thin excuse be rejected and that the minister representing the Minister for Government Services table the relevant documents requested by the inquiry or provide an explanation to the Senate as to the minister's failure to table these documents. And I'm pleased again to put on the record that the Senate has just voted in support of the report of the Community Affairs Committee to make sure that this government comes into this chamber and tells the truth. I know it will be new. I know it will be novel. We should be able to sell tickets to that if only people could get into the building. Yearning for the truth, the Australian people, not yearning for more of the robo-debt and more, uh, more of the same from this government. The second interim report of this inquiry tabled yesterday went to the heart of the legality of the problem, and it tells us what the government should have known. That average income isn't real income, and that using income averaging to subsequently support raising an overpayment debt has never, never amounted to sufficient evidence of a debt under social security law. It never did until this lot, this government, this shameful government, inflicted their fake debts and all the damage it did on the Australian people. Robo-debt particularly affected workers with itinerant employment. It affected workers who are casual labourers. It affected workers who were in the short-term unemployment market. It affected students whose, whose peripatetic jobs left them eligible for support payments, but vulnerable to the very tool that the government sought to use to exploit to get money from those who could pay the least. $2.1 billion, Minister Morrison, as the Treasurer thought he could get, and he bragged about it to his mates. Oh, I've got this great new scheme. We're going to use average income and we'll rake in the dollars. That's what they did. They got advice. They inflicted this pain and suffering on the Australian people, and they need to pay for that at the next election. The eligible, those eligible for support payments were the most vulnerable to averaging, and they were the most affected. I recall the case of a building labourer constantly in search of work who came to my office on the Central Coast after receiving a robo-debt for over $10,000. Now, to a casual labourer, that $10,000 is a lot of money. With the support of my office, that debt was subsequently reduced to a tiny fraction of that amount once a proper review took place. Thank God that Labor had enough sense to come and get support from his duty senator. The problem was for so many Australians, they just totally freaked out when they got a letter from the government, accepted that the government po couldn't possibly give them a, a fake debt, and they just paid the money. They just paid. They trusted the government, and their trust was abused. Yesterday's report recommends that Services Australia immediately reviews its evidentiary responsibilities for raising overpayment debts in all of its compliance programs, as well as recommending an independent review into the policy, design, administration and impact of Centrelink's compliance program, including the income compliance program. We demand, on behalf of the Australian people, more evidence 
not less, not cover-up, not hiding, not public interest immunity claims, not the nonsense, the shame, the lies, the disgraceful behaviour that we consistently see from this government. The government knows what it did was wrong. It relied on insufficient legal advice to unleash a predatory program on our most vulnerable Australians. We then saw the government spend $34 million, yes, $34 million on legal fees trying to cover their tracks and to fight inevitable lawsuits. It concocted bogus public interest immunity claims to hide the legal advice used to create and sustain the program. And now, even last month, just as recently as last month, the secretary of the department responsible for robo-debt remarked that she didn't even know what the term robo-debt meant. That is the depth of denial that exists in the government and those they have serving them. The public service is called the public service because it's supposed to serve the public, not the government of the day. And the cover-up that is characteristic of this robo-debt scheme at every turn. But the department responsible, worst of all, denied the testimonies of two brave mothers of young men who took their lives after being harassed, harassed endlessly by debt collectors. And the department representing this government refused to acknowledge the ultimate pain that they inflicted on these families, all for the bottom line of the budget, for a campaign ad for a few bits of merchandise. The work of this inquiry isn't over, and our work will not be done till every debt that was levied on innocent Australians is returned and those responsible are held accountable. Even now I hear rumours that payments are being funnelled into cashless welfare cards instead of bank accounts, and that payments pay effect are the liquid asset tests of Australians who are currently out of work pushing their payments down in a time when they can ill afford it. Well, I can tell the people of Australia, Labor will stand up for you against this government that is attacking you every day, and this robo-debt is a signature uh, stop, of their um, attacks on you. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Is there a point of order there? Okay. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And despite the antics of those opposite, as Deputy Chair of the Community Affairs Reference Committee, I rise to place on record why the government senators voted against the recommendations in the Substantive Community Affairs Reference Committee third interim report into Centrelink's income compliance program. As has been mentioned in the first, second and now third interim report dissenting comments, it is the strong view of the government senators on the committee that the claims of public interest immunity in regard to relevant cabinet materials and legal advice provided with respect to the income compliance program made by the Hon. Stuart Robert MP on the 11th of February 2020 and subsequently reiterated on the 31st of July 2020 and the 13th of August 2020 are valid. During my speech on the first interim committee report, I noted that it has been a long-standing practice of successive Australian governments not to disclose legal advice. This was originally stated by Minister Robert in his initial public interest immunity claim. Furthermore, and as I stated, this has also been the practice of both Labor and coalition governments. The committee requested a copy of the executive minute to the Minister for Social Services dated 12 February 2015 that was referred to in the Commonwealth Ombudsman's 2017 report into Centrelink's automated debt raising and recovery system. Minister Robert then wrote to the committee on 13 August 2020 outlining a public interest immunity claim over the executive minute. In his correspondence to the committee, the minister stated, and I quote, Revealing this information would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of the Cabinet. On that basis, I claim public interest immunity in relation to providing the minute. It is in the public interest for the deliberations of the Cabinet not to be made public. The deliberation of the Cabinet and its committees should be conducted in secrecy so that the freedom of those deliberations can be preserved. It is not in the public interest to disclose information about the Cabinet's deliberations as it may impact on the government's ability to receive confidential information and make appropriate decisions impacting on the Australian community. This is a well-established basis for a public interest immunity claim." End quote. 
The Labor and Green Senators question whether the minute would disclose the deliberations of Cabinet on the basis that Service Australia appear, appears to not have refused to provide the document to the Commonwealth Ombudsman as part of his investigations into the program, despite the purported availability of a public interest immunity exemption at the time. It is important to note that a limited disclosure to an operational Commonwealth entity is not inconsistent with the maintenance of Cabinet confidentiality. The Minister's advice to the committee is that the disclosure of the minute would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of Cabinet and that this is an acceptable ground for a public interest immunity claim. Those on the other side of the chamber have used this whole inquiry, not just the public interest immunity claims, to feed into a political narrative. Using the term robo-debt, which was created solely by the media to refer to Centrelink's compliance program, is flawed and has caused significant confusion to not only the general public but to those sitting opposite. Ironically, their use of the term is also inconsistent, with the term being used in various ways by the opposition, the media and on social media to include any debt or compliance letter received from Centrelink, not just those issued through the Income Compliance Program. I do note that there were initial implementation issues when the program commenced. However, since then, the government has made significant enhancements to the program through the later iterations. The government has worked quickly to rectify these issues. And as clearly stated in evidence received, refunds for those who had repaid money on debts raised solely or partly using averaged income data commenced in July 2020, and the majority of refunds are expected to be paid by November this year. As shown by the earlier motion, government senators and government members of the committee strongly believe that the public interest immunity claim by Minister Robert is valid. I seek leave to further my comments. Thank you very much, um, Senator Askew. Um, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Aking Ding, Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present the advisory report on the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship Cessation Bill 2019, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Sorry, I seek leave to incorporate the tabling statement in Hansard. Thank you, Senator Smith. And is leave granted? Thank you. Um, were, was that the conclusion of all of the remarks on um, the Senator Keneally? Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Acting President. I uh, <laughs> seek leave to uh, speak to the tabling of the report. Thank you. Thank you. I rise to speak on the tabling of this report from the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security into the Australian Citizenship Amendment Citizenship, C Citizenship Cessation Bill. I say from the outset that Labor welcomes steps to fix the significant problems in Australia's citizenship loss provisions to strengthen our national security and to protect the Australian community from terrorism. Labor supports appropriate measures, such as citizenship loss for terrorist conduct, to keep Australia and Australians safe. Amendments to these provisions have been a long time coming, and we are glad that the government, who control the legislative agenda and ultimately Australia's national security, have finally acted. The citizenship loss provisions were first introduced in 2015 under the then Abbott government and were passed with Labor's support in late 2015 under the Turnbull, Turnbull government. Labor supported the legislation in 2015 because citizenship loss following terrorist conduct may be necessary and proportionate in some cases, as the respected Independent National Security Monitor recommended. However, Labor's always had concerns about the complexity and potential impact of this legislation, which is why Labor PJCIS members issued a minority report in 2015. This report criticized the government's legislation uh, and the processes and recommended that provisions introduced in the 2015 Act be referred immediately to the Insulum for review. The concerns Labor held five years ago have been proven to be correct. Under the current laws, there may be cases where an individual's Australian citizenship has ceased under the law, but the Commonwealth Government may not be aware that this has, concern has occurred. The Department of Home Affairs confirmed this in the PJCIS hearings last year. 
This might sound ironic that laws that are meant to protect Australians could result in citizenship revocations the government themselves don't even know about, but that is the way the current system operates. ASIO themselves have made clear that because of the automatic way in which the existing provisions operate, citizenship cancellation may lead to unintended or unforeseen adverse security outcomes, including exacerbating potential security threats. As the Inslem found in his 2019 inquiry, these provisions operate in an uncertain and uncontrolled manner and need to be repealed as a matter of urgency. In this report, the PJCIS has recommended that the automatic citizenship loss provisions be replaced with a new ministerial decision-making model of citizenship cessation. Labor both welcomes and supports this recommendation, a recommendation we've long called for along with the insulin. And we look forward to the government bringing this legislation to the parliament, uh, particularly this chamber, so that it can be passed before we leave uh, tomorrow. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, Acting President, uh, Apologies. I, I, I seek uh, your clarity as to whether I'll be able to continue my remarks. Um, Senator Keneally, it being 6.16, um, you have leave to continue your remarks. Thank you. Are there any ministerial statements? Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave, as agreed by the Whips, to table two non-conforming petitions, one of 11,221 signers of of concerned social scientists and humanities and arts academics regarding fee increases and removal of public funding from arts, humanities, social sciences, business, law courses and degrees, and the other of 15,557,000 people on behalf of the National Tertiary Education Union regarding university fee increases. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I table the petitions. Thank you. Are there any um, ministerial statements? Okay. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Support Amendment Job Ready Graduates and Supporting Regional and Remote Students Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill proceed without formalities and be read a first time. All those in favour say aye. All those against? The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to higher education and social security and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Um, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, the question is that this bill now be read. I beg your pardon. Minister. I've moved it. I'll move that the debate be adjourned. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 6th of October 2020. Clark? Government business orders of the day, electoral legislation amendment, miscellaneous measures bill, uh, resumption of consideration in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Senator Farrell? Yes, can I um, move the amendment uh, in my name and seek leave to uh, speak? Is that, that? is that the amendments number one to three on sheet 1037? Yes, it is, uh, 
Madam Acting De Deputy President. So you're seeking leave to move those together? Yes, I am. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. And I'd uh, seek leave to um, speak to the uh, uh, speak to the amendment. You can make a contribution. Thank you. Um, I move the amendment circulated uh, in my name uh, at uh, sheet uh, uh, 1037. Uh, this amendment seeks to delay the commencement of the um, bill until the 1st of December 2020. Currently the bill has different commencement dates for different provisions. The amendment will allow for a simplified starting date for the entire bill. Delaying the start date until the 1st of December allows the AEC and the parties to familiarise themselves with the new regime and to ensure that they have their compliance systems in place. In addition, there are state jurisdictions that are currently undergoing state or local government elections. It's always important to ensure that electoral changes do not confuse voters or entities. As such, a starting date later in the year lessens the risks of uh, confusion. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the government uh, supports uh, those uh, amendments. Uh, I mean, the intention obviously was never to have any uh, impact on the conduct of state elections uh, in Queensland or anywhere else. This is about keeping arrangements for federal uh, elections and state elections appropriately separate. And uh, from, from that point of view, we're very comfortable supporting that amendment. The motion is that the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Chair. Uh, excuse oh. me, Chair. Oh. Senator Waters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I just rise um, to make some very brief remarks about um, the amendments just moved by Senator Farrell. Given that we think the amendments, uh, rather the bill itself is bad, we don't oppose delaying its commencement. So we too will be supporting these amendments. Thank you, Senator Waters. Um, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. I'd just like to be on the record as, as supporting that amendment. Thank you. So noted. Senator Waters, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am, Chair. I uh, seek leave to move uh, amendments items one to three on sheet 1002 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. I'll speak to those amendments now. So the, um, the effect of these amendments will be to reduce the federal disclosure threshold of political donations down to $1,000. Now, at the minute, it, um, it was originally 13500 but it's indexed. So at the moment, you can donate um, just shy of $14,300 to a federal political party or for a federal purpose, and you don't need to tell anybody about it. It is absolutely uh, opaque. And donations just shy of the disclosure threshold are routinely made um, and the public doesn't have the ability to hear about them. So this uh, amendment would uh, repeat many, many amendments over the years that many experts and in fact other political parties have moved for to reduce that threshold of disclosure down to $1,000. The public should know who is donating to political parties. Political parties should own up to who's paying for their re-election campaigns. It is a very straightforward transparency and accountability measure. And the federal disclosure threshold has been too high since the days when John Howard was the Prime Minister, and it is about time that it was dropped back down to a uh, level where the public knows who's paying for who. So in Queensland, my home state, we have a disclosure threshold uh, under our state laws of $1,000. That's not proved any. Uh, that's not proved onerous from an administrative perspective to comply with, uh, and we don't think there's any justification for retaining that significantly too high disclosure threshold that the federal laws enshrine. Uh, so these uh, this amend these amendments would reduce that threshold down to thousand dollars. Now I thank the crossbench um, in advance who've let me know that they will be uh, supporting this amendment, and I. Um, I haven't heard back from Labor, but of course they've got their own private members' bills to this effect, 
and they had a second reading speech, uh, second reading amendment to this effect as well. So um, a bit of a departure there if they didn't vote for this. So I am hopeful that we will see this amendment pass shortly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. The government will oppose this amendment. Uh, this amendment would reduce the disclosure threshold from $14,300 to $1,000. It would also abolish indexation of the disclosure threshold, which would effectively mean that the threshold would shrink in real terms over time due to inflation. Senator Waters, is this a point of order? It is a point of order. I have not moved the amendments that abolish the indexation, so they are not before the chair. Um, on the point of order, Senator Cormann? No, I'm not talking to the point of order. I'm just talking uh, to uh, the issue and to all of the amendments in front of us, as I've done in previous debates and as is widely practiced. So I will continue to contribute. Um, Please continue, the, Senator The Cormann. Greens amendment uh, will mean more red type for uh, individual Australians who uh, would like to participate in the uh, democratic process, including by making financial contributions to their uh, party of choice or the party or the uh, member, the candidate that they would like to support. It would deter political participation. Even worse, uh, this badly drafted amendment would reclassify numerous very small organisations as third party campaigners if they spent more than $1,000 in a year on electoral expenses. Uh, this change would drag numerous not-for-profit and charitable organisations under the reporting rules for third party. Uh, this could sweep up tiny groups like neighbourhood associations, RSL branches, footy clubs and other tiny players who, uh, who uh, comment favourably or critically on federal politics. This is the effect of the amendment because under the Electoral Act, if someone spends more than a disclosure threshold, they get uh, categorised as a third party and face more burdensome uh, reporting and disclosure obligations. Uh, namely, they have to make annual returns and appear on the transparency register. The current threshold of $14,300 is, um, is set at the appropriate level uh, to uh, appropriately balance facilitating political participation while also uh, facilitating and ensuring appropriate levels of uh, openness and transparency, but $1,000 clearly is not. Uh, this extreme uh, change proposed by the Greens in the reporting uh, arrangements uh, has not been uh, discussed with the charitable or not-for-profit sector as far as uh, we are aware. The bad drafting of these uh, amendments may be unintentional, but the Greens made exactly the same drafting error when they moved similar amendments back in 2013, appointed uh, out uh, these errors then, um, but here uh, you know, we are again with the same, um, you know, obviously, um, very badly drafted amendment uh, in the same form. Senator Farrell. President, um, I'd just like to make one uh, comment by way of uh, clarification to um, the Leader of the Greens. Um, to the best of my knowledge and to the best of knowledge of my office, we have not actually um, received your um, amendments in a way where you have requested um, a response. And um, I make this uh, offer um, to uh, Senator Waters that at any stage when you send us, if if you choose to send us uh, your amendments, uh, we are very happy at all times to uh, to respond. Um, that should be aware. Labor already has a bill before the Senate that seeks to achieve the changes uh, proposed by this amendment, um, but we don't support this amendment being made as part of this particular package. Based on our consultation on the not-for-profit sector, uh, with the charities following the implementation of the ban on foreign donations. We understand that although we would like to see this change as soon as possible, non-political entities who engage in the creation of electoral matters require further consultation and communication and time to adapt their systems. This was something that uh, they stressed very strongly to us uh, when we fought to establish successfully the ban on foreign donations and it would be remiss of this parliament not to listen to the concerns of those stakeholders. Thank you, Senator Farrell. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Oh, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, a little bit slow there um, on my behalf. Um, behalf. Uh, Minister, I've just got a couple of questions in relation to this. Uh, you talked about the burden that this places upon 
people who wish to make a donation. Can you just uh, articulate exactly what that burden is uh, for someone who wants to make a donation uh, that is uh, below the threshold uh, and uh, how that might deter people making a, uh, a donation? You, I would refer you to uh, section 314 AEB of the Commonwealth Electoral Act, which uh, sets out uh, all of the uh, requirements on third parties uh, uh, that would be imposed on those uh, third parties in their circumstances, including the penalties that would apply. Senator Patrick. So, Minister, uh, I'm, I'm putting to you that the burden is not significant uh, in, in, uh, in a balance of uh, effort required versus the public interest in, in the disclosure. Uh, uh, Senator Waters indicated that, for example, in Tasmania this is not a problem. Has the government looked at uh, other jurisdictions to see uh, exactly how uh, any such burden would affect uh, people who wanted to, to donate to a political party? Uh, well, uh, Senator Rex, uh, Senator Patrick, I should say, Rex, <laughs> I, I've got to, I've got to strongly disagree with you. Uh, and uh, this is not just a theoretical disagreement. This is a very practical disagreement. Uh, Not-for-profit organisations that were uh, getting captured by the uh, initial draft of the uh, foreign, uh, the, the ban on foreign political donations and the increase. Uh, disclosure and reporting requirements um, in the con much larger not-for-profit organisations that uh, were uh, very, very concerned about the level of red tape that it would impose on them, uh, the uh, level of red tape on smaller not-for-profits that would inevitably be captured through this Greens amendment would be entirely disproportionate and not be appropriately balanced. I mean, we are absolutely in favour of appropriately balanced balancing, facilitating political participation by all, uh, while also, of course, pursuing the public interest in disclosure. But uh, we believe the current arrangements appropriately balance uh, those requirements, and what is in front of us does not. Senator Patrick. So I'm, if I'm in a position to make a donation of uh, $2,000 to a political party, uh, how, how would the burden differ between someone who uh, was making a $2,000 donation and someone who's making a $15,000 donation, uh, noting that it might just simply be an individual. I'm just trying to understand the, 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 uh, what, what, what pushes someone across a line or in terms of not making a, uh, a donation. Minister. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, businesses or organisations that are making larger organisation uh, are making, making larger donations are likely to be. Uh, larger organisations that have got the capacity to comply with uh, annual return and other requirements. Whereas, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you are a small volunteer not-for-profit or if you are a, a smaller organisation that hasn't got the same resources to deal with all of the uh, additional reporting requirements that would come with uh, getting captured by this, that is certainly the feedback that we've got for, from not-for-profits. Well, then that makes it disproportionate. Uh, you know, in, in the end, nobody is arguing against the need for disclosure. It's just making sure that we uh, capture it, um, that we capture disclosure and reporting requirements uh, with organisations of an appropriate size and with donations of an appropriate size. Senator Patrick, I just want to speak uh, to uh, Labor's comments about having a private members' bill. Uh, that seeks to do the same thing and uh, uh, therefore not wanting to support this particular bill. Um, I think everyone that, that's listening needs to understand that private members' bills rarely get up. Uh, they rarely get up. Uh, they're used to put pressure on governments to do particular things, uh, to enable debate, to enable committee work in, a, in relation to particular uh, uh, policies or laws. Uh, no, no one should pretend that when a bill that comes through the Senate that is a government bill that will eventually go back to the, uh, the House if, if it were amended here and be passed into law um, should ever be, uh, be ignored uh, because you have a private member's bill up. It, it, it seems to be disingenuous to make a statement that you are in support of this. Uh, but you want to have it up on your own private members' bill. You want that's that's the method by which you wish to seek the change. Labor has an opportunity here to implement something that uh, it purportedly uh, agrees with, but is simply not uh, prepared to 
uh, to back. And uh, I think people should at least appreciate that. I'd also like to just uh, uh, go back to a discussion that I was having with Senator Cormann uh, prior um, in, in relation to this bill. Uh, I did ask Senator Cormann a whole range of questions about his uh, personal circumstance um, in terms of uh, dinners that he might have attended and so forth. I just want to make the chamber very. Uh, I just want to make it very clear to the, ch the chamber. I was not directing that at at uh, Senator Cormann in a in a in, a, in any other way than to, to, uh, uh, to in acknowledgement of the fact that Senator Cormann is the only person, really, or, or that uh, Senator Corm Cormann is not in a position to answer this question for other ministers. Uh, I am of the of the view or understanding that all ministers do it. I was simply uh, restricting my, my questions to the uh, minister that was at the table in order uh, to, uh, in appreciation of the fact that um, he uh, has knowledge of his own affairs. Uh, I wasn't suggesting or in any way uh, seeking to single him out. Senator Waters, I believe you are seeking the call. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just to address a number of the issues that have uh, been raised in the, the last little while, um, the amendments were circulated last night, and so I would hope that folk have you know, taken the opportunity to read amendments that the chamber is now um, debating. So I'm I'm a bit confused by Senator Farrell's um, remark there, um, and I want to take issue with what uh, Senator Cormann said. The intention of these amendments is to lower the disclosure threshold so that members of the public can see who is donating to political parties. There is no other intention but that. And I might point out that the drafting in these amendments mirror the drafting, I'm told, in Labor's own private members' bill, which seeks to do the same thing. So. Uh, I wasn't quite clear from Senator Farrell's contribution whether or not his party uh, will be voting for the amendments that they have their own legislation in exactly the same drafting format um, or not. Uh, but you know, we'll find out in just a minute. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, disabuse anyone that might be listening because they, you know, haven't got anything better to do at this time of night. Uh, that the intention of these amendments is simply to improve transparency and to ensure that um, people know who's donating to political parties, as I believe, is their right to know. Thank you, Chair. Does any other senator wish to uh, speak to this amendment? If not, the question is that Australian Greens amendments one to three on sheet 1002 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required, or do you just wish to record your position? Ring the bell. Uh, no, no, Chair. I believe I can't call a division, but I hope that my colleagues there in the chamber can do so on my behalf. That's okay. Your colleagues have ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you.
Stop the bells. The question is Australian Greens amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 1002 be agreed to. The ayes move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. Order there being six ayes and 27 noes, the amendment is not supported. Senator Waters, do you uh, seek to move your next amendment? Yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. I now move amendments uh, items four and five on the same sheet, sheet 1002. Um, now, Senator Common will be pleased to know that these amendments are the ones about indexation, so if you can give us the spiel about how that's so very, very bad, which I'm uh, we all can't wait to hear. Uh, so this amendment would uh, remove indexation of the federal disclosure threshold. It started off at 1,300 and I think, I think it was 13,200 actually, and it's just progressively increased over the years. It's now up to 14,300, and you know it makes a mockery of having a disclosure threshold. So these amendments would say that you can't index the disclosure threshold, and I commend them to the chamber. Does any other senator wish to speak to amendments four and five on sheet 1002? If not, the question is that Greens amendments four and five on sheet 1002. Just wait. So the question is that sub items four and Six in item 34 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. So those that have opinions say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute or four. Indication from whips? One minute.
Stop the bells. So the question is that sub items four and six in item 34 are schedule one standard printed. The ayes have passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt teller for the noes. Order there being 23 ayes and seven noes, uh, Schedule 1 will stand as printed. Uh, Senator Lambie, do you wish to move your amendments? If you would prefer time, we can uh, continue with other Greens amendments and come back to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Thanks. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, Chair. For the Sister Chamber, I'm happy to uh, move items uh, one to four on sheet 1038 um, and hopefully I'll have leave to move those together. Is leave granted? <laughs> Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, so these amendments uh, put me on doubt that voter ID, uh, that, that there should not be a slippery slope towards voter ID at the polls. Uh, in dissenting reports to the 2016 JSCEM election review, both uh, my party and the Labor Party noted that the government's claims of double voting and voter irregularity actually were not substantiated and, and in fact, were unsupported by the evidence. Um, and in Australia and internationally, the evidence supports the view that voter ID in fact uh, suppresses and hinders citizen participation. Requiring voters to show formal identification documents risks disenfranchising First Nations people, family violence victims, uh, young people without a driver's licence or homeless and itinerant people. The Electoral Commission has said that up to 1.5% of new enrolments could be people without formal ID. And I would note that uh, my home state of Queensland introduced voter ID laws before the 2015 election and after a low voter turnout, the laws were repealed. The AEC has previously said that adopting voter ID would involve, quote, significant startup and ongoing costs, voter inconvenience, possible disenfranchisement of a number of voters, and possible delays in the delivery of election results because of an increase in the level of declaration voting, end quote. Um, now many of the Electoral Commission staff are employed uh, casually on uh, elections, and we note the ALP's recommendation that casual staff training make it clear that they cannot ask for ID, and our proposed amendments simply confirm um, that position. So uh, there's something a little bit odd in making voting compulsory and then finding people who don't vote, but at the same time making it harder for them to vote. So we support uh, making the questions used to establish a voter's identification more flexible, and this would assist uh, migrants or people with low literacy. Our amendments simply seek to ensure that this flexibility is not used to introduce the government's um, long coveted plan for voter ID and yes I refer to the remarks made early today about the 
uh, excitement that the government showed when they thought that they might get support for bringing voter ID in down the track. Uh, this parliament should not take any step that would have the effect of reducing the number of Australians participating in our democracy. And so I commend uh, these amendments to the chamber. Minister. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chair. Well, f f firstly, I, I don't quite uh, understand how somehow it is inconsistent to have compulsory voting and um, voter ID requirements to ensure the integrity of the voting process when there's about 20 jurisdictions in the world that have got compulsory voting, including the jurisdiction in which I was born and where I grew up and where I first exercised my right to vote. And let me tell you, you we did have to show our uh, identification card before we were able to vote. And I mean, that is, that, is, that is not in any way problematic. I mean, and the government, of course, is on the record as saying that we do support voter identification as a measure to, as a way to um, reduce the incidence of, um, uh, or, or to manage the risk of multiple votings, uh, which um, I have absolutely no doubt um, has, has occurred over the years and uh, throughout uh, history. But having said all of that, this um, bill actually doesn't come anywhere near in any way, shape or form, introducing a voter ID requirement. In fact, the bill does the opposite. I mean, this bill allows greater flexibility for polling officials about how they can word the three mandatory questions before they hand out a ballot paper. This is intended to particularly help the IAC communicate with voters who face uh, language barriers or disability issues. The three questions are uh, about name, address and whether someone has voted previously at the same election reasonable questions I would have thought. Nowhere in the bill is there any new fourth question permitting an official uh, to ask uh, a voter for ID documents. Uh, so uh, on, on that basis, this is an entirely superfluous amendment. The amendment is based on a totally factually incorrect reading of the bill and an incorrect understanding of the Electoral Act. The amendment is uh, partly predicated on the assumption that the IAC uh, will do a poor job on, of training its staff, including senior officers, at each booth, we think it is uh, not required, and the government will oppose this amendment. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor sh shares the concerns regarding the implementation of so called voter ID laws and any amendments which would discourage voting and undermine our system of compulsory voting. We are assured, however, and will be seeking further assurance from the Electoral Commissioner that the amendments contained in the bill will not result in a polling official demanding identification. We therefore do not believe the change proposed by the Greens is necessary and will not be supporting the amendment. Does any other senator wish to speak to this amendment? In that case, the question is that Australian Greens amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1038 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that Australian Greens amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1038 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes are moved to the right of the chair. The noes to the left appoint Senator Seward, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. Order. There being five ayes and 25 noes, the amendments are not agreed to. Senator Waters. Uh, Chair, I'm happy to go back to Senator Lambie if we're following the chronology of the grey. Um, if uh, Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy Chair. I move that Amendment 4, Sheet 8985, to oppose items 25, 26 and 27, 27 of Schedule 1. Or do I finish that yes. now? I wish to seek leave to move them together. <coughs> so leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Lambie. Uh, so uh, I move amendments one, two, and five, sheet eight, nine, five, eight, five by Lee, uh, by Lee together. So, yep, that's it. Do you wish to speak to them? Thank you, Mr. Acting Minister. President. Thank you, uh, Chair. The government will oppose this amendment. Uh, the government amendments comprehensively and fairly deal with the interactions between Commonwealth, state, and territory laws. This amendment would remove those changes from the bill, allowing state and territory laws to apply to federal donations at the same time as Commonwealth laws applied. Hence, it would actually defeat the entire purpose of uh, the legislation in front of the Senate. If the government's amendments were not made, there would be ambiguity for regulated entities. Duplication of laws in relation to the same financial transaction would be unnecessary where a donation is spent on federal electoral purposes only, so a double up of legal obligations would cause confusion and uncertainty. Uncertainty uh, would continue to mean that disputes over the correct legal treatment uh, would be taken to the courts. This has already happened once. It would mean different people complying with different laws during the same federal election based on which corner of the country they reside in. It would mean complexity when the IEC is trying to give guidance to the public and indeed it uh, would make our electoral arrangements at a federal level nationally inconsistent. Senator Farrell. The uh, President. Uh, Labor welcomes the debate on Senator Lambie's uh, amendment been talking to us since 8.30 uh, <clears throat> this morning about some of these issues. Uh, we particularly welcome the Senator's uh, commitment to improving transparency and the integrity of the Commonwealth donations regime. However, we won't be voting for the amendments as we are of the firm view that the Commonwealth Parliament should be able to make laws in relation to the conduct of Commonwealth elections without those laws being overridden by the states. If section uh, 302 CA and 314 B are repealed, then it leaves open the potential for foreign donations to be uh, funnelled through state branches and to avoid the Commonwealth ban on donations from foreign actors. Further, it will mean uh, <coughs> that there will be no uniformity in the treatment of federal parties and candidates. Rather, they will be governed by the laws of eight different states and territories. Uh, this is not a position we can accept. 
What we must strive towards is a better Commonwealth funding and disclosure regime. Uh, Labor's bills currently before the Senate, which would lower the donations thres threshold from 14,300 indexed to inflation to a fixed $1,000, and the introduction of uh, a system of real-time disclosure, would immediately provide greater transparency of those who are seeking to influence our elections. Our further proposed reforms to, of donations and expenditure caps, increasing the rate of public funding and introducing administrative funding for parties and elective uh, independents would reduce parties' reliance on donations and improve the integrity of the system. Labor will continue to pursue these reforms and we, would look, uh, we look forward to working with Senator Lambie to achieve them. Any other senator wish to speak to this amendment? Okay, there are. Sorry, Senator Chair. Waters. Yes, Chair, I just indicate that the Greens will be supporting these amendments. Thank you. Okay, so the question is we'll be doing this in two parts. The question is that items 25 and 27 and sub item 3 and item 34 of Schedule 1 as amended be agreed to, and item 26 and sub item 2 and item 34 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. So those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So the second part of this now is amendments one and two on sheet 8985. And the question is that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, Senator Lambie, would you like to move your remaining amendment? Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, I move amendment uh, three, sh uh, sheet eight nine eight five. Anyone wish to speak? Senator Farrell. In that case, the question. Uh, Sorry, Senator Waters. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm happy to say a few words about that, but I don't want to butt in in case there's anybody else wanting. I can't see the chamber is all, so I'm not sure if I'm butting in. Uh, if, if you debate this, we are compelled to have a four-minute division. If you don't debate it, we can have a one-minute division. So um, your call, Senator Waters. Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure I'll classify it as a debate, but I do wish to make a few remarks about the substance of the amendment. Um, so we're speaking, if I can just confirm, to item three, amendment three on sheet 8985, which repeals the, um, the head sections of the Commonwealth Electoral Act 302 CA. Uh, and 314B. I, I think that's the one we're that at. It's a bit different when you're not there in person. I apologise. Um, thank you. So essentially, my understanding of the effect of these amendments is that it would uh, close the back door that this government is seeking to, um, in my view, a view they don't share, but in my view, uh, seeking to establish a back door to enable them to uh, continue to donate uh, to state parties, um, albeit into a separate bank account. Um, from donors that would be prohibited from donating to that state party um, were they operating under state laws. Um, it, you know, it all gets a little bit uh, meta, but I made some remarks earlier today about my concern that there is a very cosy relationship between uh, donors that um, will not be stopped from donating to state parties, uh, and yet there is that um, I have just lost my train of thought, but what I do want to put to the chamber is some excellent remarks that were made on this very point by the, of all people, the Queensland Labor Party in their submission to the JSCEM um, inquiry on this very point. And um, they put it in a more cogent way than I have. Um, you can't win them all. Uh, they say simply asserting a donation is for a federal purpose does not insulate a state party for the state candidate it endorses from corruption risks. So the point they're making is where you've got federated parties and you've got uh, state organisations like, I believe, the LNP organises themselves in Queensland, a property developer will be able to donate to the state LNP. Um, it just goes into a separate bank account and yet that's permissible, even though that same donor is not allowed to donate to that same party 
if we were in a state context. So it just, it's an artificial distinction. And our view is that the creation of this separate bank account um, does not properly insulate that uh, the coziness and the uh, sense of obligation, if you like, from the state party back to that donor. That is exactly why we want to clean up donations. That is why when we come to um, the remaining Greens amendments, uh, we will be moving to uh, ban donations from people like property developers and big mining and big pharma and a number of others that I will um, regale you all with when the time comes. Um, because we don't think that you can insulate a political party from that influence, particularly not where you've got a federated structure like we, um, like we now know the, the LNP does. So um, that is why we will be supporting these amendments. And um, Senator Lambie is uh, very welcome to correct me if I'm mistaken about the effect of those amendments, but that is my understanding of the effect of her amendments and we, on that basis, uh, support them. Thank you. Any other senator wish to contribute to the discussion on these amendments? If not, the question is that Amendment 3 on Sheet 8985 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Noes have it. Senator Waters, do you wish to move your amendment on Sheet 1003? Uh, yes, I can do so. Um, was Senator Lambie wanting to move her amendments on sheet 8976? Senator Lambie, do you wish to move your final amendment? Yeah, yes, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thought they were on the last page. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I move, um, I move amended, uh, amended, what have we got here? I move amendment. Uh, one and two, sheet 8976, by leave together. Is seeking leave is leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted, Minister. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, 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 Chair, this amendment uh, does a whole series of things, um, you know, some of which might be worthy of exploration, but, but others who are quite problematic. Um, and we are not in a position to support these amendments. Um, like. Uh, Senator Lambie is proposing to require parties to establish an electoral expenditure account. Well, we have, we have sympathy for this, but we have already achieved this through the government's amendments uh, to our own bill in response to the JI scam recommendation. We do not support the proposition that uh, uh, we should provide for anonymous gifts of uh, up to $500 at events per person per event. This could be criticised for creating a new loophole, I would have thought, and is inconsistent with the threshold that applies in the context of the ban on foreign political donations. Um, so, I mean, we, we think that these, the issues that Senator Lambie raises through this uh, amendment should be pursued through the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters in the first instance. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, the opposition will not be supporting this amendment. This amendment seeks to amend the Australian Electoral Commission's role and responsibility significantly, which the in the opposition's view require consultation with the Commissioner. Uh, Senator Lambie is an experienced campaigner for transparency reforms, and Labor are open to work with her to ensure reforms, reforms can ach be achieved in the appropriate way. In addition, this amendment seeks an alternative disclosure threshold of $2,500, more than double the threshold that Labor has sought to achieve through our private senator's legislation. Any other senators seek the call? Senator Waters. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks very much, Chair. So um, the Greens will be supporting uh, this amendment, which has a series of um, features uh, within it. Uh, it lowers the disclosure threshold, which of course we support, as we've um, discussed already uh, in this bill. Doesn't lower it quite as low as the Greens uh, moved for. We wanted our threshold at one thousand dollars, and my understanding is that. Um, this amendment would impose a threshold of disclosure of 2,500, but that's still a damn sight less than 14,300. Um, I understand that this also has some disclosure time frame changes. Now, as I said earlier today, at the minute, you only need to disclose once a year on the 1st of February, and because of the, um, the time lag of calendar years and financial years, it can be up to 19 months before um, it's put in the public domain, which donor donated to which political party. Now that is so far beneath what is uh, a transparent 
an accountable approach to disclosure that um, the Greens would like to see as close to real-time disclosure as possible and I understand the Labor Party's view is that they want a seven-day disclosure period. Um, these amendments would have, on my reading of them, a six-month disclosure time frame, which again is not quite as um, rigorous as the Greens would like, but it is still better than what the current rules are. So on that basis, um, we will uh, we support that element because it's an improvement. Um, now, I understand that there's also some provisions in this amendment that go to uh, anonymous donations. Now, they've long been discussed because um, it's a balance between the administrative burden that you place on, um, on donors and political parties and the need for the public to know who's paying who. Uh, so there's long been recommendations for a cap of between $50 and $500 on anonymous donations. And when I say anonymous, it's uh, the example often used is buying a raffle ticket at a party function. Um, so it's not anything that's necessarily nefarious, um, as anonymous might imply. It's merely um, those smaller amounts of um, casual support that uh, many people express and that isn't of a significant amount to exert an undue influence. Um, so again, my um, my understanding of these amendments are that it lowers that threshold to 500. The Greens would like to see it lower than that. Um, we've pegged it at $50, uh, but on the basis that this proposed threshold is at least an improvement on our current laws, we will be supporting it um, as well. And so I um, I again confirm that the Greens will be supporting these amendments. Unless Thank you, any Chair. other senator wishes to address this amendment, uh, the question is that the Jackie Lambie Network Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 8976 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is the Jackie Lambie Networks Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 8976 be agreed to. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward, tell her for the ayes. Senator McCarthy, tell her for the noes. Order there being seven ayes and 21 noes, the amendment is not agreed to. And it being 7:20 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate, and I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Uh, Senator. Canavan. No, Senator Stoker is replacing Senator Canavan. Senator Stoker, I believe you are number one on the list. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in relation to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee's third interim report into Centrelink's income compliance program that was presented a little earlier today. Now, there are so many things wrong with the address that Senator O'Neill gave on this subject a little earlier today. It was emotional, it was inflammatory, it was not factual, and it wasn't um, aligned in any meaningful way with the balance of the evidence that has been received by the committee. But in many ways that doesn't surprise me because the majority report, which is essentially the Labor Party and the Greens working together, um, selectively incorporated evidence, ignored highly relevant evidence, it included multiple inaccurate assertions that the averaging of ATO income data had been used in the identification of discrepancies before seeking confirmation from an individual, as well as to subsequently calculate debts. That's not the case. A completely separate methodology was used, and that was very clear on the evidence that was given by Services Australia in the evidence to the committee in 2017. And so you could forgive me for treating everything that has come from Senator O'Neill and indeed Senator Seawirt on this subject today with a grain of salt. But the main reason I wanted to speak today was to put aside many of the absolutely wrong-headed um, matters that have been put before this chamber today in relation to the public interest immunity claims made by the minister. So, Quite in ignorance of the long-standing practice when it comes to public interest immunity claims, quite in ignorance of accepted legal principle, that report has refused the minister's claim. And that should be shocking for all of us. It should not be the case that on a political matter of convenience, long-standing principle that is fundamental 
to the integrity of this institution and its ability to function is cast aside at a whim. And yet, that's what they have done. For instance, it's been a long-standing practice of successive Australian governments, including Labor governments, not to disclose legal advice. Yet in this report, Labor and the Greens demand that principle be cast aside. Furthermore, whilst legal professional privilege alone has not been accepted by the Senator's grounds for withholding information, PII claims that are based on privilege, legal professional privilege that is, have been accepted where it has been established that there is a particular harm to be apprehended by disclosing that information, like prejudice to pending legal proceedings or to the Commonwealth's position in those proceedings. Now, this isn't some fanciful thing I've just made up. This isn't my words. This is direct from Odgers, the Senate practice that we use in this place. And the risks of harm to the Commonwealth from the disclosure of the information the subject of this aren't imaginary. They are borne by the taxpayer. And there's a class action in relation to this program. The potential prejudice to the Commonwealth in the context of that litigation alone meets the test of the Senate. And that prejudice is quite particular. Because there is a claim for negligence in that case, among other things, the knowledge of the Commonwealth or Commonwealth officials at particular times is relevant to determining those claims. And so disclosing information about the cost, timing and provider of relevant legal advice is meaningful to people in that litigation, is harmful to the Commonwealth's prospects in it, and in doing so is harmful to the taxpayer. That cannot be something about which we just cast aside long-standing principle. And quite frankly, that class action, which is run by a labour-aligned firm in circumstances where the questions at hearing bore a remarkable— oh, sorry. Point of order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Just on a point of order, uh, uh, Senator Stokes is a barrister. She knows Egan and Chadwick doesn't support what she claims. Senator Patrick, she knows that's that Odgers doesn't. Order. It's, it's and the not point, Senator Patrick, points of order are for or issues of Senate standing orders, not for issues of debate or fact. I, that is an issue for debate. You can have an opportunity to debate it in the Senate at another time. Well, no, no. The, 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 the senator is debating a matter of interpretation and fact. Um, it is not a matter that is outside the standing orders that you have a disagreement about the way it's used. I don't have orders in front of me, but even if I did, it would not be a matter of standing orders. You have the opportunity at another time to bring the Senate's attention to a differing interpretation. Senator Stoker. The, the questions they asked at hearing bore a remarkable resemblance to a fishing expedition for the purposes of helping their mates in the litigation, and that cannot be on. There were PII claims in relation to the, an executive minute dated the 15th of February that were cast aside. That is not on either in circumstances where it is in the public interest for the deliberations of Cabinet to be not made public. That's how we get good decisions out of Cabinet. They're happy to cast that aside, even though there is precedent for the idea that the Commonwealth Ombudsman having a limited access is uncontroversial. There Order. are so many problems. Senator Stoker. Senator uh, Faruqi. Sorry, I've got, I've got multiple lists here. So, I'll Sen Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam. Oh, sorry, thank you, Mr. President. Safe, secure, affordable housing is a human right, but decades of neoliberal policy in housing and homelessness has made speculative assets of what should be homes. Federal governments have worsened inequality by being more concerned with preserving tax breaks for investors than ensuring people have somewhere to live. The basic human right to shelter takes a backseat to the market. Australia's housing system um, has weak rental protection laws. It has years-long social housing waiting lists, widespread rent and mortgage stress, and immense intergenerational inequality in wealth and home ownership. In the 2018-19 financial year, more than 290,000 people sought assistance from specialist homelessness services in Australia. On the last census night, over 110,000 people had nowhere to call home. The COVID-19 crisis has thrown the flaws, power imbalances and inequalities in our broken housing system into sharp relief. 
Today, the situation looks even worse than it did before the pandemic hit. Unemployment has hit 7.5 percent, and it's expected to reach 10 percent by the end of the year. With underemployment included, the real figure will be much higher. The JobKeeper wage subsidy and increased job seeker payments are the only things keeping millions out of crushing poverty and serious risk of homelessness. Yesterday, Anglicare Australia released an update to the annual rental affordability snapshot, and the results are grim. Rental affordability has actually declined for people in job keeper, job seeker, and the minimum wage since March. Across Australia, less than 2% of rental properties are affordable for someone on the minimum wage, and only 808 rentals are affordable for someone on job seeker. As people lose their incomes, there will be more and more who won't be able to afford rent. Anglicare's research suggests that rents at the bottom of the private market have not reduced since their last snapshot in March. Much was made of the government's encouragement of renters to negotiate rent reductions with their landlords, but surveys of renters conducted throughout the pandemic indicate many tenants have either been ignored or knocked back when they've approached their landlord asking for help, or were too anxious and frightened to even broach the topic with their landlord in the first place. A key driver of homelessness is unaffordable rents. Without urgent action to ensure housing security, implement debt relief, and protect at-risk renters, and with the federal government's planned cuts to job seeker and job keeper due to start this month, we are staring down the barrel of a disaster. At a time when people are being told to stay at home for the good of the community, governments should be doing everything they can to ensure that everyone actually has a safe, secure, affordable place to call home. The Victorian government has extended its eviction ban to December, but other states and territories are lagging behind. The National Cabinet must agree to extend eviction bans across the country and ensure their enforcement. The Morrison government needs to show leadership and step in to support renters, people experiencing an at-risk of homelessness, and people in mortgage stress. Instead of dud ideas like the Home Builder Scheme, the federal government should be directing funds towards addressing the backlog of social housing repairs and the huge shortfall in social housing stock. We could build hundreds of thousands of public homes right now. Not only would it slash public housing waiting lists, help those suffering from rental stress and enable affordable living, it actually would create thousands of jobs and thousands of apprenticeships around the country. We must permanently increase and expand income support and increase funding for crisis and transitional accommodation, and we must create a national homelessness strategy. Together with strong national renters' rights standards and the removal of tax roads, we could have a system that works for people, not profit. This crisis we are all in is an opportunity to fix the mess that is our housing system to make it work for all people, not corporations and private investors. Inequality, poverty, and homelessness are not inevitable. They are the active, despicable choice of governments like this one right there. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I rise today to speak in my capacity as the duty senator for the federal seat of Parks, and particularly representing the historic mining city of Broken Hill. I want to speak on the sad passing earlier this year of Gary Radford, OAM, or Ripper as he was known to his friends, and to say a few words about the life he lived and his tireless efforts to improve his beloved city of Broken Hill. Gary was born in 1941 to Reginald and Nell Radford, raised by his grandparents with the help of legacy. After the tragic death of his father in New Guinea in World War II, he started working for his grandfather Les's building and transport business at the now astonishing age of 14. Gary worked countless jobs doing welding and mechanical work, working equipment in the mines, working as a foreman and working on local government contracts. For 109 years, the Radford family have been involved in the Broken Hill business community. Following the death of his grandfather in 1964, he left the family business and began his own business with a 1953 Ford Tipper and a Massey Harris overhead loader to establish an earth-moving business with his uncle called R and R Earth Movers, later to be called Gary Radford Earth Movers, and coming from an 
Irish earth moving family myself. I have a particular affinity with uh, men, who, men and women who work in that industry. The local paper would later report that it was said of Gary that he could operate every piece of machinery his company owned. And that was exactly like my dad. A man very proud to be able to work with his hands, deliver good jobs for people and improve the civic life of the community that he lived in. Consolidated mining and civil and basin, sa basin sands lo logistics, employing 540 staff members and operating 900 pieces of haulage plant and equipment from uh, his Broken Hill base was a, a massive testament to his efforts. He also moved into the mining industry, helping to keep the South mine alive by providing his earth moving equipment and starting open cut operations without pay till the mine became profitable. He not only kept 300 locals in work at the mine, but by 1981 his company MMM achieved the highest rate of profit in any mining company in Australia. Following his successes with the South Mine, in 1978 Gary also began an airline, Radford Silver City Airlines, which ran um, routes from Broken Hill to Melbourne and Adelaide. He also operated a quarry, a concrete plant, before returning to the mines. In his later years he turned to managing his pastoral properties with the help of his sons. In 2016, Gary was awarded, in combination with his son, the prestigious Icon of the Industry Award at the National Road Transport Hall of Fame, Shell Rimula, for their services on behalf of the Australian road transport community. His generosity to Broken Hill was legendary. He was deeply involved with the St Pat's races and always lent his water trucks and other machinery to keep the track in good condition. His legacy there is honoured today by the Gary Radford Pavilion at the Regional Events Centre in Broken Hill, a project that Gary worked tirelessly to put together and spent nearly a quarter of a million dollars of his own money, time and equipment to ensure that it succeeded and that the club would not have to spend money to hire marquees. I read in his obituary in the Barrier Daily Truth of the many examples of his generosity and I'd like to recount just a few. Only last year, and I quote, only last year after the Sea Scouts had been robbed of the bottles and cans they were saving to cash in um, for cabaret, he immediately presented them with a cheque for $1,000. He then turned up the Scout Hall with his son Stephen and a shipping container to hold all the empties so they couldn't be stolen again. Broken Hill is home to many testaments to his efforts on behalf of the city, such as the old Silver City Comet in the Railway Museum that he had carted from the train station and hoisted into place. The Kintore mine head frame that he donated and erected in Blend Street, the sculptures in, living desert, in the Living Desert for which he transported the blocks and set them in place, the churches and the schools he helped refurbish. And if uh, New South Welsh men and women are looking for somewhere to go, go to those Living Desert uh, sculptures, support the community in Broken Hill. It's a fantastic sight to see, especially at dawn. He also gave his time to serve as an executive member of both Lifeline and Legacy and was a chairman of the Line of Load. Association, during which time the Miners Memorial and Visitors Centre was built. The Silver City is all the poorer for his loss. His advocacy and open heart helped sustain one of Australia's oldest and proudest cities through good times and bad. And my deepest condolences are with his family, indeed the whole city of Broken Hill. May the memory of Gary Radford, OAM, or Ripper, as he was better known, Live long and may the community continue to enjoy the many blessings he delivered. Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, every day I am in this place, I'm honoured to represent my beautiful state of Queensland, and nothing gives me greater honour than when I have the opportunity to report to the Senate the great work that Queenslanders are doing to help their fellow Australians in need. And I would like to uh, convey to the Senate three remarkable events that occurred recently in my home state of Queensland. First, on 18 July 2020, I was honoured to accompany members of the Rotary Club of Archerfield as they delivered their three millionth, three millionth litre of water to the Granite Belt Water Relief Project in Stanthorpe. Joining members from the Rotary Club of Archerfield were Mr Jachendra Prasad, past district governor, and other members of Rotary Club Brisbane International, members of the Rotary Club of Stanthorpe, and members of the Rotary Club of Brisbane Taylor Bridge. All great Rot Rotarians working together, as they always do, to help people in need, proving once again that Rotary connects the world. 
Now, the logistics involved, the logistics involved in delivering this three million litres of water are truly remarkable, and I'm sure Senator Sheldon, given his background, would appreciate this. Consider this. 125 trips totalling an aggregate 54,500 kilometres. The hours involved, 1,068. Donations received in cash or kind over one quarter of a million dollars. Now, the second remarkable thing about this event is that a leading role was played by one Rotarian, an outstanding Australian, Mr Sultan Mohammed Dean, known as George Dean, a past president of the Archerfield Rotary Club. George is a long-time operator of Prime Movers in Brisbane and knew that his fellow Australians were in need out in Stanthorpe. Perhaps even so remarkable about this is that George was the one who single-handedly undertook nearly all of those trips out to Stanthorpe. He's the one who put in that incredible effort of 125 trips for 54,500 kilometres, 1,068 hours. So George would do his own work and then he would spend his time actually taking water, carting water out to Stanthorpe to help his fellow Australians. And he was assisted by many members and supporters of the Rotary Club of Archerfield. His fellow member, Abdul Rahman Dean, known as Ray Dean, also a member of the Archerfield Rotary Club for more than 30 years, sponsored the registration and insurance for the vehicle, for the prime mover and the, the water trailer. But George and Ray have been members of Rotary for over 33 years, providing community service to the broader Australian community. Now, the third remarkable thing occurred on 8 August 2020, and that was that the three brothers, George and Ray Dean, who I've spoken of, and their brother, who's known as Happy Dean, celebrated collectively their 50th wedding anniversary. All three brothers were married on the same day on 8 August 1970. Sultan Muhammad Dean, known as George, married Kamran Nishat Youssef. Abdul Rahman Dean, known as Ray, married Shamsun Nishat Fazil. And Habib Allah Dean, also known as Happy, married Badrul Nishat Youssef. The three couples were married on the same day in 1970 at the Holland Park Mosque. And since that day in 1970, these families have made an outstanding contribution to my home state of Queensland, and it is a great honour to pay tribute to you in this place. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Mr President. This week, the eyes of the technology world have turned to Australia and our parliament. Our competition regulator has proposed a new approach to dealing with the awesome market power of two of the US-based technology giants, Google and Facebook. Of course, Google and Facebook are pushing back, and they're pushing back hard. No one should be surprised at companies defending their interests or their resistance to sharing some of their billions in profits. But make no mistake, they want to make Australia an example. Google and Facebook, like their fellow tech titans, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Netflix and Uber, are no different in this respect than any other corporation that resists regulation and avoids paying tax. Robbing sovereign nations of the tax base that provides its people with health, education, aged care and public infrastructure. They are harnessing their assets and their lobbyists are in touch with MPs from all parties in this place and the other place. These are some of the largest and richest corporations on the planet, with a reach across countries and industries and governments that is unrivalled in history. And while we cannot expect these corporations to do anything other than defend their interests, governments and parliaments must stand up to defend the interests of their people. Just over a year ago, in my first speech in this place, I argued for the digital services tax to be levied on the revenue generated by the platforms in Australia. The US government, in response to the digital services tax and discussions from the OECD, 
have made it clear that they will not allow an arrangement and delay arrangements for a global tax regime. So it'll be up to us to defend our sovereign tax base. So as we debate how this managing media code will work in practice, I want to echo the words spoken yesterday by former Competition and Consumer Commissioner Chair Alan Fells. He said there is always the option for this government and this parliament to bring in the huge stick of a digital services tax on this, these tax giants. I couldn't agree more. Critically, a digital services tax would be levied on the revenue generated in Australia, not the profits. It should be on the revenue generated. This makes it harder to avoid. Profit-based taxes, as we know well, can be small or zero because companies siphon off royalties to head offices and profits are booked in tax havens. Mr President, I have some advice for every parliamentarian in this place. When you meet up with these big tech lobbyists, whether they are lobbying you and about this proposed media code, about disinformation online or unfair competition or data privacy, you should first ask these corporate lobbyists when they are going to pay their tax fair share of taxes to this country and when will they stop shipping off their profits to tax havens and low tax jurisdictions. Mr President, I welcome this debate, the proposed Australian Competition and Consumer Commission Mandatory Media Code. There will be devil in the detail of how it operates to give Australian media companies this power to bargain, including bargaining collectively for payment from Google and Facebook for the journalism content they produce. I, for one, think that there could be a real risk if we shut out public broadcasters out of the code. I am concerned that there is no requirement that the money transferred under the code be used for public interest journalism. There are also real barriers to small and regional news outlets having the ability and capacity to bargain for their compensation. Nor is there a requirement that this funding be used to pay for wages for reporters, producers, photographers, videographers and others who create the content. But as the ACCC considers the very submissions on this proposed code, I call on every member of parliament to consider the bigger picture here. The big picture I am talking about is the smart conversation we need to be having, not just in this parliament but at the kitchen tables and pubs and workplaces across the nation. Once and for all, let's get them to pay their fair share of tax. Senator Dean Smith. Much, Mr. President, I rise this evening to congratulate the RSL Wanneroo sub-branch on the opening of its new club rooms at the Wanneroo Community Centre. On the 20th of August, I was delighted to join sub-branch President Jack Lecrae, OIM, the patron Brigadier Stephen Coggan, Warden Peter Tuck and committee members Peter Epps, Sue Epps and Sue Tuck at the official opening. The new base on Civic Drive in Wanneroo provides the sub-branch with greater space to highlight the service and sacrifice of service men and women, enhance member participation and support community outreach programs across the city of Wanneroo and indeed across all of Perth's northern suburbs. The club rooms afford RSL Wanneroo the opportunity to showcase its significant collection of military history and memorabilia from wars, conflicts and peacekeeping operations. The impressive display, which was primarily collected by Vietnam War veteran Peter Tuck, hasn't seen the light of day until now and includes priceless reminders of World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War and even a French bayonet from 1872. It was inspiring to hear about the sub-branch committee's bold plans for the new club rooms, which include coordinating school excursions, public open days, promoting veteran service stories and developing veteran advocacy and welfare services. But RSL Wanneroo's plans don't stop there, with the committee also seeking to develop a peace garden at the nearby Memorial Park, possibly featuring a historic anchor, cannons and propellers. I was particularly pleased again to have the chance to extend my personal congratulations to Jack Lacra OAM at the opening. Jack is one of our living treasurers. 
In June 1944, aged just 17, Jack was conscripted by the Royal Australian Navy and served during World War II on HMAS Bataan. Jack was a radar specialist on board Bataan when news of the Japanese surrender broke on 15 August 1945. Jack's story is unique, and he is one of very, very few Australians to have witnessed the signing of the Japanese instrument of surrender on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay several weeks later on 2 September 1945. Jack was responsible for escorting the Royal Australian Navy Vice Admiral John Collins to the surrender ceremony, during which General Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander of the Allies, accepted Foreign Minister Mamori Shigemutsu's signature on the Japanese instruments of surrender to mark the cessation of World War II. Jack gave ABC and 6PR interviews on the 14th of August this year, marking the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Pacific Day and the cessation of World War, 10, World War II, offering a brief glimpse into his significant and very memorable life experiences. The rest of the 94-year-old Kingsley veterans, Jack's life has also been nothing short of remarkable, including working as a supervising broadcaster during the 1962 Perth Commonwealth Games and the 1982 Brisbane Commonwealth Games. Jack's service to the community of Perth, particularly to the Return Services League and to the Naval Association of Australia, was deservedly recognised with a Medal of the Order of Australia at the 2012 Australia Day Awards. Jack continues to serve the community in Perth's northern suburbs as RSL Wanneroo sub-branch president and coordinator of the RSL Wanneroo Anzac Day dawn service, which was held at Memorial Park in Wanneroo. The Anzac Day service, which Jack started in 2017, has quickly gained the reputation of being one of the biggest in Perth's northern suburbs, with, their more, with more than 3,000 people in attendance. The Wanneroo Dawn Service is an experience to behold, which includes a Tiger Moth fly pass by the Royal Australian Air Force and the participation of a host of community organisations, including the Limelight Theatre, the Wanneroo Lions Club and the First Wanneroo Scout Group. I am particularly proud to be supporting Jack and the great work that he continues to do to support the RSL Wanneroo application for a community grant under the Saluting Their Service Community Commemorative Grants Program to even better showcase their military history for community organisations and schools. And on behalf of all Liberal Senators in this place, and I note that the Minister for Defence is with me here this, tonight, the Honourable Senator Linda Reynolds, we congratulate Jack, we thank him for his service, and we thank everyone in the RSL Wanneroo Subbranch for their continued dedication to supporting and the dedication and sacrifice of so many Australian men and women. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr President. We are, Mr President, in the grips of a jobs crisis and, as we've known for a while, but as the statistics and economic figures show today, we are in a recession. But as debates in the parliament have shown today, the Morrison government does not have a jobs plan for our nation. We've seen from this government a failure to support manufacturing jobs before the crisis, and yet still we see a government that isn't grabbing the opportunities they should. Opportunities like a coordinated procurement plan as part of a national plan for rail, something the coalition has rejected before. Just this week, uh, we've seen, uh, actually it was last week, the Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, she said her state and the nation were no good at building trains. This outrageous statement is simply not true, Mr President. Rail manufacturing, manufacturing happens in many places across Australia, including New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia. These places include building trains but also fixing issues with imported rail cars bought by Liberal governments, like in the case of the Maryborough uh, uh, facility where in Queensland they are fixing rolling stock that was found not to be fit for purpose and it was purchased by the Newman Liberal government from overseas. So we, as we see during the course of COVID, we see the Liberal Party talking a big game on manufacturing, but with little more than lip service 
being delivered. We've seen Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, talking up manufacturing, but after seven years in government, we are yet to see a plan for Australian manufacturing. As we've debated and as is recognised, COVID-19 has highlighted how sensitive we are to global supply chains. And as unemployment is rising, particularly in regional areas, now more than ever we need a national plan for manufacturing, a plan that includes rail. Rail in our nation contributes $26 billion to the national economy. It supports hundreds of thousands uh, of small to, uh, of jobs and indeed sorry it supports thousands of jobs and hundreds of small to medium enterprises but the efforts that we undertake as a nation in this case are dissipated by a fragmented approach to rail procurement investment construction and are regulated by eight different governments but we have many millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, uh, of Commonwealth funds being injected into state rail uh, projects, with so many projects happening around the country. Should we not have a national rail plan? In Western Australia alone, Mr President, uh, we have 246 new rolling stock uh, that will be required for the state's Metronet project. It will service new lines and replace the ageing existing A-class rolling stock. Happily, I'm proud to say the Mark McGowan Labor government, unlike the Liberal Berejiklian government, has embraced Australian-made rail. The West Australian government is investing in constructing a new rail manufacturing facility in Bellevue, near the historic home of rail manufacturing. This is near the old West Australian Government Rail Facility at Midland, which was sadly shut down decades ago by the Court Liberal Government. <clears throat> Here we will see rolling stock manufactured in WA, and it is set to come in under budget at $347, by $347 million. And I say, Mr President, this is not bad for a country that's supposedly not good at building trains. Here, uh, as a, an, a recession is officially forecast, now when regional economies are shrinking and jobs are drying up, it's time to encourage job growth. Job growth in our regions and in different sectors, region by region and sector by sector. Order. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.